Section Zero of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. Section Zero The Preface. With the present collection, the publication of Sumner's essays comes to an end. The original project of publishers and editor contemplated but a single volume, War and Other Essays, and they accordingly equipped that volume with a bibliography, which was as complete as they then could make it. But when, later on, other materials came to be known about, and especially after the discovery of a number of unpublished manuscripts, the encouraging reception accorded to the first venture led us to publish a second, and then a third collection. Earth Hunger, Other Essays, and The Challenge of Facts, and Other Essays. It was during the preparation of the latter of these, now some five years ago, that the late Professor Callender deplored to the editor the omission of certain of Sumner's essays in political economy, in particular those dealing with free trade and sound money. And the reviewers of preceding collections have reminded us, rightly enough, that there should be a fuller bibliography and also an index covering all the essays. In this last volume, we have striven to meet these several suggestions and criticisms, and it is now the purpose of the publishers to form of these singly issued volumes a set of four, numbered in the order of their issue. Since the series could not have been planned as such at the outset, this purpose is in the nature of an afterthought, and is therefore no general organization or systematic classification by volumes. Insofar as classification is possible, under the circumstances, it is made by way of the index. This and the bibliography are the work of Dr. M. R. Davy, and are but a part of the service he has performed in the interest of an intellectual master whom he could know only through the printed word and the medium of another man. Sumner's dominant interest in political economy as revealed in his teaching and writing, issued in a doughty advocacy of free trade and hard money, and involved the relentless exposure of protectionism and of schemes of currency debasement. As conveying his estimate of protectionism, it is only fitting that his little book on the ism which teaches that waste makes wealth should be recalled from an obscurity that it does not deserve. It is typical of the author's most vigorous period in witnesses to the acerbity of a former issue that may recur. In default of a single comprehensive companion piece in the field of finance, and one making as interesting reading, it has been necessary to confine selection to several rather brief articles, most of them dating from the campaign of 1896. In the choice of all economic essays, I have been guided by the advice of my colleague, Professor F. R. Fairchild, a fellow student under Sumner, and a fellow admirer of his character and career. Professor S. L. Mims also has been generous in his aid. I do not need to thank either of these men, for what they did was a labor of gratitude and love. The title essay will be found at the end of the volume. It is the once famous lecture on the Forgotten Man, and it is here printed for the first time. When War and Other Essays was being prepared, we had no knowledge of the existence of this manuscript lecture, and, in order to bring into what we supposed was to be a one-volume collection this character creation of Sumner's, one often alluded to in modern writings, we reprinted two chapters from what social clauses owe to each other. It has been found impracticable, in later reprintings of Volume 1, to replace those chapters with the more complete essay, and we have therefore decided to reproduce the latter, despite the certain degree of repetition involved, rather than leave it out of the series. In view of the fact that Sumner has been more widely known, perhaps, as the creator and advocate of The Forgotten Man, than as the author of any other of his works, we entitle this volume The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. Several essays, not of an economic order, have been included because they have come to my knowledge within the last few years, and have seemed to me to call for preservation. It is almost impossible to fix the dates of such manuscript essays, for I have not been able, in all cases, 
to secure information from persons who might be able to identify times and occasions. And there remain a good number of articles and manuscripts, published or unpublished, which can receive no more than mention with a word of characterization in the bibliography. Some mention ought to be made here of a large body of handwritten manuscript left by Sumner and representing the work of several years, 1899 to 1905 or thereabouts, upon a systematic treatise on the science of society, printed as it was left, partially and unevenly completed, and with many small and some wide hiatuses, this manuscript would make several substantial volumes. It is a monument of industry, involving, as it did, the collection over many years of thousands of notes and memoranda, and the extraction from the same by a sort of tour de force of generalizations intended to be set forth, with the support of copious evidence in the form of a survey of the evolution and life of human society. These manuscripts, as left, represent no more than a preliminary survey of a wide field, together with more elaborately worked out chartings of sections of that field. The author planned to rewrite the whole in the light of folkways. The continuation, modification, and completion of this enterprise, in something approaching the form contemplated by its author, must needs be, if all possible, a long task. As one surveys through these volumes of essays, the various phases of scholarly and literary activity of their author, and then recalls the teaching, both extensive and intensive, done by him with such unremitting devotion to what he regarded as his first duty, and one thinks, yet again, of his labors in connection with college and university administration, with the Connecticut State Board of Education, and in other lines, it is hard to understand where one man got the time, with all his ability and energy to accomplish all this. In the presence of evidence of such incessant and unswerving industry, scarcely interrupted by the ill health that overtook Sumner at about the age of fifty, an ordinary person feels a sense of oppression and of bewilderment, and is almost willing to subscribe to the old, hopeless tradition that there were giants in those days. In the preparation of this set of books, the editor has been constantly sustained and encouraged by the interest and sympathy of the woman who stood by the author's side through life, and to whom anything that had to do with the preservation of his memory was thereby just, perfect, and altogether praiseworthy. The completion of this editorial task would be the more satisfying if she were still among us to receive the final offering. A. G. Keller, West Booth Bay Harbor, September 1, 1918 End of section 0section 1 of the forgotten man and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by tatiana chichilla the forgotten man and other essays by william graham sumner protectionism the ism which teaches that waste makes wealth 1885 preface during the last 15 years we have had two great questions to discuss the restoration of the currency and civil service reform Neither of these questions has yet reached a satisfactory solution, but both are on the way toward such a result. The next great effort to strip off the evils entailed on us by the Civil War will consist in the repeal of those taxes which one man was enabled to levy on another, under cover of the taxes which the government had to lay to carry on the war. I have taken my share in the discussion of the first two questions, and I expect to take my share in the discussion of the third. I have written this book as a contribution to popular agitation. I have not troubled myself to keep or throw off scientific or professional dignity. I have tried to make my point as directly and effectively as I could for the readers whom I address, viz. the intelligent voters of all degrees of general culture, who need to have it explained to them what protectionism is and how it works. I have therefore pushed the controversy just as hard as I could, and have used plain language, just as I have always done before in what I have written on this subject. I must therefore forego the hope that I have given any more pleasure now than formerly to the advocates of protectionism. Protectionism seems to me to deserve only contempt and scorn, satire and ridicule. It is an errant piece of economic quackery, and it masquerades under such an affectation of learning and philosophy that it ought to be treated as other quackeries are treated. Still, out of deference to its strength in the traditions and lack of information of many people, I have here undertaken a patient and serious exposition of it. Satire and derision remain reserved for the dogmatic protectionists and the sentimental protectionists. 
the Philistine protectionists and those who hold the key of all knowledge, the protectionists of stupid good faith and those who know their dogma is a humbug and are therefore irritated at the exposure of it, the protectionists by birth and those by adoption, the protectionists for hire and those by election, the protectionists by party platform and those by pet newspaper, the protectionists by invincible ignorance and those by vows and ordination, the protectionists who run colleges and those who want to burn colleges down, the protectionists by investment and those who sin against light, the hopeless ones who really believe in British gold and dread the Cobden Club, and the dishonest ones who storm about those things without believing in them, those who may not be answered when they come into debate because they are great men, or because they are old men, or because they have stock in certain newspapers, or are trustees of certain colleges. All these have honored me personally in this controversy, with more or less of their particular attention. I confess that it has cost me something to leave their cases out of account, but to deal with them would have been a work of entertainment, not of utility. Protectionism arouses my moral indignation. It is a subtle, cruel, and unjust invasion of one man's rights by another. It is done by force of law. It is, at the same time, a social abuse, an economic blunder, and a political evil. The moral indignation which it causes is the motive which draws me away from the scientific pursuits which form my real occupation and forces me to take part in a popular agitation. The doctrine of a call applies in such a case, and every man is bound to take just so great a share as falls in his way. That is why I have given more time than I could afford to popular lectures on this subject, and it is why I have now put the substance of those lectures into this book. WGS. End of section one. Section two of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. Protectionism, the ism which teaches that waste makes wealth. 1885. Chapter 1. Definitions. Statement of the question to be investigated. A. The system of which protection is a survival. 1. The statesmen of the 18th century supposed that their business was the art of national prosperity. Their procedure was to form ideals of political greatness and civil prosperity on the one hand, and to evolve out of their own consciousness grand dogmas of human happiness and social welfare on the other hand. Then they tried to devise specific means for connecting these two notions with each other. Their ideals of political greatness contained, as predominant elements, a brilliant court, a refined and elegant aristocracy, well-developed fine arts and belles lettres, a powerful army and navy, and a peaceful, obedient, and hard-working peasantry and artisan class to pay the taxes and support the other part of the political structure. In this ideal, the lower ranks paid upward, and the upper ranks blessed downward, and all were happy together. The great political and social dogmas of the period were exotic and incongruous. They were borrowed or accepted from the classical authorities. Of course, the dogmas were chiefly held and taught by the philosophers, but as the century ran its course, they penetrated the statesman class. The statesmen who had had no purpose save to serve the grandeur of the king or to perpetuate a dynasty gave way to statesmen who had a strong national feeling and national ideals, and who eagerly sought means to realize their ideals. Having as yet no definite notion, based on facts of observation and experience, of what a human society or a nation is, and no adequate knowledge of the nature and operation of social forces, they were driven to empirical processes that they could not test or measure or verify. They piled device upon device and failure upon failure. When one device failed of its intended purpose and produced an unforeseen evil, they invented a new device to prevent the new evil. The new device again failed to prevent, and became a cause of a new harm, and so on indefinitely. 2. Among their devices for industrial property were 1. Export taxes on raw materials, to make raw materials abundant and cheap at home. 2. Bounties on the export of finished products, to make the exports large. 3. Taxes on imported commodities, to make the imports small, and thus with number 2 to make the balance of trade favorable, and to secure an importation of specie. 4. Taxes or prohibition on the export of machinery, so as not to let foreigners have the advantage of domestic inventions. 5. Prohibition on the emigration of skilled laborers, lest they should carry to foreign rivals knowledge of domestic arts. 6. Monopolies to encourage enterprise. 7. Navigation laws to foster shipbuilding or the carrying trade, and to provide sailors for the navy. 
eight, a colonial system to bring about by political force the very trade which the other devices had destroyed by economic interference. Nine, laws for fixing wages and prices to repress the struggle of the non-capitalist class to save themselves in the social press. Ten, poor laws to lessen the struggle by another outlet. Eleven, extravagant criminal laws to try to suppress another development of this struggle by terror, and so on and so on. B. Old and New Conceptions of the State 3. Here we have a complete illustration of one mode of looking at human society or at a state. Such society is, on this view, an artificial or mechanical product. It is an object to be molded, made, produced by contrivance. Like every product which is brought out by working up to an ideal instead of working out from an antecedent truth and fact, the product here is haphazard, grotesque, false. Like every other product which is brought out by working on lines fixed by a priori assumptions, it is a satire on human foresight and on what we call common sense. Such a state is like a house of cards, built up anxiously one upon another, ready to fall at a breath, to be credited at most with naive hope and silly confidence. Or it is like the long and tedious contrivance of a mischievous schoolboy, for an end which has been entirely misappreciated and was thought desirable when it should have been thought a folly, or it is like the museum of an alchemist, filled with specimens of his failures, monuments of mistaken industry and testimony of an erroneous method. Or it is like the clumsy product of an untrained inventor, who, instead of asking, What means have I, and to what will they serve? asks, What do I wish that I could accomplish? and seeks to win steps by putting in more levers and cogs, increasing friction and putting the solution ever farther off. 4. Of course, such a notion of a state is at war with the conception of a state as a seat of original forces which must be reckoned with all the time, as an organism whose life will go on anyhow, perverted, distorted, diseased, vitiated as it may be by obstructions or coercions, as a seat of life in which nothing is ever lost, but every antecedent combines with every other, and has its share in the immediate resultant, and again in the next resultant, and so on indefinitely as the domain of activity is so great that they should appall any one who dares to interfere with them, of instinct so delicate and self-preservative that it should be only infinite delight to the wisest man to see them come into play, and his sufficient glory to give them a little intelligent assistance. If a state well performed its functions of providing peace, order, and security, as conditions under which the people could live and work, it would be the proudest proof of its triumphant success that it had nothing to do, that all went so smoothly that it had only to look on and was never called to interfere, just as it is the test of a good businessman that his business runs on smoothly and prosperously, while he is not harassed or hurried. The people who think that it is proof of enterprise to meddle and fuss may believe that a good state will constantly interfere and regulate, and they may regard the other type of state as non-government. The state can do a great deal more than to discharge police functions. If it will follow custom and the growth of social structure to provide for new social needs, it can powerfully aid the production of structure by laying down lines of common action, where nothing is needed but some common action on conventional lines. Or it can systematize a number of arrangements which are not at their maximum utility for want of concord, or it can give sanction to new rights which are constantly created by new relations under new social organizations, and so on. 5. The latter idea of the state has only begun to win way. All history and sociology bear witness to its comparative truth, at least when compared with the former. Under the new conception of the state, of course, liberty means breaking off the fetters and trammels which the wisdom of the past has forged, and laissez-faire, or let alone, becomes a cardinal maxim of statesmanship, because it means cease the empirical process, institute the scientific process, let the state come back to normal health and activity so that you can study it, learn something about it from an observation of its phenomena, and then regulate your action in regard to it by intelligent knowledge. Statesmen suited to this latter type of state have not yet come forward in any great number. The new radical statesmen show no disposition to let their neighbors alone. They think that they have come into power just because they know what their neighbors need to have done to them. Statesmen of the old type, who told people that they knew how to make everybody happy, and that they were going to do it, were always far better paid than any of the new type ever will be and their failures never cost them public confidence either. We have got tired of kings, priests, nobles, and soldiers, not because they failed to make us all happy, but because our a priori dogmas have changed fashion. We have put the administration of the state in the hands of lawyers, editors, literateurs, and professional politicians, and they are by no means disposed to abdicate the functions of their predecessors, or to abandon the practice of the art of national prosperity. 
The chief difference is that, whereas the old statesmen used to temper the practice of their art with care for the interests of the kings and aristocracies which put them in power, the new statesmen feel bound to serve those sections of the population which have put them where they are. 6. Some of the old devices above enumerated are, however, out of date or are becoming obsolete. Number 3, taxes on imports for other than fiscal purposes, is not among this number. Just now, such taxes seem to be coming back into fashion, or to be enjoying a certain revival. It is a sign of the deficiency of our sociology as compared with our other sciences that such a phenomenon could be presented in the last quarter of the 19th century as a certain revival of faith in the efficiency of taxes on imports as a device for producing national prosperity. There is not a single one of the eleven devices mentioned above, including taxes on the exportation of machinery and prohibitions on emigration, which is not quite as rational and sound as taxes on imports. I now propose to analyze and criticize protectionism. C. Definition of protectionism, definition of theory. 7. By protectionism, I mean the doctrine of protective taxes as a device to be employed in the art of national prosperity. The protectionists are fond of representing themselves as practical, and the free traders as theorists. Theory is indeed one of the most abused words in the language, and the scientists are partly to blame for it. They have allowed the word to come into use, even among themselves, for a conjectural explanation, or a speculative conjecture, or a working hypothesis, or a project which has not yet been tested by experiment, or a plausible and harmless theorem about transcendental relations, or about the way in which men will act under certain motives. The newspapers seem often to use the word theoretical as if they meant by it imaginary or fictitious. I use the word theory, however, not in distinction from fact, but in what I understand to be the correct scientific use of the word, to denote a rational description of a group of coordinated facts in their sequence and relations. A theory may, for a special purpose, describe only certain features of facts and disregard others. Hence, in practice, where facts present themselves in all their complexity, he who has carelessly neglected the limits of his theory may be astonished at phenomena which present themselves, but his astonishment will be due to a blunder on his part and will not be an imputation on the theory. 8. Now, free trade is not a theory in any sense of the word. It is only a mode of liberty, one form of the assault, and therefore negative, which the expanding intelligence of the present is making on the trammels which it has inherited from the past. Inside the United States, absolute free trade exists over a continent. No one thinks of it or realizes it. No one feels it. We feel only constraint and oppression. If we get liberty, we reflect on it only so long as the memory of the constraint endures. I have again and again seen the astonishment with which people realize the fact, when presented to them, that they have been living under free trade all their lives and never thought of it. When the whole world shall obtain and enjoy free trade, there will be nothing more to be said about it. It will disappear from discussion and reflection. It will disappear from the textbooks on political economy as the chapters on slavery are disappearing. It will be as strange for men to think that they might not have free trade, as it would be now for an American to think that he might not travel in this country without a passport, or that there ever was a chance that the soil of our western states might be slave soil and not free soil. It would be as reasonable to apply the word theory to the Protestant Reformation, or to law reform, or to anti-slavery, or to the separation of church and state, or to popular rights, or to any other campaign in the great struggle which we call liberty and progress, as to apply it to free trade. The pro-slavery men formerly did apply it to abolition, and with excellent reason, if the use of it which I have criticized ever was correct, for it required great power of realizing in imagination the results of social change, and great power to follow and trust abstract reasoning, for any man bred under slavery to realize, in advance of experiment, the social and economic gain to be won, most of all for the whites, by emancipation. It now requires a great power of theoretical conception for people who have no experience of the separation of church and state to realize its benefits and justice. Similar observations would hold true of all similar reforms. Free trade is a revolt, a conflict, a reform, a reaction, and recuperation of the body politic, just as free conscience, free worship, free speech, free press, and free soil have been. It is in no sense a theory. 9. Protectionism is not a theory in the correct sense of the term, but it comes under some of the popular and incorrect uses of the word. It is purely dogmatic and a priori. It is desired to attain a certain object, wealth and national prosperity. Protective taxes are proposed as a means. It must be assumed that there is some connection between protective taxes and national prosperity, some relation of cause and effect, some sequence of expended energy and realized product, 
between protective taxes and national wealth. If then, by theory, we mean a speculative conjecture as to occult relations which have not been and cannot be traced in experience, protection would be a capital example. Another and parallel example was furnished by astrology, which assumed a causal relation between the movements of the planets and the fate of men, and built up quite an art of soothsaying on this assumption. Another example, paralleling protectionism in another feature, was alchemy, which, accepting as unquestionable the notion that we want to transmute lead into gold if we can, assumed that there was a philosopher's stone and set to work to find it through centuries of repetition of the method of trial and failure. 10. Protectionism, then, is an ism, that is, it is a doctrine or system of doctrine which offers no demonstration and rests upon no facts, but appeals to faith on grounds of its a priori reasonableness, or the plausibility with which it can be set forth. Of course, if a man should say, I am in favor of protective taxes because they bring gain to me, that is all I care to know about them, and I shall get them retained as long as I can, there is no trouble in understanding him, and there is no use in arguing with him. So far as he is concerned, the only thing to do is to find his victims and explain the matter to them. The only thing which can be discussed is the doctrine of national wealth by protective taxes. This doctrine has the forms of an economic theory. It vies with the doctrine of labor and capital as a part of the science of production. Its avowed purpose is impersonal and disinterested, the same, in fact, as that of political economy. It is not, like free trade, a mere negative position against an inherited system to which one is led by a study of political economy. It is the species of political economy, and aims at the throne of the science itself. If it is true, it is not a corollary, but a postulate, on which, and by which, all political economy must be constructed. 11. But then, lo, if the dogma which constitutes protectionism, national wealth can be produced by protective taxes and cannot be produced without them, is enunciated, instead of going on to a science of political economy based upon it, the science falls dead on the spot. What can be said about production, population, land, money, exchange, labor, and all the rest? What can the economist learn or do? What function is there for the university or school? There is nothing to do but go over to the art of legislation and get the legislator to put on the taxes. The only questions which can arise are as to the number, variety, size, and proportion of the taxes. As to these questions, the economist can offer no light. He has no method of investigating them. He can deduce no principles, lay down no laws in regard to them. The legislator must go on in the dark and experiment. If his taxes do not produce the required result, if there turn out to be snakes in the tariff which he has adopted, he has to change it. If the result still fails, change it again. Protectionism bars the science of political economy with a dogma, and the only process of the art of statesmanship to which it leads is eternal trial and failure, the process of the alchemist and of the inventor of perpetual motion. D. Definition of free trade and of a protective duty. 12. What then is a protective tax? In order to join issue as directly as possible, I will quote the definitions given by a leading protectionist journal of both free trade and protection. The term free trade, although much discussed, is seldom rightly defined. It does not mean the abolition of custom houses, nor does it mean the substitution of direct for indirect taxation, as a few American disciples of the school have supposed. It means such an adjustment of taxes on imports as will cause no diversion of capital from any channel into which it would otherwise flow, into any channel opened or favored by the legislation which enacts the customs. A country may collect its entire revenue by duties on imports, and yet be an entirely free trade country so long as it does not lay those duties in such a way as to lead anyone to undertake any employment or make any investment he would avoid in the absence of such duties. Thus, the customs duties levied by England, with a very few exceptions, are not inconsistent with her profession of being a country which believes in free trade. They either are duties on articles not produced in England, or they are exactly equivalent to the excise duties levied on the same articles if made at home. They do not lead anyone to put his money into the home production of an article, because they do not discriminate in favor of the home producer. 13. A protective duty, on the other hand, has for its object to effect the diversion of a part of the capital and labor of the people out of the channels in which it would run otherwise, into channels favored or created by law. I know of no other definitions of these two things which have ever been made by anybody which are more correct than these. I accept them and join issue on them. E. Protectionism raises a purely domestic controversy. 14. It will be noticed that this definition of a protective duty says nothing about foreigners or about imports. According to this definition, a protective duty is a device for effecting a transformation in our own industry. 
If a tax is levied at the port of entry on a foreign commodity which is actually imported, the tax is paid to the treasury and produces revenue. A protective tax is one which is laid to act as a bar to importation, in order to keep a foreign commodity out. It does not act protectively unless it does act as a bar, and is not a tax on imports, but an obstruction to imports. Hence, a protective duty is a wall to enclose the domestic producer and consumer, and to prevent the latter from having access to any other source of supply for his needs, in exchange for his products, than that one which the domestic producer controls. The purpose and plan of the device is to enable the domestic producer to levy on the domestic consumer the taxes which the government has set up as a barrier, but has not collected at the port of entry. Under this device, the government says, I do not want the revenue, but I will lay the tax so that you, the selected and favored producer, may collect it. I do not need to tax the consumer for myself, but I will hold him for you while you tax him. F. A protective duty is not a tax. 15. There are some who say that a tariff is not a tax, or as one of them said before a congressional committee, we do not like to call it so. That certainly is the most humorous of all the funny things in the tariff controversy. If a tariff is not a tax, what is it? In what category does it belong? No protectionist has ever yet told. They seem to think of it as a thing by itself, a power, a force, a sort of mumbo-jumbo whose special function it is to produce national prosperity. They do not appear to have analyzed it, or given themselves an account of it, sufficiently to know what kind of a thing it is or how it acts. Anyone who says that it is not a tax must suppose that it costs nothing, that it produces an effect without an expenditure of energy. They do seem to think that if Congress will say, let a tax of blank percent be laid on Article A, and if none is imported, and therefore no tax is paid at the Custom House, national industry will be benefited and wealth secured, and that there will be no cost or outgo. If that is so, then the tariff is magic. We have found the philosopher's stone. Our congressmen wave a magic wand over the country and say, not otherwise provided for, 150%, and presto, there we have wealth. Again, they say, 50 cents a yard and 50% ad valorem, and there we have the prosperity. If we should build a wall along the coast to keep foreigners and their goods out, it would cost something. If we maintained a navy to blockade our own coast for the same purpose, it would cost something. Yet it is imagined that if we do so by a tax, it costs nothing. 16. This is the fundamental fallacy of protection to which the analysis will bring us back again and again. Scientifically stated, it is that protectionism sins against the conservation of energy. More simply stated, it is that the protectionist either never sees or does not tell the other side of the account, the cost, the outlay for the gains which he alleges from protection, and that when these are examined and weighed, they are sure vastly to exceed the gains, if the gains were real, even taking no account of the harm to national growth which is done by restriction and interference. 17. There are only three ways in which a man can part with his product, and different kinds of taxes fall under different modes of alienating one's goods. First, he may exchange his product for the product of others. Then he parts with his property voluntarily, and for an equivalent. Taxes which are paid for peace, order, and security fall under his head. Secondly, he may give his product away. Then he parts with it voluntarily without an equivalent. Taxes which are voluntarily paid for schools, libraries, parks, etc. fall under this head. Thirdly, he may be robbed of it. Then he parts with it involuntarily and without an equivalent. Taxes which are protective fall under this head. The analysis is exhaustive, and there is no other place for them. Protective taxes are those which a man pays to his neighbor to hire him, the neighbor, to carry on his own business. The first man gets no equivalent. Hence, anyone who says that a tariff is not a tax would have to put it in some such category as tribute, plunder, or robbery. In order, then, that we may not give any occasion for even an unjust charge of using hard words, let us go back and call it a tax. 18. In any case, it is plain that we have before us the case of two Americans. The protectionists who try to discuss the subject always go off to talk English politics and history, or Ireland, or India, or Turkey. I shall not follow them. I shall discuss the case between two Americans, which is the only case there is. Whether Englishmen like our tariff or not is of no consequence. As a matter of fact, Englishmen seem to have come to the opinion that if Americans will take their own home market as a share, they will keep out of the world's market. They, the Englishmen, will agree to the arrangement. But it is immaterial whether they agree or are angry. The only question for us is, what kind of an arrangement is it for one American to tax another American? How does it work? Who gains by it? How does it affect our national prosperity? These and these only are the questions which I intend to discuss. 19. 
I shall adopt two different lines of investigation. First, I shall examine protectionism on its own claims and pretensions, taking its doctrines and claims for true, and following them out to see whether they will produce the promised results. And secondly, I shall attack protectionism adversely and controversially. If anyone proposes a device for the public good, he is entitled to candid and patient attention, but he is also under obligation to show how he expects his scheme to work, what forces it will bring into play, how it will use them, etc. The joint stock principle, credit institutions, cooperation, and all similar devices must be analyzed, and the explanation of their advantage, if they offer any, must be sought in the principles which they embody, the forces they employ, the suitableness of their apparatus. We ought not to put faith in any device, e.g. bimetallism, socialism, unless the proposers offer an explanation of it which will bear rigid and pitiless examination. For, if it is a sound device, such examination will only produce more and more thorough conviction of its merits. I shall therefore first take up protectionism just as it is offered, and test it, as any candid inquirer might do, to see whether, as it is presented by its advocates, it has any claims to confidence. End of section 2. Section 3 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner Protectionism, the ism which teaches that waste makes wealth, 1885, Chapter 2, Part 1 Protectionism examined on its own grounds. 20. It is the peculiar irony in all empirical devices in social science that they not only fail of the effect expected of them, but that they produce the exact opposite. Paper money is expected to help the non-capitalist and the debtor and to make business brisk. It ruins the non-capitalists and the debtors and reduces industry and commerce to a standstill. Socialistic devices are expected to bring about equality and universal happiness. They produce despotism, favoritism, inequality and universal misery. The devices are, in their operation, true to themselves. They act just as an unprejudiced examination of them should have led anyone to expect that they would act or just as a limited experience has shown that they must act. If protectionism is only another case of the same kind, an examination of it on its grounds must bring out the fact that it will issue in crippling industry, diminishing the capital and lowering the average of comfort. Let us see. A. Assumptions in Protectionism 21. Obviously, the doctrine includes two assumptions. The first is that if we are left to ourselves, each to choose under liberty his line of industrial effort and to use his labor and capital under the circumstances of the country as best as he can, we shall fail of our highest prosperity. Secondly, that if Congress will only tax us properly, we can be led up to a higher prosperity. Hence, it is at once evident that free trade and protection here are not on a level. No free trader will affirm that he has a device for making the country rich or saving it from hard times any more than a respectable physician will tell us that he can give us specifics and preventives to keep us well. On the contrary, so long as men live, they will do foolish things and they will have to bear the penalty. But if they are free, they will commit only the follies which are their own and they will bear the penalties only of those. The protectionist begins with the premise that we shall make mistakes and that is why he who knows how to make us go right, proposes to take us in hand. He is like the doctor who can give us just the pill we need to cleanse our blood and to ward off chills. 
Hence, either prosperity in a free trade country or distress in a protectionist country is fatal to protectionism, while distress in a free trade country or prosperity in a protectionist country proves nothing against free trade. Hence, the fallacy of all Mr. R. P. Porter's letters is obvious. 22. The device by which we are to be made better than ourselves is to select some of ourselves who certainly are not the best businessmen among ourselves to go to Washington and there turn around and tax ourselves blindly or if not blindly, craftily and selfishly. Surely this would be the triumph of stupidity and ignorance over intelligent knowledge, enterprise and energy. The motive which would control each of us if we were free would be the hope of greatest pain. We should have to put industry, prudence, economy and enterprise into our business. If we failed, it would be through error. How is the congressional interference to act? How is it to meet and correct out error? It can appeal to no other motive than the desire for profit and can only offer us a profit where there was none before if we will turn out of the industry which we have selected into one which we do not know. It offers a greater profit there only by means of what it takes from somebody else and somewhere else. Or is congressional interference to correct the errors of John, James and William and to make the idol industrious and the extravagant prudent? Anyone who believes it must believe that the welfare of mankind is not dependent on the reason and conscience of the interested persons themselves, but on the caprices of blundering ignorance embodied in a selected few or on the trickery of the lobbyists acting impersonally and at a distance. B. Necessary Conditions of Successful Protective Legislation 23. Suppose, however, that it were true that Congress had the power, by some exercise of the taxing function, to influence favorably the industrial development of the country, is it not true that men of sense would demand it to be satisfied on three points as follows? 24a. If Congress can do this thing and is going to try it, ought it not, in order to succeed, to have a distinct idea of what it is aiming at and proposes to do? Who would have confidence in any man who should set out on an enterprise and who did not satisfy this condition? Has Congress ever satisfied it? Never. They have never had any plan or purpose in their tariff legislation. Congress has simply laid itself open to be acted upon by the interested parties and the product of its tariff legislation has been simply the resultant of the struggles of the interested cliques with each other and of the log rolling combinations which they have been forced to make among themselves. In 1882, Congress did pay some difference, real or pretended, to the plain fact that it was bound if it exercised this mighty power and responsibility to bring some intelligence to bear on it and it appointed a tariff commission which spent several months in collecting evidence. This commission was composed with one exception of protectionists. It recommended a reduction of 25% in the tariff and said early in its deliberations the Commission became convinced that a substantial reduction of tariff duties is demanded not by mere indiscriminate popular clamor but by the best conservative opinion of the country. Excessive duties are positively injurious to the interests which they are supposed to benefit. They encourage the investment of capital in manufacturing enterprises by rash and unskilled speculators to be followed by disaster to the adventurers 
and their employees and a plethora of commodities which deranges the operations of the skilled and prudent enterprise. This report was entirely thrown aside and Congress, ignoring it entirely, began again exactly in the old way. The Act of 1883 was not even framed by or in Congress. It was carried out into the dark into a conference committee where new and gross abuses were put into the bill under cover of a pretended revision and reduction. When a tariff bill is before Congress, the first draft starts with a certain rate on a certain article, say 20%. It is raised by amendment to 50. The article is taken into a combination and the rate put up to 80%. The bill is sent to the other house and the rate on the article is cut down again to 40%. On conference between the two houses, the rate is fixed at 60%. He who believes in the protectionist doctrine must, if he looks on at that proceeding, believe that the prosperity of the country is being kicked around the floor of the Congress at the mercy of the chances which are at last to determine with what percent of tax these articles will come out. And what is it that determines with what tax any given article will come out? Any intelligent knowledge of industry? Not a word of it. Nothing in the case of a given tax on a given article, but just this. Who is behind it? The history of tariff legislation by the Congress of the United States throws a light upon the protective doctrine which is partly grotesque and partly revolting. 25b. If Congress can exert the supposed beneficent influence on industry, ought not the Congress to understand the force which it proposes to use? Ought it not to have some rules of protective legislation so as to know in what cases within what limits, under what condition the device can be effectively used? Would that not be a reasonable demand to make of any man who should propose a device for any purpose? Congress has never had any knowledge of the way in which the taxes which it passed were to do this beneficent work. It has never had and has never seemed to think that it needed to get any knowledge of the mode of operation of the protective taxes. It passes taxes as big as the conflicting interests will allow and goes home satisfied that it has saved the country. What a pity philosophers, economists, sages and moralists should have spent so much time in elucidating the conditions and laws of human prosperity. Taxes can do it all. 26c. If Congress can do what is affirmed and is going to try it, is it not the part of common sense to demand that some tests be applied to the experiment after a few years to see whether it is really doing as was expected? In the campaign of 1880, it was said that if Hancock was elected, we should have free trade, wages would fall, factories would be closed, etc. Hancock was not elected. We did not get any reform of the tariff and yet in 1884 wages were falling, factories were closed and all the other direful consequences which were threatened had come to pass. Bradstreet's made investigation in the winter of 1884-1885 which showed that 316,000 workmen 13% of the number employed in manufacturing in 1880 were out of work, 17,550 on strike and that wages had fallen since 1882 from 10 to 40% especially in the leading lines of manufacturing which are protected. What did these calamities all prove then? If we had had any revision of the tariff, should we not have had these things alleged again and again as the results of it? Did they not then in the actual case prove the folly of protection? Oh no, 
that would be attacking the sacred dogma and the sacred dogma is a matter of faith so that as it never had any foundation in fact or evidence it has just as much after the experiment has failed as before the experiment was made 27 if now it were possible to devise a scheme of legislation which should according to protectionists ideas be just the right jacket of taxation to fit this country today how long would it fit not a week there are certain millions of people on 3 and 1/2 million square miles of land every day new lines of communications are opened new discoveries are made new inventions produced new processes applied and the consequence is that the industrial system is in a constant flux and change how if a correct system of protective taxes was a practicable thing at any given moment could congress keep up with the changes and readaptations which would be required the notion is preposterous and it is a monstrous thing even on the protectionist hypothesis that we are living under a protective system which was set up in 1864 the weekly tariff decisions by the treasury department may be regarded as the constant attempts that are required to fit that old system to present circumstances and as it is not possible that new fabrics new compounds and new processes should find a place in schedules which were made 20 years before they were invented those decisions carry with them the fate of scores of new industries which figure in no census and are taken into account by no congressman therefore even if we believed that the protective doctrine was sound and that some protective system was beneficial and that the one which we have was the right one when it was made we should be driven to the conclusion that one which is 20 years old is sure to be injurious today 28 there is nothing then in the legislative machinery by which the tariff is to be made which is calculated to win the confidence of a man of sense but everything to the contrary and the experiments of such a legislation which have been made have produced nothing but warnings against the device instead of offering any reasonable grounds for belief that our errors will be corrected and our productive powers increased an examination of the tariff as a piece of legislation offers to us nothing but a burden which must cripple any economic power which we have c examination of the means proposed viz taxes 29 every tax is a burden and in the nature of the case can be nothing else in mathematical language every tax is a quantity affected by a minus sign if it gets peace and security that is if it represses crime and injustice and prevents discord which would be economically destructive then it is a smaller minus quantity than the one which would be otherwise there and is the gain by good government hence like every other outlay which we make taxes must be controlled by the law of economy to get the best and most possible for the least expenditure instead of regarding public expenditure carelessly we should watch it jealously instead of looking at taxation as conceivably a good and certainly not an ill we should regard every tax as on the defensive and on every cent of tax as needing justification if the statement exacts any more than is necessary to pay for good government economically administered he is incompetent and fails in his duty I have been studying political economy almost exclusively for the last 15 years and when I look back over that period and I ask myself what is the most marked effect which I can perceive on my own opinion 
or on my standpoint as to social questions i find it is this i am convinced that nobody yet understands the multiplied and complicated effects which are produced by taxation i am under the most profound impression of the mischief which is done by taxation reaching as it does to every dinner table and to every fireside the effects of taxation vary with every change in the industrial system and the industrial status and they are so complicated that it is impossible to follow analyze and systemize them but out of the study of the subject there arises this firm conviction taxation is crippling shortening reducing all the time over and over again 30 suppose that a man has an income of $1000 of which he has been saving $100 per annum with no tax now a tax of $10 is demanded of him no matter what kind of tax or how laid is he to get tax out of the $900 expenditure or out of the $100 savings if the former then he must cut down on his diet or his clothing or his house accommodation that is lower his standard of comfort if the latter then he must lessen his accumulation of capital that is his provision for the future either way his welfare is reduced and cannot be otherwise affected and through the general effect the welfare of the community is reduced by the tax of course it is immaterial that he may not know the facts the effects are the same in this view of the matter it is plain what mischief is done by taxes which are laid to buy parks libraries and all sorts of grand things the tax layer is not providing public order he is spending other people's earnings for them he is deciding that his neighbor shall have less clothes and more library or park but when we come to protective taxes the abuse is monstrous the legislator who has in his hands this power of taxation uses it to say that one citizen shall have less clothes in order that he may contribute to the profits of another citizen's private business 31 hence if we look at the nature of taxation and if we are examining protectionism from its own standpoint under the assumption that it is true instead of finding any confirmation of its assumption in the nature of the means which it proposes to use we find the contrary granting that people make mistakes and fail of the highest prosperity which they may win when they act freely we see plainly that more taxes cannot help to lift them up or to correct their errors on the contrary all taxation beyond what is necessary for an economical administration of good government is either luxurious or wasteful and if such taxation could tend to wealth waste would make wealth d examination of the plan of mutual taxation 32 suppose then that the industries and sections all begin to tax each other as we see that they do under protection is it not plain that taxing operation can do nothing but transfer products never by any possibility create them the object of the protective taxes is to effect the diversion of a part of the capital and labor of the country from the channels in which it would run otherwise to do this it must find a fulcrum or a point of reaction or it can exert no force for the effect it desires the fulcrum is furnished by those who pay the tax take a case Pennsylvania taxes New England on every ton of iron and coal used in its industries. Ohio taxes New England on all the wool obtained from that state for its industries. New England taxes Ohio and Pennsylvania on all the cottons and woolens which it sells to them. What is the net final result? It is mathematically certain that only the result can be that 
New England gets back just all she paid, in which case the system is nil, save for the expense of the process and the limitation it imposes on the industry of all. Or 2. The New England does not get back as much as she paid, in which case she is tributary to the others. Or 3. That she gets back more than she paid, in which case she levies tributes on them. Yet, on the protectionist notion, this system extended to all sections and embracing all industries is the means of producing national prosperity. When it is all done, what does it amount to except that all Americans must support all Americans? How can they do it better than for each other to support himself to the best of his ability? Then, however, all assumption of protectionism must be abandoned as false. 33. In 1676, King Charles II granted to his natural son, the Duke of Richmond, a tax of shilling and a chaldron on all the coal which was exported from the time. We regard such a grant as a shocking abuse of the taxing power. It is, however, a very interesting case because the mine owner and the tax owner where two separate persons and tax can be examined in all its separate inequity. If, as I suppose was the case, the Tyne Valley possessed such superior facilities for producing coal that it had a qualified monopoly, the tax fell on the coal mine owner, landlord, that is the king, transferred to his son part of the property which belonged to the Tyne coal owners. In that view, the case may come home to some of our protectionists as it would not if the tax had fallen on the consumers. If Congress had pensioned General Grant by giving him 75 cents a ton on all the coal mined in Lay High Valley, what protests we should have heard from the owners of coal lands in that district. If the king's son, however, had owned coal mines and worked on them himself, and if the king had said, I will authorize you to raise the price of your coal, a shilling a chaldron, and to enable you to do it, I myself tax all coal but yours a shilling a chaldron. Then the device would have been modern and enlightened and American. We have done just that on emery, copper and nickel. Then the tax comes out of the consumer. Then it is not, according to the protectionist, harmful, but the key to national prosperity, the thing which corrects the errors of our incompetent self-will and leads us up to better organization of our industry than we in our unguided stupidity could have made. E. Examination of the proposal to create an industry. 34. The protectionist says, however, that he is going to create an industry. Let us examine this notion also from his standpoint, assuming the truth of his doctrine and see if we can find anything to deserve confidence. A protective tax, according to the protectionist definition, has for its object to effect the diversion of a part of the labor and capital of the people into channels favored or created by law. If we followed this proposal, we shall see what those channels are and shall see whether they are such as to make us believe that protective taxes can increase wealth. 35. What is an industry? Some people will answer it is an enterprise which gives employment. Protectionists seem to hold this view and they claim that they give work to laborers when they make an industry. On that notion, we live to work. We do not work to live, but we do not want to work. We have too much work. We want a living and work is the inevitable but disagreeable price we must pay. Hence, we want as much living at as little price as possible. We shall see that the protectionist does make work in the sense of lessening the living and increasing the price. But if we want a living, we want a capital. If an industry is to pay wages, it must be backed by capital. Therefore, protective taxes, if they were to increase the means of living, would need to increase capital. 
how can taxes increase capital protective taxes take from a to give to b therefore if b by this arrangement can extend his industry and give more employment a's power to do the same is diminished in at least an equal degree therefore even on that erroneous definition of an industry there is no hope for the protectionist 36 an industry is an organization of labor and capital for satisfying some need of the community it is not an end in itself it is not a good thing to have in itself it is not a toy or an ornament if we would satisfy our needs without it we should be better off not worse off how then can we create industries 37 if any one will find in the soil of a district some new power to supply human needs he can endow that district with new industry if he will invent a mode of treating some natural deposit ore or clay for instance so as to provide a tool or utensil which is cheaper and more convenient than what is in use he can create an industry if he will find out some new and better way to raise cattle or vegetables which is perhaps favored by the climate he can do the same if he invents some new treatment of wool or cotton or silk or leather or makes a new combination which produces a more convenient or attractive fabric he may do the same the telephone is a new industry what measures the gain of it is it the employment of certain persons in and about the telephone offices the gain is in the satisfaction of the need of communication between people at less cost of time and labor it is useless to multiply instances it can be seen what it is to create an industry it takes brains and energy to do it how can taxes do it 38 suppose that we create an industry even in this sense what is the gain of it the people of connecticut are now earning their living by employing their labor and capital in certain parts of the industrial organization they have changed the industry a great many times if it should be found that they had a new and better chance hitherto undeveloped they might all go into it to do that they must abandon what they are doing now they would not change unless gains to be made in the new industry were greater hence the gain is the difference only between the profits of the old and the profits of the new the protectionists however when they talk about creating an industry seem to suppose that the total profit of the industry and some of them seem to think that the total expenditure of capital measures their good work in any case then even of a true legitimate increase of industrial power and opportunity the only gain would be a margin but by our definition a protective duty has for its object to effect the diversion of a part of the capital and labor of the people out of the channels in which it would otherwise run plainly this device involves coercion people would need no coercion to go into a new industry which had a natural origin in a new industrial power or opportunity no coercion is necessary to make men buy dollars at 98 cents a piece the case for coercion is when it is desired to make them buy dollars at 101 cents a piece here the statesman with his taxing power is needed and can do something what he can say if you will buy a dollar at 101 cents i can and will tax john over there 2 cents for your benefit one to make up your loss and other to give you a profit hence it is on the protectionist own doctrine his device is not needed and cannot come into use when a new industry is created in the true and only reasonable sense of the words but only when and because he is determined to drive the labor and capital of the country into a disadvantageous and wasteful employment 39 still further it is obvious that the protectionist instead of creating a new industry has simply taken one industry and set it as a parasite to live upon another industry is its own reward a man is not to be paid a premium by his neighbors for earning his own living a factory an insane asylum a school a church a poor house and a prison cannot be put in the same economic category 
we know that the community must be taxed to support insane asylums poor houses and jails when we come upon such institutions we see them with regret they are wasting capital we know that the industrious people all about who are laboring and producing must part with a portion of their earnings to supply the waste and loss of these institutions hence the bigger they are the sadder they are 40 as for the schools and churches we know that society must pay for and keep up its own conservative institutions they cost capital and do not pay back capital directly although they do indirectly and in the course of time in ways which we could trace out and verify if that were our subject here then we have a second class of institutions 41 but the factories and farms and foundries are the productive institutions which must provide the support of these consuming institutions if the factories etc put themselves on a line with the poor houses or even with the schools what is to support them and all the rest too they have nothing behind them if in any measure or way they turn into burdens and objects of care and protection they can plainly do it only by part of them turning upon the other part and this latter part will have to bear the burden of all the consuming institutions including the consuming industries for a protected factory it is not a producing industry it is a consuming industry if a factory is as the protectionist alleges a triumph of the tariff that is it would not be but for the tariff and otherwise he has nothing to do with it then it is not producing it is consuming it is a burden to be borne the bigger it is the sadder it is 42 if a protectionist shows me a woolen mill and challenges me to deny that it is a great and valuable industry i ask him whether it is due to the tariff if he says no then i will assume that it is an independent and profitable establishment but in that case it is out of this discussion as much as a farm or a doctor's practice if he says yes then i answer that the mill is not an industry at all we pay 60% tax on cloth simply in order that the mill may be it is not an institution for getting us cloth for if we went into the market with the same products which we take there now and if there were no woolen mill we should get all the cloth we want the mill is simply an institution for making cloth cost per yard 60% more of our products than it otherwise would that is the one and only function which the mill has added by its existence to the situation i have called such a factory a nuisance the word has been objected to the word is of no consequence he who when he goes into a debate begins to whine and cry as soon as the blows get sharp should learn to keep out what i meant was this a nuisance is something which by its existence and presence in society works loss and damage to the society works against the general interest not for it a factory which gets in the way and hinders us from attaining the comforts which we are all trying to get which makes harder the terms of acquisition when we are all the time struggling by our arts and sciences to make those terms easier is a harmful thing and noxious to the common interest 43 hence once more starting from the protectionist hypothesis and assuming his own doctrine we find that he cannot create an industry he only fixes one industry as a parasite upon another and just as certainly as he has intervened in the matter at all just so certainly has he forced labor and capital into less favorable employment than they would have sought if he had let them alone when we ask which channels those are which are to be favored or created by law we find that they are by the hypothesis 
and by the whole logic of the protectionist system, the industries which do not pay. The protectionists propose to make the country rich by laws which shall favor or create these industries, but these industries can only waste capital, so that if they are the source of wealth, waste is the source of wealth. Hence the protectionist assumption that by his system he could correct our errors and lead us to greater prosperities than we would have obtained under liberty has failed again and we find that he wastes what power we do possess. End of section 3, read by Madhushri Nellore, April 5th, 2022. Section 4 of the Forgotten Man and Author Essays This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Immanuel Satya The Forgotten Man and Author Essays by William Graham Sumner Protectionism The ism which teaches that waste makes wealth Chapter 2, Part 2 But, says the protectionist, do you mean to say that if we have an iron deposit in our soil, it is not wise for us to open and work it? You mean, no doubt, I reply. Open and work it under protective help and stimulus, for if there is an iron deposit, the United States does not own it. Some man owns it. If he wants to open and work it, we have nothing to do but wish him Godspeed. Very well, he says. Understand it that he needs protection. Let us examine this case then, and still we will do it assuming the truth of the protectionist doctrine. Let us see where we shall come out. The man who has discovered iron on the protectionist doctrine, when there is no tax, does not collect tools and laborers and go to work. He goes to Washington. He visits the statesman and a dialogue takes place. Mr. Statesman, I have found an iron deposit on my farm. Have you indeed? That is good news. Our country is richer by one new natural resource than we have supposed. Yes, and I now want to begin mining iron. Very well, go on. We shall be glad to hear that you are prospering and getting rich. Yes, of course. But I am now earning my living by tilling the surface of the ground. And I am afraid that I cannot make as much at mining as at farming. That is indeed another matter. Look into that carefully and do not leave a better industry for a worse. But I want to mine that iron. It does not seem right to leave it in the ground when we are importing iron all the time. But I cannot see as good profits in it at the present price for imported iron as I am making out of what I raise on the surface. I thought that perhaps you would put a tax on all the imported iron so that I could get more for mine. Then I could see my way to give up farming and go to mining. You do not think what you ask. That would be authorizing you to tax your neighbors and would be throwing on them the risk of working your mind which you are afraid to take yourself. I have not talked the right dialect to this man. I must begin all over again. <clears throat> Mr. Statesman, the natural resource of this continent ought to be developed. American industry must be protected. The American labor must not be forced to compete with the pauper labor of Europe. Now I understand you. Now you talk business. Why did you not say so before? How much tax do you want? The next time that a buyer of pig iron goes to market to get some, he finds that it costs 30 bushels of wheat per ton instead of 20. What has happened to pig iron, says he. Oh, haven't you heard, is the reply. A new mine has been found down in Pennsylvania. We have got a new natural resource. I haven't got a new natural resource, says he. It is as bad for me as if the grasshoppers had eaten up one third of my crop. 
That is just exactly the significance of a new resource on the protectionist doctrine. We had the misfortune to find Emery here. At once, a tax was put on it which made it cost more wheat, cotton, tobacco, petroleum, all personal services per pound than ever before. A new calamity befell us when we found the richest copper mines in the world in our territory. From that time on, it cost us five, now four, cents a pound more than before. By another catastrophe, we found a nickel mine, 30 cents, now 15, a pound tax. Up to this time, we have had all the tin that we wanted above ground, because beneficent nature has refrained from putting any underground in our territory. In the metal schedule, where the metals which we unfortunately possess are taxed from 40 to 60 percent, tin alone is free. After a little while, a report is started that tin has been found. Hitherto, these reports have happily all proved false. It is now said that tin has been found in West Virginia and Dakota. We have reason devoutly to hope that this may prove false, for if it should prove true, no doubt the next thing will be 40% tax on tin. The mine owners say that they want to exploit the mine. They do not. They want to make the mine an excuse to exploit the taxpayers. Therefore, when the protectionists ask whether we ought not by protective taxes to force the development of our own iron mines, the answer is that, on his own doctrine, he has developed a new philosophy, hitherto unknown, by which natural resources become national calamities, and the more a country is endowed by nature, the worse off it is. Of course, if the wise philosophy is not simply to use, with energy and prudence, all the natural opportunities which we possess, but to seek channels favoured or created by law, then this view of natural resources is perfectly consistent with that philosophy, for it is simply saying over again that waste is the key of wealth. G. Examination of the proposal to raise wages. But, he says again, we want to raise wages and favour the poor working man. Do you mean to say, I reply, that protective taxes raise wages, that that is their regular and constant effect? Yes, he replies, that is just what they do, and that is why we favour them. We are the poor man's friends. You free traders want to reduce him to the level of the pauper labourers of Europe. But here, in the evidence offered at the last tariff discussion in Congress, the employers all said that they wanted the taxes to protect them because they had to pay such high wages. Well, so they do. Well then, if they get the taxes raised to help them out when they have high wages to pay, how are the taxes going to help them any unless the taxes lower wages? But you just said that taxes raise wages. Therefore, if the employer gets the taxes raised, he will no sooner get home from Washington than he will find that the very taxes which he has just secured have raised wages. Then he must go back to Washington to get the taxes raised to offset that advance, and when he gets home again, he will find that he has only raised wages more, and so on forever. You are trying to teach the man to raise himself by his bootstraps. Two of your propositions brought together eat each other. We will, however, pursue the protectionist doctrine of wages a little further. It is totally false that protective taxes raise wages. As I will show further on, section 91 and following, protective taxes lower wages. Now, however, I am assuming the protectionist's own premises and doctrines all the time. He says that his system raises wages. Let us go to see some of the wages class and get some evidence on this point. We will take three wage workers, a bootman, a hatman and a clothman. First we ask the bootman, do you win anything by this tariff? Yes, he says, I understand that I do. How? Well, the way they explain it to me is that when anybody wants boots, he goes to my boss pays him more on account of the tax, and my boss gives me part of it. 
All right, then your comrades here, the hat man and the clothes man, pay this tax in which you share? Yes, I suppose so. I never thought of that before. I suppose that rich people pay the taxes, but I suppose that when they buy boots, they must do it too. And when you want a hat, you go and pay the tax on hats, part of which, as you explain the system, goes to your friend the hat man. And when you want clothes, you pay the tax which goes to benefit your friend the clothes man. I suppose that it must be so. We go then to see the hat man and have the same conversation with him. And we go to see the clothes man and have the same conversation with him. Each of them then gets two taxes and pays two taxes. Three men illustrate the whole case. If we should take a thousand men in a thousand industries, we should find that each paid 999 taxes and each got 999 taxes if the system worked as it is said to work. What is the upshot of the whole? Either they all come out even on their taxes paid and received, or some of the wage receivers are winning something out of other wage receivers to the net detriment of the whole class. If each man is creditor for 999 taxes and each debtor for 999 taxes, and if the system is universal and equal, we can save trouble by each drawing 999 orders on the creditors to pay to themselves their own taxes, and we can set up a clearing house to wipe off all the accounts. Then we come down to this as the net result of the system when it is universal and equal, that each man, as a consumer, pays taxes to himself as a producer. This is what is to make us all rich. We can accomplish it just as well and far more easily when we get up in the morning by transferring our cash from one pocket to the other. One point, however, and the most important of all, remains to be noticed. How about the thousandth tax? How is it when the bootman wants boots? and the hat man hats and the clothes man clothes. He has to go to the store on the street and buy off his own boss, at the market price, tax on, the very things which he made himself in the shop. He then pays the tax to his own employer, and the employer, according to the doctrine, shares it with him. Where is the offset to the part which the employer keeps? There is none. The wages class, even on the protectionist explanation, may give or take from each other, but to their own employers, they give and take not. At election time, the boss calls them in and tells them that they must vote for protection or he must shut up the shop, and that they ought to vote for protection because it makes their wages high. If, then, they believe in the system just as it is taught to them, they must believe that it causes him to pay them big wages out of which they pay back to him big taxes, out of which he pays them a fraction back again, and that, but for this arrangement, the business could not go on at all. A little reflection shows that this just brings up the question for a wage earner. How much can I afford to pay my boss for hiring me? Or again, which is just the same thing in other words, what is the net reduction of my wages below the market rate under freedom which results from the system? See section 95. Let it not be forgotten that this result is reached by accepting protectionism and reasoning forward from its doctrines and according to its principles. In truth, the employees get no share in any taxes which the boss gets out of them and others. See section 91 and following for the truth about wages. Of course, when this or any other subject is thoroughly analyzed, it makes no difference where we begin or what line we follow. We shall always reach the same result if the result is correct. If we accept the protectionist's own explanation of the way in which protection raises wages, we find that it proves that protection lowers wages. H. Examination of the proposal to prevent competition by foreign pauper labor. The protectionist says that he does not want the American laborer to compete with the foreign pauper laborer. See section 99. He assumes that if the foreign laborer is a woolen operative, the only American who may have to compete with him is a woolen operative here. 
His device for saving our operatives from the assumed competition is to tax the American cotton or wheat grower on the cloth he wears to make up an offset to the woolen operative the disadvantage under which he labors. If then the case were true as the protectionist states it, and if his remedy were correct, he would, when he finished his operation, simply have allowed the American woolen operative to escape by transferring to the American cotton or wheat grower the evil results of competition with foreign pauper labor. I. Examination of the proposal to raise the standard of public comfort. But the protectionist reiterates that he wants to make our people well off and to diffuse general prosperity, and he says that his system does this. He says that the country has prospered under protection and on account of it. He brings from the census the figures for increased wealth of the country, and, to speak of no minor errors, draws an inference that we have prospered more than we should have done under free trade, which is what he has to prove without noticing that the second term of the comparison is absent and unattainable. In the same manner, I once heard a man argue from statistics who showed by the small loss of city by fire that its fire department cost too much. I asked him if he had any statistics of the fires which we should have had but for the fire department. See section 102. The people of the United States have inherited an untouched continent. The now living generation is practicing bonanza farming on prairie soil which has never borne a crop. The population is only 15 to the square mile. The population of England and Wales is 446 to the square mile. That of the British Islands, 290. That of Belgium, 481. Of France, 180. Of Germany, 216. Bateman estimates that in the better part of England or Wales, a peasant proprietor would need from four and a half to six acres, and in the worst part, from nine to forty-five acres on which to support a healthy family. The soil of England and Wales equally divided between the families there would give only seven acres apiece. The land of the United States, equally divided between the families there, would give 215 acres apiece. These old nations give us the other term of the comparison by which we measure our prosperity. They have a dense population on a soil which has been used for thousands of years. We have an extremely sparse population on a virgin soil. We have an excellent climate, mountains full of coal and ore, natural highways on rivers and lakes, and a coast indented with sounds, bays, and some of the best harbors in the world. We have also a population of good national character, especially as regards the economic and industrial virtues. The sciences and arts are highly cultivated among us, and our institutions are the best for the development of economic strength. As compared with old nations, we are prosperous. Now comes the protectionist statesman and says, the things which you have enumerated are not the causes of our comparative prosperity. Those things are all vain. Our prosperity is not due to them. I made it with my taxes. A. In the first place, the fact is that we surpass most in prosperity those nations which are most like us in their tax systems, and those compared with whom our prosperity is least remarkable are those which have by free trade offset as much as possible the disadvantage of age and dense population. Since then, we find greatest difference in prosperity with least difference in tax, and least difference in prosperity with greatest difference in tax. We cannot regard tax as a cause of prosperity, but as an obstacle to prosperity which must have been overcome by some stronger cause. That such is the case lies plainly on the face of the facts. The prosperity which we enjoy is the prosperity which God and nature have given us, minus what the legislator has taken from it. B. We prospered with slavery just as we have prospered with protection. The argument that the former was a cause would be just as strong as the argument that the latter is a cause. C. 
the protectionists take to themselves as a credit all the advance in the arts of the last 25 years because they have not entirely offset it and destroyed it. D. The protectionists claim that they have increased our wealth. All the wealth that is produced must be produced by labor and capital applied to land. The people have wrought and produced. The tax gatherer has only subtracted something. Whether he used what he took well or ill, he subtracted. He could not do anything else. Therefore, whatever wealth we see about us, and whatever wealth appears in the senses, is what the people have produced, less what the tax gatherer has taken out of it. E. If the members of Congress can establish for themselves some ideal of the grade of comfort which the average American citizen ought to enjoy, and then just get it for him, they have used their power hitherto in a very beggarly manner. For although the average status of our people is high when compared with that of other people on the globe, nevertheless, when compared with any standard of ideal comfort, it leaves much to be desired. If Congress has the power supposed, they surely ought not to measure the exercise of it by only making us better off than Europeans. F. During the late presidential campaign, the protectionist orators assured the people that they meant to make everybody well off, that they wished our people to be prosperous, contented, etc. I wish so too. I wish that all my readers may be millionaires. I freely and sincerely confer on them all the bounty of my good wishes. They will not find a cent more in their pockets on that account. The congressmen have no power to bless my readers, which I have not save one, that is, the power to tax them. G. If the congressmen are determined to elevate the comfort of the population by taxing the population, then every new shipload of immigrants must be regarded as a new body of persons whom we must elevate by the taxes we have to pay. It is said that an Irishman affirmed that a dollar in America would not buy more than a shilling in Ireland. He was then asked why then he did not stay in Ireland. He replied that it was because he could not get the shilling there. That is a good story, only it stops just where it ought to begin. The next question is, how does he get the dollar when he comes to America? The protectionist wants us to suppose that he gets it by grace of the tariff. If so, he gets it out of those who were here before he came. But plainly no such thing is true. He gets it by earning it and he adds two dollars to the wealth of the country while earning it. The only thing the tariff does in regard to it is to lower the purchasing power of the dollar if it is spent for products of manufacture to 70 cents. Here again then, we find that protective taxes, if they do just what the protectionist says that they will do, produce the very opposite effects from those which he says they will produce. They lessen wealth, reduce prosperity, diminish average comfort, and lower the standard of living. See section 30. End of section 4. Section 5 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Robert Bacours. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. Chapter 3, Part 1. Protectionism, the Ism which teaches that waste makes wealth. 1885. CHAPTER Three: PROTECTIONISM EXAMINED ADVERSELY I have so far examined protectionism as a philosophy of national wealth, assuming and accepting its own doctrines and following them out to see if they will issue as is claimed. We have found that they do not, but that protectionism, on its own doctrines, issues in the impoverishment of the nation and in failure to do anything which it claims to do. On the contrary, an examination in detail of its means, methods, purposes, and plans shows that it must produce waste and loss, so that, if it were true, 
we should have to believe that waste and loss are a means of wealth. Now I turn about to attack it in face, on an open issue, for if any project which is advocated proved, upon free and fair examination, to be based on errors of fact and doctrine, it becomes a danger and an evil to be exposed and combated, and truth of fact and doctrine must be set against it. 1. Protectionism includes and necessarily carries with it hostility to trade or, at least, suspicion against trade. a. Rules for knowing when it is safe to trade. Every protectionist is forced to regard trade as a mischievous or at least doubtful thing. Protectionists have even tried to formulate rules for determining when trade is beneficial and when harmful. It has been said that we ought to trade only on the meridians of longitude, not on parallels of latitude. It has been affirmed that we cannot safely trade unless we have taxes to exactly offset the lower wages of foreign countries. But it is plain that if the case stands so that an American employer says, I am at a disadvantage compared with my foreign competitor because he pays less wages than I, then by the same token, the American laborer will say, I am at an advantage compared to my foreign comrade, for I get better wages than he. If the law interferes with the state of things, so that the employer is enabled to say, I am now at less a disadvantage in competition with my foreign rival, because I do not have to pay as much more wages than he as formerly, then by the same token, the American laborer must say, I am not now as much better off than my foreign comrade as formerly, for I do not now gain much more than he as I did. There is not now as much advantage in immigrating to this country as formerly. Therefore, whenever the taxes just offset the difference in wages, they just take away from the American laborer all his superiority over the foreigner and take away all the reasons for caring to come to this country. So much for the laborer. But the employer, if he has arrested immigration, has cut off one source of the supply of labor, tending to raise wages, and is at war with himself again. It has been said that two nations cannot trade if the rate of interest in the two differs by two per cent. The rate of interest in the Atlantic States and in the Mississippi Valley has always differed by two per cent, yet they have traded together under absolute free trade, and the Mississippi Valley has had to begin a wilderness and grow up to the highest standard of civilization in spite of that state of things. It has been said that we ought to trade only with inferior nations. The United States does not trade with any other nation save when it buys territory. A in the United States trades with B in some foreign country. If I want caoutchouc, I want to trade with a savage in the forests of South America. If I want mahogany, I want to trade with a man in Honduras. If I want sugar, I want to trade with a man in Cuba. If I want tea, I want to trade with a man in China. If I want silk or champagne, I want to trade with a man in France. If I want a razor, I want to trade with a man in England. I want to trade with the man who has the thing which I want of the best quality and at the lowest rate of exchange for my products. What is the definition or test of an inferior nation? And what has that got to do with trade any more than the race, language, or color, or religion of the man who has the goods? If trade was an object of suspicion and dread, then indeed we ought to have rules for distinguishing safe and beneficial trade from mischievous trade. But these attempts to define and discriminate only expose the folly of the suspicion. We find that the primitive men who dwelt in the caves of the glacial epoch carried on trade. The earliest savages made footpaths throughout the forests by which to traffic and trade, winning thereby mutual advantages. They found that they could supply more wants with less effort by trade, which gave them a share in the natural advantages and acquired the skill of others. They trained beasts of burden, improved roads, invented wagons and boats, all in order to extend and facilitate trade. They were foolish enough to think that they were gaining by it, <laughs> and did not know that they needed a protective tariff to keep them from ruining themselves. Or, why does not some protectionist sociologist 
tell us at what stage of civilization trade ceases to be advantageous and begins to need restraint and regulation? Part B. Economic Units, Not National Units The protectionists say that their system advances civilization under a state and makes it great, but the facts are all against them. It was by trade that civilization was extended over the earth. It was through the contact of trade that the more civilized nations transmitted to others the alphabet, weights, and measures, knowledge of astronomy, divisions of time, tools, and weapons, coined money, systems of numeration, treatment of metals, skins, and wool, and all other achievements of knowledge and invention which constitute the basis of our civilization. On the other hand, the nations which shut themselves up and developed an independent and self-contained civilization, China and Japan, present us the types of arrested civilization and stereotypical social status. It is the penalty of isolation and of withdrawal from the giving and taking which properly bind the whole human race together, that even such intelligent and highly endowed people as the Chinese should find their high activity arrested at narrow limitations on every side. They invent coin, but never get beyond a cast copper coin. They invent gunpowder, but cannot make a gun. They invent movable types, but only the most rudimentary book. They discover the mariner's compass, but never pass the infancy of shipbuilding. The fact is, then, that trade has been the handmaid of civilization. It has traversed national boundaries and has gradually, with improvement in the arts of transportation, drawn the human race into closer relations and more harmonious interests. The contact of trade slowly saps old national prejudice and religious or race hatreds. The jealousies which were perpetrated by distance and ignorance cannot stand before contact and knowledge. To stop trade is to arrest this beneficent work, to separate mankind into sections and factions, and to favor discord, jealousy, and war. Such is the action of protectionism. The protectionists make much of their pretend nationalism, and they try to reason out some kind of relationship between the scope of economic forces and the boundaries of existing nations. The argumentation is fatally broken at its first step. They do not show what they might show, viz. that the scope of economic forces on any given stage of the arts does form economic units. I doubt if anything less than the whole earth could be considered so today when the wool of Australia, the hides of South America, the cotton of Alabama, the wheat of Manitoba, and the meat of Texas meet the laborers of Manchester and Sheffield, and would meet the laborers in Lowell and Patterson, if the barriers were out of the way. But what the national protectionists would need to show would be that the economic unit coincides with the political unit. He would have to affirm that Maine and Texas are in one economic unit, but that Maine and New Brunswick are not, or that Massachusetts and Minnesota are in one economic unit, but that Massachusetts and Manitoba are not. Every existing state is a product of its historic accidents. Mr. Jefferson set out to buy the city of New Orleans. He awoke one morning to find that he had bought the western half of the Mississippi Valley. And since that turned out so, the protectionists think that Missouri and Illinois prosper by trading in perfect freedom. Now, since the above was set in type, I have for the first time seen an argument from a protectionist that a tariff between our states is or may become desirable. It is from the Chicago Interocean and marks the extreme limit reached up to this time by protectionist fanaticism and folly although it is thoroughly consistent and fairly lays bare the spirit and essence of protectionism. To quote, In the United States, the present ominous and overshadowing strike in the iron trade, by which from 75,000 to 100,000 men have been thrown out of work, is an incisive example of the tendency of this country also to a condition of trade which will compel individual states and certain sections of the country to ask for legislation, in order to protect them against the cheaper labor and superior natural advantage of others. The remedy for the harm done by our taxes on our foreign trade is to lay some on our domestic trade. 
Now, if it had not turned out so, it would have been very mischievous for them to trade in perfect freedom. Nova Scotia did not join the revolt of our thirteen colonies. Hence it is thought ruinous to let coal and potatoes come in freely from Nova Scotia. If she had revolted with us, it would have been for the benefit of everybody in this union to trade with her as freely as we now trade with Maine. We tried to conquer Canada in 1812 to 1813, and failed. Consequently, the Canadians now put taxes on our coal and petroleum and wheat, and we put taxes on their lumber, which our coal and petroleum industries need. We did annex Texas at the cost of war in 1845. Consequently, we trade with Texas now under absolute freedom, but if we trade with Mexico, it must be only very carefully and under stringent limitations. Is this wisdom? Or is it all pure folly and wrong-headedness by which men who boast of their intelligence throw away their own chances? And since the above was in type, a treasury order has subjected all goods from Canada to the same taxes as imported goods, although they may be going from Minnesota to England. Nature has made men too well off. The inhabitants of North America will not simply use their chances, but they divide into two artificial bodies, so as to try to harm each other. Millions are spent to cut an isthmus where nature has left none, and millions more to set up a tax barrier where nature has made a highway. Trade is a beneficent thing. It does not need any regulation or restraint. There is no point at which it begins to be dangerous. It is mutually beneficent. If it ceases to be so, it ceases entirely, because he who no longer gains by it will no longer carry it on. 2. Protectionism is at war with improvement. The cities of Japan are built of very combustible material, and when a fire begins, it is rarely arrested until the city is destroyed. It was suggested that a steam fire engine would there reach its maximum of utility. One was imported and proved very useful on several occasions. Thereupon, the carpenters got up a petition to the government to send the fire engine away because it ruined their business. The instance is grotesque and exaggerated, but it is strictly true to the principle of protectionism. The southern countries of England, a century ago, protested against the opening of the Great Northern Turnpike, because that would bring the products of the northern countries to London market, of which the southern countries had a monopoly. After the St. Gothard Tunnel was opened, the people of southern Germany petitioned the government to lay higher taxes on Italian products to offset the cheapness which the tunnel had produced. In 1837, the first two steamers which ever made commercial voyages across the Atlantic arrived at the same time. A grand celebration was held in New York. The foolish people rejoiced as if a new blessing had been won. Man had won a new triumph over nature. What was the gain of it? It was that he could satisfy his needs with less labor than before, or in plain language, get things cheaper. But in 1842, a home industry convention was held in New York at which it was alleged, as the prime reason why more taxes were needed, that this steam transportation had made things cheap here. Taxes were needed to neutralize the improvement. A. Taxes to offset cheapened transportation. For the last 25 years, to go no further back, we have multiplied inventions to facilitate transportation. Ocean cables, improved marine engines, and screw steamers have been only improved by means of supplying the wants of people on two continents more abundantly with the products each of the other. The scientific journals and the daily papers boast of every step in this development as a thing to be proud of and rejoice in. But in the meantime, the legislators on both sides of the water are hard at work to neutralize it by taxation. We in the United States have multiplied monstrous taxes on all things which others make and which we want to prevent them from being brought to us. The statesmen of the European continent are laying taxes on our meat and wheat, lest they be brought to their people. The arts are bringing us together. The taxes are needed to keep us apart. In France, for instance, the agriculturist complains of American competition, 
not pauper labor, but gratuitous soil and sunlight. He does not want the French artisan to have the benefit of our prairie soil. The government yields to him and lays a tax on our meat and wheat. Now this raises the price of bread in Paris, where the reconstruction of the city has collected large artisan population. And the government then finds itself driven to fix the price of bread in Paris to keep it down. But the reconstruction of the city was accomplished by contracting a great debt, which means heavy taxes. These taxes drive the population out into the suburbs. At least one voice has been raised by an owner of a city property that a tax ought to be laid on suburban residents to drive them back into the city and not let them escape the efforts of the city landlord to throw his taxes on them. Then again, France has been subsidizing ships, and when the question of renewing the subsidy came up, it was argued that the ships subsidized at the expense of the French taxpayer had lowered freight on wheat and made wheat cheap. That is, as somebody justly replied, had wrought the very mischief against which the increased tax had just been demanded on wheat. Therefore the taxpayer had been taxed first to make wheat cheap, and then again to make it dear. Tax A to favor B. If A complains, tax C to make it up to A. If C complains, tax B to favor C. If any of them still complains, begin all over again. Tax them as long as anybody complains or anybody wants anything. This is the statesmanship of the last quarter of the 19th century. Bismarck, too, is going into the business. He has to rule the people who live on a poor soil and have to bear a crushing military system. The consequence is that the population is declining. Emigration exceeds the natural increase. Bismarck's cure for it is to lay protective taxes against America's pork and wheat and rye. This will protect the German agriculturist. If it lowers still more the comfort of the buyers of food and drives more of them out of the country, then he will go and buy or fight for colonies at the expense of German agriculturists who he has just protected. Although the surplus population of Germany has been taking itself away for 30 years without asking help or giving trouble, what can Germany gain by diverting her emigrants to her own colony unless she means to bring the able-bodied men back to fight her battles? If she means that, the immigrants will not go to her colony. France is also reviving the old colonial policy with discriminating favors and compensatory restraints. She already owns a possession in Algeria, which is the best example of a colony for the sake of a colony. It has been asserted in the French chambers that each French family now in Algeria has cost the government, i.e. the French taxpayer, 25,000 francs. The longing of these countries for colonies is like the longing of a negro dandy for a cane or a tall hat so as to be like the white gentleman. B. Sugar bounties. The worst case of all, however, is sugar. The protectionists long boasted of beet root sugar as a triumph of their system. It is now an industry in which an immense amount of capital is invested on the continent, but cheap transportation for cane sugar and improvements in the treatment of the latter are constantly threatening it. Mention is made in Bradstreet's for June 28, 1885, of a very important improvement in the treatment of cane which has just been invented in Berlin. Germany has an excise tax on beetroot sugar, but allows a drawback on it when exported, which is greater than the tax. Now this acts as a bounty paid by the German taxpayer on the exportation. Consequently, beetroot sugar has appeared even in our own market. The chief market for it, however, is England. The consequence is that sugar, which is nine cents a pound in Germany and seven cents a pound here, is five cents a pound in England and that the annual consumption of sugar per head in the three countries is as follows. England, 67 and a half pounds. United States, 51 pounds. Germany, 12 pounds. I sometimes find it difficult to make people understand the difference between wanting an industry and wanting goods, but this case ought to make that distinction clear. Obviously the Germans have the industry, and the Englishmen have the sugar. 
No sooner, however, does Germany get her export bounty in good working order than the American sugar refiners besiege their government to know whether Germany is to have the monopoly of giving sugar to the Englishman. As the Vienna correspondent of The Economist writes, June 15, 1885, the representatives of sugar trade addressed a petition to the finance minister, asking, above all things, that the premium on exports should be retained, without which, they say, they cannot continue to exist, and which is granted in all countries where beet root sugar is manufactured. They get a bounty and compete for that privilege. Then the French refiners say that they cannot compete and must be enabled to compete in giving sugar to the Englishman, I believe that their case is under favorable consideration. I have found it harder, as is usually the case, to get recorded information about the trade and industry of our own country than about those of foreign nations. However, we too, although we do not raise beet sugar, have our own share in this bounty folly, as we may have seen by the following statement which comes to hand just in time to serve my purpose. The export of refined sugar from the United States is entirely confined to hard sugars, or to be more explicit, loaf, crushed, and granulated. This is because the drawback upon this class of sugar is so large that refiners are unable to sell them at less than the cost. The highest collectible duty upon sugar testing as high as 99 degrees is but 2.36, but the drawback upon granulated testing the same and in the case of crushed and loaf, less is 2.82, less 1%. This is exactly 43 cents per 100 pounds, more than the government receives in duty. But it rarely happens that raw sugar is imported testing 99 degrees, and never for refining purposes. The following table gives the rates of duty upon the average grades used in refining. Fair refining testing, 89 degrees, duty 1.96. Fair refining testing, 90 degrees, 2.0. Centrifugal testing, 96 degrees, duty of 2.28. Beet sugar testing, 88, duty 1.92. It will be clearly seen from the above figures that with a net drawback upon hard sugar of 2.79, our refiners are able to sell to foreigners, through the assistance of our treasury, sugar at less than cost. Taking, for instance, the net price of centrifugal testing, only 97 degrees, and the net price, less drawback of granulated, centrifugal raw sugar testing, 97 degrees, 6.0. Less duty, 2.28, with a net of 3.72. Granulated refined testing, 99 degrees, 6.37 and a half. Less drawback, 2.71, with a net of 3.66, total 6 and one half. Nothing could demonstrate the absurdity of the present rate of drawback more clearly than the above. A refiner pays six and a half cents per hundred more for raw sugar, testing two degrees less saccharin than he sells refined for. Not, however, to the American consumers, but to foreigners. After paying the expenses necessary to refining by the assistance of a drawback, which clearly amounts to a subsidy of about 50 cents a hundred pounds, our large sugar monopolists are assisted by the government to increase the cost of sugar to American consumers. One firm controls almost the entire trade of the East. At all events, it is safe to say that the trade of the entire country is controlled by three firms, and the Treasury assists this monopoly in sustaining prices against the interest of the country at large. Up to date, the exports of refined sugar have amounted to 83,340 tons, which, taken at 50 cents a hundred, has cost the Treasury over $833,000. All this may not have gone into the pockets of the refiners, as the shipowners have obtained a share, but the fact remains that the Treasury is the loser by this amount. Besides, this bounty presses hard upon the consumers. They not only have to pay the tax, but during the late rise they were compelled to pay more for their sugar than they otherwise would have done had not the export demand caused by selling sugar to foreigners at less than cost, the treasury paying the difference increased prices. While an American consumer is charged six and a half cents for granulated, 
foreign buyers, through the liberality of our government, can buy it under three and three-quarter cents. And certainly, it is time that the Secretary of the Treasury asked the Sugar Commission to commence a comprehensive and impartial inquiry. Of course, the story would not be complete if the English refiners did not besiege their government for a tax to keep out this maleficent gift of foreign taxpayers. This, say they, is not free trade. This is protection turned the other way round. We might hold our own on an equal footing, but we cannot contend against a subsidized industry. A superficial thinker might say that this protest was conclusive. The English government set on foot an investigation, not of the sugar refining, but of those other interests which were in danger of being forgotten. There was a tariff investigation which was worth something and was worthy of an enlightened government. It was found that the consumers of sugar had gained more than all the wages paid in sugar refining. But on the side of the producers, it was found that 6,000 persons are employed and 45,000 tons of sugar are used annually in the neighborhood of London in manufacturing jam and confectionery. In Scotland, there are 80 establishments employing over 4,000 people and using 35,000 tons of sugar per annum in similar industries. In the whole United Kingdom, in those industries, 100,000 tons of sugar are used and 12,000 people are employed, three times as many as in sugar refining. Within 20 years, the confectionery trade of Scotland has quadrupled, and the preserving trade, jam and marmalade, has practically been originated. In addition, refined sugar is a raw material in biscuit making and the manufacture of mineral waters, and 50,000 tons are used in brewing and distilling. Hence, the economist argues, and this view seems to have controlled the decision, it may be that the gain which we at present realize from the bounties may not be enduring, as it is impossible to believe that foreign nations will go on taxing themselves to the extent of several millions a year in order to supply us and others with sugar at less than its fair price. But that is no reason for refusing to avail ourselves of their liberality so long as it does last. One point in this case ought not to be lost sight of. If the English government had yielded to the sugar refiners without looking further, all these little industries which are mentioned and which in their aggregate are so important would have been crushed out. Ten years later, they would have been forgotten. It is from such an example that one must learn to form a judgment as to the effect of our tariff in crushing out industries, which are now lost and gone, and cannot even be recalled for purposes of controversy but which would spring into existence again if the repeal of our taxes should give them a chance. On our side of the water, efforts have been made to get us into the sugar struggle by the proposed commercial treaties with Spain and England, which would in effect have extended our protective tariff around Cuban and English West Indian sugar. The sugar consumers of the United States were to pay the Cuban planters the $25 million revenue which they now pay to the Treasury on Cuban sugar on condition that the Cubans should bring back part of it and spend it among our manufacturers. It was a new extension of the plan of taxing some of us for the benefit of others of us. Let it be noticed, too, that when it suited their purpose, the protectionists were ready to sacrifice the sugar industry of Louisiana without the least concern. We have been trying for 25 years to secure the home market and keep everybody else out of it. As soon as we get it firmly shut so that nobody else can get in, we find that it is a question of life and death with us to get out ourselves. The next device is to tax Americans in order to go and buy a piece of the foreign market. At the last session of Congress, Senator Cameron proposed to allow a drawback on raw materials used in exported products. On that plan, the American manufacturer would have two costs of production, one when he was working for the home market, and another much lower one when working for the foreign market. As it is now, the exports of manufactured products, of which so much boasting is heard, are for the most part articles sold abroad lower than here so as not to break down the home monopoly market. The proposed plan would raise that to a system, and we should be giving more presents to foreigners. To return to sugar, our treaty with the Sandwich Islands has produced anomalous and mischievous results on the Pacific coast. 
In the Southern Pacific, New Zealand is just going into the plan of bounties and protection on sugar. It would not, therefore, be very bold to predict a worldwide catastrophe in the sugar industry within five years. Now, what is it all for? What is it about? Napoleon Bonaparte began it in a despotic whim, when he determined to force the production of beetroot sugar to show that he did not care for the supremacy of England at sea, which cut him off from sugar islands. In order not to lose the capital engaged in the industry, protection was continued. But this led to putting more capital into it and further need of protection. The problem has tormented financiers for seventy-five years. There are two natural products of which the cane is far richer than sugar. But the processes of beet sugar industry have been improved until recently, far more rapidly than those of the cane industry. Then the refining is a separate interest. If, then, a country has cane sugar colonies which it wants to protect against other colonies, and a beet sugar industry which it wants to protect against the neighbors who produce beet sugar, and refiners to be protected against foreign refiners, and if the relations of its own colonial cane sugar producers to its own domestic beet sugar producers must be kept satisfactorily adjusted, in spite of changes in processes, transportation, and taxation, and if it wants to get a revenue from sugar and to use the colonial trade to develop its shipping, and if it has two or three commercial treaties in which sugar is an important item, the statesman of that country has a task like that of a juggler riding several horses and keeping several balls in motion. Sugar is the commodity on which the effects of a world-embracing commerce produced by modern inventions are most apparent and it is the commodity through which all the old protectionist anti-commercial doctrines will be brought to the most decisive test. End of chapter 3, part 1
Now comes the national policy, not because it is needed, but as an artificial and inflated piece of political bombast. We are to galvanize our diplomacy by contracting commercial treaties and meddling in foreign quarrels. No doubt this will speedily make a navy necessary. In fact, our proposed American policy is only an old, cast-off, 18th-century John Bull policy, which has forced England to keep up a big army, a big navy, heavy debt, heavy taxes, and a constant succession of little wars. Hence, we shall be taxed some more to pay for a navy. Then it is proposed to tax us more to pay for canals, through which the navy can go. Then we are to be taxed some more to subsidize merchant ships to go through the canal. Then we are to be taxed some more to subsidize voyages, i.e. the carrying trade. Then we are to be taxed some more to provide the ships with cargoes. All this time, the whole West Indian, Mexican, and Central and South American trade is ours, if we will only stand out of the way and let it come. It is ours by all geographical and commercial advantage, and would have been ours since 1825 if we had but taken down the barriers. Instead of that, we propose to tax ourselves some more, to lift it over the barriers, take the taxes off the goods, let exchange go on, and the carrying trade comes as a consequence. If we have goods to carry, we shall build or buy ships in which to carry them. If we have merchant ships, we shall need and shall keep up a suitable navy. If we need canals, we shall build them, as, in fact, private capital is now building one and taking the risk of it all. If we need diplomacy, we shall learn and practice diplomacy of the democratic, peaceful, and commercial type. Thus, under the philosophy of protectionism, the very same thing, if it comes to us freely by the extension of commerce and the march of improvement, is regarded with terror while if we can first bar it out and then only let a little of it in at great cost and pains is a thing worth fighting for. Such is the fallacy of all commercial treaties. The crucial criticism on all of the debates in Washington in 1884 to 1885 was, have these debaters made up their minds to any standard by which to measure what you get and what you give under a commercial treaty? It was plain that they had not. A generation of protectionism has taken away the knowledge of what trade is, and whence its benefits arise, and has created a suspicion of trade. Hence, when our public men came to compare what we should get and what we should give, they set about measuring this by things which were entirely foreign to it. Scarcely two of them agreed to the standards by which to measure it. Some thought that it was the number of people in one country compared with the number in the other, Others thought it was the amount sold as compared to the amount bought from the country in question. Others thought that it was the amount of revenue to be sacrificed by us, compared with the amount which would be sacrificed by the other party. If anyone will try to establish a standard by which to measure the gain by such a treaty to one party or the other, he will be led to see the fallacy of the whole procedure. The greatest gain to both would be if the trade were perfectly free. If it is obstructed more or less, that is a harm to be corrected as far and as soon as possible. If then either party lowers its own taxes, that is a gain and a movement toward the desirable state of things. No state needs anybody's permission to lower its own taxes, and entanglements which would impair its fiscal independence would be a new harm. Since the above was in type, a report from the South American Commission has been received and published. The Commission submitted certain propositions to the President of Chile in behalf of the United States. The report says, The second proposition involved the idea of a reciprocal commercial treaty between the two countries under which special products of each should be admitted free of duty into the other when carried under the flag of either nation. This did not meet with any greater favor with President Santa Maria, who was not disposed to make any reciprocity type treaties. His people were at liberty to sell where they could get the best prices and buy where goods were the cheapest. In his opinion, commerce was not aided by commercial treaties, and Chile neither asked from nor gave to other nations especial favors. Trade would regulate itself, and there was no advantage in trying to divert it in one direction or the other. So far as the United States was concerned, there could be very little trade with Chile, owing to the fact that the products of the two countries were almost identical. 
Chile produced very little that we wanted. And although there were many industrial products of the United States that were used in Chile, the merchants of the latter country must be allowed to buy where they sold and where they could trade to the greatest advantage. With reference to the provision that reduced duties should be allowed only upon goods carried in Chilean or American vessels, he said that Chile did not want any such means to encourage her commerce. Her ports were open to all the vessels of the world upon an equality, and none should have especial privileges. New York Times, July 3, 1885. If this is a fair specimen of the political and economic enlightenment which prevails at the other end of the American continent, it is a great pity that the commission is not a great deal larger. They are like the illiterate missionaries who found themselves unawares in a theological seminary. We would do well to send our whole Congress out there. Protectionism, therefore, is at war with improvement. It is only useful to annul and offset the effects of those very improvements of which we boast. In time, the improvements win power so great that protectionism cannot withstand them. Then it turns about and tries to control and regulate them at great expense by diplomacy or war. The greater and more worldwide these improvements are, the more numerous are the efforts in different parts of the world to revive or extend protection. Now, no doubt there is loss and inconvenience in the changes which improvement brings about. A notable case is the loss and inconvenience of a laborer where a machine is first introduced to supplant him. Patient endurance and hope, in the confidence that he will in the end be better off, has long been preached to him. It is true that he will be better off, but why not apply the same doctrine in connection with the other inconveniences of improvement, where it is equally true? 3. Protection lowers wages. On a pure wages system, that is, where there is a class who have no capital and no land, wages are determined by supply and demand of labor. The demand for labor is measured by the capital in hand to pay for it just as the demand for anything else is measured by the supply of goods offered in exchange for it. In Cobden's language, when two men are after one boss, wages are low. When two bosses are after one man, wages are high. A. No true wages class in the United States. The United States, however, has never yet been on a pure wages system, because there is no class which has no land and cannot get any. In fact, the cheapening of transportation which is going on is making the land of this continent, Australia, and Africa available for the laborers of Europe, and is breaking down the wages system there. This is the real reason for the rise of the proletariat and the expansion of democracy, which are generally attributed to metaphysical, sentimental, or political causes. A man who has no capital and no land cannot live from day to day, except by getting a share in the capital of others in return for services rendered. In an old society or dense population, such a class comes into existence. It has no reserves, no other chances, no other resource. In a new country, no such class exists. The land is to be had for going to it. On the stage of agriculture, which is there existing, very little capital and very little division of labor are necessary. Hence, he who has only unskilled manual strength can get at and use the land, and he can get out of it an abundant supply of rude primary comforts of existence for himself and his family, if it is made so cheap and easy to get from the old centers of population to the new land that the lowest class of laborers can save enough to pay the passage, then the effect will reach the labor market of the old countries also. Such is now the fact. The weakness of a true wages class is in the fact that they have no other chance. Obviously, however, a man is well off in this world in proportion to the chances which he can command. The advantage of education is that it multiplies a man's chances. Our non-capitalists have another chance on the land, and the chance is near and easy to grasp and use. It is not necessary that all or any number should use it, one who uses it leaves more room behind and lessens the supply and competition of labor and helps his class as a class. The other chance which the laborer possesses is also a good one and consequently sets the minimum of unskilled wages high. 
Here we have the reason for high wages in a new country. The relation of things was distinctly visible in the early colonial days. Winthrop tells how the general court in Massachusetts Bay tried to fix the wages of artisans by law. It is obvious that artisans were in great demand to build houses, and that they would not work at their trades unless the wages would buy as good or better living than the farmers could get out of the ground, for these artisans could go and take up land and be farmers too. And the only effect of the law was that the artisans went west, to the valley of the Connecticut, and the law becomes a dead letter. The same equilibrium between the gains from the new land and the wages of artisans and laborers has been kept up ever since. In 1884, an attempt was made to unite the Eastern and Western Iron Associations for common effort in behalf of higher wages. The union would not be formed because the Eastern and Western Associations never had the same rate of wages. The latter, being farther west, where the supply of labor is smaller and the land nearer, have obtained higher wages. It may be well to anticipate a little right here in order to point out that this difference in wages has not prevented the growth of the industry in the West, and has not made competition in a common market impossible. That fact is the first importance to convert the current assumption of the protectionists. They say that an industry cannot be carried on in one place if the wages there are higher than must be paid by somebody in the same industry in another place. Now, this proposition has no foundation in fact at all. Farm laborers in Iowa get three times the wages of farm laborers in England. The products of the former pay 5,000 miles transportation and then drive out the products of the latter. Wages are not only one element, and often they are far from being the most important element in the economy of production. The wages which are paid to the men who make an article have nothing to do with the price or value of that article. And this proposition, I know, has a startling effect on the people who hold to the monkish notions of political economy. But it is only a special case of the theorem that labor which is past has no effect on value, which is the true cornerstone of any sound political economy. Wages are determined by the supply and demand of labor. Value is determined by the supply and demand of the commodity. These are two things that have no connection. Wages are one element in the capitalist's outlay for production. If the total outlay in one line of production, when compared with the return obtained in that line, is not advantageous as the total outlay in another line when compared with the return available in the second line, then the capital is withdrawn from the first line and put into the second. But the rate of wages in either case, or any case, is the market rate, determined by the supply and demand of labor. For that is what the employers must pay if they want the men, whether they are making any profits or not. Now, the facts and economic principles just stated above show plainly why wages are high and put in strong light the assertion of the protectionists that their device makes wages high. That is, higher than they would be otherwise, or higher here than they are in Europe. Wages are not arbitrary. They cannot be shifted up and down at anybody's whim. They are controlled by ultimate causes. If not, then what has made them fall during the last 18 months, 10 to 40 percent, uh, most in the most protected industries? Why are the highest in the least protected and unprotected industries, e.g. the building trades? Hod carriers recently struck in New York for $3 for nine hours' work. Where did the tariff touch their case? Why does not the tariff present the fall in wages? It is all there, and now is the time for it to come into operation, if it can keep wages up. Now it is needed. When wages were high in the market, and it was not needed, it claimed the credit. Now when they fall and it is needed, it is powerless. Wages are capital. If I promise to pay wages, I must find capital somewhere with which to fulfill my contract. If the tariff makes me pay more than I otherwise would, where does the surplus come from? Disregarding money as only an intermediate term, a man's wages are his means of sustenance. Food, clothing, house rent, fuel, lights, furniture, etc. If the tariff system makes him get more of these for ten hours' work in a shop than he would get without tariff, where does the more come from? Nothing but labor and capital can produce food, clothing, etc., 
Either the tax must make these out of nothing, or it can only get them by taking them from those who have made them, that is, by subtracting them from the wages of somebody else. Taking all the wages class into account, then the tax cannot possibly increase, but is sure by waste and loss to decrease wages. b. How taxes do act on wages. If taxes are to raise wages, they must be laid not on goods, but on men. Let the goods be abundant and the men scarce. Then the average wages will be high, for the supply of labor will be small and demand great. If we tax goods and not men, the supply of labor will be great, the demand will be limited, and the wages will be low. And here we see why employers of labor want a tariff, for it is an obvious inconsistency and a most grotesque satire that the same men should tell the workers at home that the tariff makes wages high, and should go to Washington and tell Congress that they want a tariff because the wages are too high. We have found that the high wages of American laborers have independent causes and guarantees outside of legislation. They are provided and maintained by the economic circumstances of the country. This is against the interest of those who want to hire the laborers. No device can serve their interest unless it lowers wages. From the standpoint of an employer, the fortunate circumstances of the laborer become an obstacle to be overcome. The laborer is too well off. Nothing can do any good which does not make him less well off. The competition which troubles the employer is not the pauper labor of Europe. Pauper labor had a meaning in the first half of the century. In England, when the overseers of the poor turned over the younger portion of the occupants of the poor houses to their owners of the new cotton factories, under contracts to teach them the trade and pay them a pittance. Of course, the arrangement had shocking evils connected with it, but it was a transition arrangement. The pauper laborers, children, after a generation became independent laborers, and the system expired of itself, and pauper laborer is now a senseless jingle. The competition which the employers fear is the competition of those industries in America which can pay the high wages which keep the wages high because they do pay them. These draw the laborer away. These offer him another chance. If he had no other way of earning more than he is earning, it would be idle for him to demand more. The reason why he demands more and gets it is because he knows where he can get it, if he cannot get it where he is. If, then, he is to be brought down, the only way to do it is to destroy or lessen the value of his other chance. And this is just what the tariff does. The taxes which are laid for protection must come out of somebody. As I have shown, the protected interests give and take from each other. But if they, as a group, win anything, they must win from another group. And that other group must be the industries which are not and cannot be protected in England, these were formerly manufacturers, and they were taxed under the Corn Laws for the benefit of agriculture. In the United States, of course, the case must be complementary and opposite. We tax agriculture and commerce to benefit manufacturers. Commerce, i.e., the shipbuilding and carrying trade, has been crushed out of existence by the burden. But the burden thus thrown on agriculture and commerce lowers the gains of those industries lessens the attractiveness of them to a laborer, and lessens the value of laborers' other chance, lessens the competition of other American industries with manufacturing, and so, by taking away from the blessing which God and nature have given to the American laborer, enable the man who wants to hire his services to get them at a lower rate. The effect of taxes is just the same as such a percentage taken from the fertility of the soil, the excellence of the climate, the power of tools, or the industrious habits of the people. Hence, it reduces the average comfort and welfare of the population, and with that average comfort, it carries down the wages of such persons as work for wages. C. Perils of statistics, especially of wages. Any student of statistics will be sure to have far less trust in statistics than the uninitiated entertain. The bookkeepers have taught us that figures will not lie, but that they will tell very queer stories. Statistics will not lie, but they will play wonderful tricks with a man who does not understand their dialect. The unsophisticated reader finds it difficult, when a column of statistics is offered to him, 
to resist the impression that they must prove something. The fact is that a column of statistics hardly ever proves anything. It is a popular opinion that anybody can use or understand statistics. The fact is that a special and high grade of skill is required to appreciate the effect of the collateral circumstances under which the statistics were obtained, to appreciate the limits of their application, and to interpret their significance. The statistics which are used to prove national prosperity are an illustration of this, for they are used as absolute measures when it is plain that they have no use except for a comparison. Sometimes the other term of comparison is not to be found, and it is always ignored. A congressional committee in the winter of 1883 to 84, dealing with the tariff, took up the census and proceeded to reckon up the wages in steel production by adding all the wages from the iron mine up. Then they took bar iron and added all the wages from the bottom up again in order to find the importance of the wages element in that, and so on with every stage of the iron industry. They were going to add in the same wages six or eight times over. The statistics of comparative wages which are published are of no value at all. I accept those of Mr. Carroll Wright. He is sufficiently stated of how slight value his are. It is not known how or by whom, or from what selected cases they were collected. It is not known how wide or how long or how thorough was the record from which they were taken. The facts about various classifications of labor and the division of labor, and about the rate at which machinery is run, or about the allowances of one kind or another, which still vary from mill to mill and town to town, are rarely specified at all. Protected employers are eager to tell the wages they pay per day or week, which are of no importance. The only statistics which would be of any use for the comparison which is attempted would be such as show the proportion of wages to total cost per unit. Even this comparison would not have the force which is attributed to the other. Hence the statistics offered are worthless or positively misleading. In the nature of the case, such statistics are extremely hard to get. If application is made to the employers, the inquiry concerns their private business. They have no interest in answering. They cannot answer without either spending great labor on the books, if the inquiry covers a period, or surrendering their books to someone else if they allow him to do the labor. If inquiry is made of the men, it becomes long and tedious and full of uncertainties. Do United States consuls take the trouble involved in such an inquiry? Have they the training necessary to conduct it successfully? The fact is generally established, and is not disputed that wages are higher here than in Europe. The difference is greatest on the lowest grade of labor, manual labor, unskilled labor. The difference is less on higher grades of labor, for what the English call engineers, men who possess personal dexterity and creative power, the difference is the other way if we compare the United States and England. The returns of immigration reflect these differences exactly. The great body of the immigrants consists of farmers and laborers. The skilled laborers are comparatively a small class, and if the claims of the individuals to be what they call themselves were tested by English or Germans' trade standards, the number would be very small indeed. Engineers emigrate from Germany to England. Men of that class rarely come to this country, or if they come, they come under special contracts or soon return. Each country, spite of all taxes and other devices, gets the class of men for which its industrial condition offers the best chances. The only thing the tariff does in the matter is to take from those who have an advantage here a part of that advantage. Protectionism is socialism. Simply to give protectionism a bad name would be to accomplish very little. When I say that protectionism is socialism, I mean to classify it and bring it not only under the proper heading, but into relation with its true affinities. Socialism is any device or doctrine whose aim is to save individuals from any of the difficulties or hardships of the struggle for existence and the competition of life by the intervention of the state, inasmuch as the state never is or can be anything but some other people. Socialism is a device for making some people fight the struggle for existence for others. The devices always have a doctrine behind them which aims to show why this ought to be done.
and the protected interests demand that they be saved from the trouble and annoyance of business competition, and that they be assured profits for their undertakings by the state, that is, at the expense of their fellow citizens. If this is not socialism, then there is no such thing. If employers may demand that the state shall guarantee them profits, why may not the employers demand that the state shall guarantee them wages? If we are taxed to provide profits, why should we not be taxed for public workshops, for insurance to laborers, or for any other devices which will give wages and save the laborer from the annoyances of life and risks and hardships of the struggle for existence? The we who are to pay changes all the time, and the turn of the protected employer to pay will surely come before long. The plan of all living on each other is capable of great expansion. It is as yet far from being perfected or carried out completely. The protectionists are only educating those who are as yet on the paying side of it, but who will certainly use political power to put themselves also on the receiving side of it. The argument that the state must do something for me because my business does not pay is a very far-reaching argument. If it is good for pig iron and woolens, it is good for all the things to which the socialists apply it. End of chapter 3「Section 7 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner Protectionism – The Ism Which Teaches That Waste Makes Wealth, 1885 Chapter 4, Part 1 Sundry Fallacies of Protectionism I can now dispose rapidly of a series of current fallacies put forward by the protectionists. They generally are fanciful or far-fetched attempts to show some equivalent which the taxpayer gets for his taxes. A. That infant industries can be nourished up to independence and that they then become productive. I know of no case where this hope has been realized, although we have been trying the experiment for nearly a century. The weakest infants today are those whom Alexander Hamilton set out to protect in 1791. As soon as the infants begin to get any strength, if they ever do get any, the protective system forces them to bear the burden of other infants, and so on forever. The system superinduces hydrocephalus on the infants, and instead of ever growing to maturity, the longer they live, the bigger babies they are. It is the system which makes them so, and on its own plan it can never rationally be expected to have any other effect. See further under the next fallacy. Mill makes a statement of a case, as within the bounds of conceivability, where there might be an advantage for a young country to protect an infant industry. He is often quoted without regard to the limitation of his statement, as if he had affirmed the general expediency of protection in new countries and for infant industries. It amounts to a misquotation to quote him without regard to the limitations which he specified. The statement which he did make is mathematically demonstrable. The doctrine so developed is very familiar in private enterprise. A business enterprise may be started which for some years will return no profits or will occasion losses, but which is expected later to recoup all these. What are the limits within which such an enterprise can succeed? It must either call for sinking capital only for a short period, like building a railroad or planting an orange grove, or it must promise enormous gains after it is started, like a patented novelty. The higher the rate of interest, as in any new country, the more stringent and narrow these conditions are. Mill said that it was conceivable that a case of an industry might occur in which this same calculation might be applied to a protective tax. If, then, anybody says that he can offer an industry which meets the conditions, let it be examined to see if it does so. If protection is never applied until a case is offered, it will never be applied at all. A thing which is mathematically conceivable is one which is not absurd, but a thing which is practically possible is quite another thing. For myself, I strenuously dissent from Mill's doctrine even as he limits it. In the first place, the state cannot by taxes work out an industrial enterprise of a character such that it, as any one can see, demands the most intense and careful oversight by persons whose capital is at stake in it, and, in the second place, the state would bear the loss while it lasted, but private interests would take the gain after it began. b. That protective taxes do not raise prices but lower prices. To this is obvious to reply, what good can they then do toward the end proposal? Still, it is true that, under circumstances, protective taxes do lower prices. The protectionist takes an infant industry in hand and proposes to rear it by putting on taxes to ward off competition, and by giving it more profits than the world's market price would give. This raises the price. But the consumer then raises a complaint. 
the protectionist turns to him and promises that by and by there will be overproduction and prices will fall. This arrives in due time, for every protective industry is organized as a more or less limited monopoly, and a monopoly which has overproduced its market at the price which it wants is the weakest industry possible. The consumer now wins, but a whale from the cradle calls the protectionist back to the infant industry, which is in convulsions from overproduction. Some of the infants die. This gives a new chance to the others. They combine for a more effective monopoly, put the prices up again by limiting production, and go on until overproduction produces a new collapse. This is another reason why infants never win vitality. The net result is that the market is in constant alterations of stringency and laxity, and nothing at all is gained. Whenever we talk of prices, it should be noticed that our statements involve money, the rate at which goods exchange for money. If, then, we want to raise prices, we must restrict the supply of goods, so that on the doctrine of money also we shall come to the same result as before, that protective taxes lessen production and diminish wealth. The problem of managing any monopoly is to dose the market with just the quantity which it will take at the price which the monopolist wants to get. In a qualified monopoly, that is, one which is shared by a number of persons, the difficulty is to get agreement about the management. They may not have any communication with each other and may compete. If so, they will overdose the market and the price will fall. Then they meet to establish communication, form an association to get harmonious action, and agree to divide the production among them and limit and regulate it to prevent the former mistake and restore prices. C. That we should be a purely agricultural nation under free trade. A purely agricultural nation covering a territory as large as that of the United States is inconceivable. The distribution of industries now inside the United States is a complete proof that no such thing would come to pass, for we have absolute free trade inside, and manufacturers are growing up in the agricultural states just as fast as circumstances favor, and just as fast as they can be profitably carried on. Under free trade, there would be a subdivision of cotton, woolen, iron, and other industries, and we should both export and import different varieties and qualities of these goods. The southern states are now manufacturing coarse cottons in competition with New England. The western states manufacture coarse woolens, certain grades of leather and iron goods, etc., in competition with the east. Here we see the exact kind of differentiation which would take place under free trade, and we can see the mischief of the tariff, whether on the one hand it strikes a whole category with the same brutal ignorance, or tries by cunning subclassification to head off every effort to save itself which the trade makes. If, however, it was conceivable that we should become a purely agricultural nation, the only legitimate inference would be that our whole population could be better supported in that way than in any other. If there was a greater profit in something else, some of them would go into it. D. That communities which manufacture are more prosperous than those which are agricultural. This is as true as if it should be said that all tall men are healthy. It would be answered that some are and some are not, that tallness and health have no connection. Some manufacturing communities are prosperous and some not. The self-contradiction of protectionism appears in one of its boldest forms in this fallacy. We are told that manufacturers are a special blessing. The protectionist says that he is going to give us some. Instead of that, he makes new demands on us, lays a new burden on us, gives us nothing but more taxes. He promises us an income and increases our expenditure, promises an asset and gives a liability, promises a gift and creates a debt, promises a blessing and gives a burden. The very thing which he boasts of as a great and beneficial advantage gives us nothing, but takes from us more. Prosperity is no more connected with one form of industry than another. If it were so, some of mankind would have, by nature, a permanently better chance than others, and no one could emigrate to a new, that is, agricultural country, without injuring his interests. The world is not made so. E. That it is an object to diversify industry, and that nations which have various industries are stronger than others which have not various industries. It is not an object to diversify industry, but to multiply and diversify our satisfactions, comforts, and enjoyments. If we can do this by unifying our industry in greater measure than by diversifying it, then we should do, and we will do, the former. It is not a question to be decided a priori, but depends upon economic circumstances. If a country has a supremacy in some one industry, it will have only one. California and Australia had only one industry until the gold mines declined in productiveness, that is, until their supreme advantage over other countries was diminished. They began to diversify when they began to be less well off. The oil region of Pennsylvania has a chance of three industries, the old farming industry, coal, and oil. It will have only one industry so long as oil gives chances superior to those enjoyed by any similar district. When it loses its unique advantage, by nature it will diversify. The strongest nation is the one which brings products into the world's market which are of high demand, but which cost it little toil and sacrifice to get, for it will then have command of all the good things which men can get on the earth at little effort to itself. Whether the products which it offers are one or numerous is immaterial. 
All the tariff has to do with it is that when the American comes into the world's market with wheat, cotton, tobacco, and petroleum, all objects of high demand by mankind and little cost to him, it forces him to forgo a part of his due advantage. F. That manufacturers give value to land. This doctrine issued from the Agricultural Bureau. It has been thought a grand development of the protectionist argument. It is a simple logical fallacy based on some misconstrued statistics. The value of land depends on supply and demand. The demand for land is population. Hence, when the population is dense, the value of land is great. Manufactures can be carried on only where there is a supply of labor, that is, where the population is dense. Hence, high value of land and manufacturing industry are common results of dense population. The statistician of the Agricultural Bureau connected them with each other as cause and effect, and the New York Tribune said that it was the grandest contribution to political economy since the fingers of Horace Greeley stiffened in death, which was true. If manufacturers spring up spontaneously out of original strength and by independent development, of course they add value to land. That is to say, the district has new industrial power and every interest in it is benefited. But if the manufacturers have to be protected, paid for, and supported, they do not do any good as manufacturers, but only as a device for drawing capital from elsewhere as tribute. In this way, protective taxes do alter the comparative value of land in different districts. This effect can be seen under some astonishing phases in Connecticut and other manufacturing states. The farmers are taxed to hire some people to go and live in manufacturing villages and carry on manufacturing there. This displacement of population, brought about at the expense of the rural population, diminishes the value of agricultural land and raises that of city land right here within the same state. The hillside population is being impoverished, and the hillside farms are being abandoned on account of the tribute levied on them to swell the value of mill sites and adjoining land in the manufacturing towns. G. That the farmer, if he pays taxes to bring into existence a factory, which would not otherwise exist, will win more than the taxes by selling farm produce to the artisans. This is an arithmetical fallacy. It proposes to get three pints out of a quart. The farmer is out for the tax and the farm produce, and he cannot get back more than the tax because, if the factory owes its existence to the protective taxes, it cannot make any profit outside of the taxes. The proposition to the farmer is that he shall pay taxes to another man who will bring part of the tax back to buy produce with it. This is to make the farmer rich. The man who owned stock in a railroad and who rode on it, paying his fare in the hope of swelling his own dividends, was wise compared with a farmer who believes that protection can be a source of gain to him. Since, as I have shown, protective taxes act like a reduction in the fertility of the soil, they lower the margin of cultivation and raise rent. They do not, however, raise it in favor of the agricultural landowner, for, by the displacement just described, they take away from him to give to the town landowner. Of course, I do not believe that the protective taxes have really lowered the margin of cultivation in this country, for they have not been able to offset the greater richness of the newest land and the advance in the arts. What protection costs us comes out of the exuberant bounty of nature to us. Still, I know of very few who could not stand it to be a great deal better off than they are, and the New England farmer is the one who has the least chance and the fewest advantages with which to endure protection. H. That farmers gain by protection because it draws so many laborers out of competition with them. Since the farmers pay the taxes by which this operation is supposed to be produced, a simple question is raised, viz. how much can one afford to pay to buy off competition in his business? He cannot afford to pay anything unless he has a monopoly which he wants to consolidate. Our farmers are completely open to competition on every side. The immigration of farmers every three or four years exceeds all the workers in all the protected trades. Hence the farmers, if they take the view which is recommended to them, instead of gaining any ground, are face to face with a task which gets bigger and bigger the longer they work at it. If one man should support another in order to get rid of the latter's competition as a producer, that would be the case where the taxpayers support soldiers, idle pensioners, paupers, etc. A protected manufacturer, however, by the hypothesis, is not simply supported in idleness, but he is carrying on a business, the losses of which must be paid by those who buy off his competition in their own production. On the other hand, when farmers come to market, they are in free competition with several other sources of supply. Hence, if they did any good to agricultural industry by hiring the artisans to go out of competition with them, they would have to share the gain with all their competitors the world over, while paying all the expense of it themselves. The movement of men over the earth and the movement of goods over the earth are complementary operations. Passports to stop the men and taxes to stop the goods would be equally legitimate. Since it is, once for all, a fact that some parts of the earth have advantages for one thing and other parts for other things, men avail themselves of the local advantages, either by moving themselves to the places or by trading what they produce where they are for what others produce in the other places. The passenger trains and the freight trains are set in motion by the same ultimate economic fact. 
Our exports are all bulky and require more tonnage than our imports. On the westward trip, consequently, bunks are erected and men are brought in space where cotton, wheat, etc. were taken out. The tariff, by so much as it lessens the import of goods, leaves room which the ship owners are eager to fill with immigrants. To do this, they lower the rates. Hence, the tariff is a premium on immigration. The protectionists have claimed that the tariff does favor immigration, but nine-tenths of the immigrants are laborers, domestic servants, and farmers. Probably more than one-third of the total number, including women, find their way to the land. As we have seen, the tariff also lowers the profits of agriculture, which discourages immigration and the movement to the land. Therefore, if the farmer believes what the protectionist tells him, he must understand that the taxes he pays bring in more people and raise the value of land by settling it, and that they also bring more competition, which the farmer must buy off by lowering the profits of his own, the farming, industry. Then, too, so far as the immigrants are artisans, the premium on immigration is a tax paid to increase the supply of labor, that is, to lower wages, although the protectionists say that the tariff raises wages. Hence, we see that when a tax is laid in our modern complicated society, instead of being a simple and easy means or method to be employed for a specific purpose, its action and reaction on transportation, land, wages, etc., will produce erratic, contradictory, and confused effects, which cannot be predicted or analyzed thoroughly. And the protectionist, when he pleads three or four arguments for his system, is alleging three or four features of it which, if properly analyzed and brought together, are found to be mutually destructive and cumulative only as to the mischief they do. I. That our industries would perish without protection. Those who say this think only of manufacturing establishments as industries. They also talk of our industries. They mean those we support by the taxes we pay, not those from which we get dividends. No industry will ever be given up except in order to take a better one, and if, under free trade, any of our industries should perish, it would only be because the removal of restrictions enabled some other industry to offer so much better rewards that labor and capital would seek the latter. It is plain that if a man does not know of any better way to earn his living than the one in which he is, he must remain in that or move to some other place. If anyone can suppose that the population of the United States could be forced by free trade to move away, he must suppose that this country cannot support its population and that we made a mistake in coming here. This argument is especially full of force if the articles to be produced are coal, iron, wool, copper, timber, or any other primary products of the soil. For if it is said that we cannot raise these products of the soil in competition with some other part of the Earth's surface, all it proves is that we have come to the wrong spot to seek them. If, however, the soil can support the population under an arrangement by which certain industries support themselves and those which do not pay besides, then it is plain that the former are really supporting the whole population, part directly and part indirectly, through a circuitous and wasteful organization. Hence, the same strong and independent industries could certainly still better support the whole population if they supported it directly. I have been asked whether we should have had any steelworks in this country if we had had no protection. I reply that I do not know, neither does anybody else, but it is certain that we should have had a great deal more steel if we had had no protection. But, it is said, we should import everything. Should we import everything and give nothing? If so, foreigners would make us presents and support us. Should we give equal value in exchange? If so, there would be just as much industry and a great deal less work in that way of getting things than in making them ourselves. The moment that ceased to be true, we should make and not buy. Suppose that a district A has two million inhabitants, one million of whom produce a million bushels of wheat, and one million produce a million hundredweight of iron. And suppose that a bushel of wheat exchanges for a hundredweight of iron. Now, by improved transportation and emigration, suppose that a new wheat country, B, is opened, and that its people bring wheat to the first district, offering two bushels for a hundredweight of iron. Plainly, they must offer more than one bushel for one hundredweight, or it is useless for them to come. Now the people of A, by putting all their labor and capital in iron production, produce two million hundredweight. They keep one million hundredweight and exchange one million hundredweight of iron for two million bushels of wheat. The destruction of their wheat industry is a sign of change in industry, unifying and not diversifying, by which they have gained a million bushels of wheat, such is the gain of all trade. If the gain did not exist, trade would not be a feature of civilization. End of section 7. Section 8 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. Protectionism, the ism which teaches that waste makes wealth, 1885. Chapter 4, Part 2. 
J. That it would be wise to call into existence various industries, even at an expense, if we could thus offer employment to all kinds of artisans, etc., who might come to us. This would be only maintaining public workshops at the expense of the taxpayers, and would be open to all the objections which are conclusive against public workshops. The expense would be prodigious, and the return little or nothing. This argument shows less sense of comparative cost and gain than any other which is ever proposed. K. That we want to be complete in ourselves and sufficient to ourselves, and independent as a nation, which state of things will be produced by protection. I will only refer to what I have already said about China and Japan as types of what this plan produces. If a number of families from among us should be shipwrecked on an island, their greatest woe would be that they could not trade with the rest of the world. They might live there self-contained and independent, fulfilling the ideal of happiness which this proposition offers, but they would look about them to see a surfeit of things, which, as they know, their friends at home would like to have, and they would think of all the old comforts which they used to have, and which they could not produce on their island. They might be contented to live on there and make it their home, if they could exchange the former things for the latter. If now a ship should chance that way and discover them, and should open communication and trade between them and their old home, a protectionist philosopher would say to them, you are making a great mistake. You ought to make everything for yourselves. The wise thing to do would be to isolate yourselves again by taxes as soon as possible. We sent some sages to the Japanese to induct them into the ways of civilization, who, as a matter of fact, did tell them that the first step in civilization was to adopt a protective tariff and shut up again by taxes the very ports which they had just opened. L. That protective taxes are necessary to prevent a foreign monopoly from getting control of our market. It is said that English manufacturers once combined to lower prices in order to kill out American manufacturers, and that they then put up their prices to monopoly rates. If they did this, why did not their other customers send to the United States and buy the goods here in the first instance? And why did not the Americans go and buy the goods of the Englishman's other customers in the second instance? If the Englishmen put down their prices for their whole market in the first instance, why did they not incur a great loss? And, if they raised it for their whole market in the second instance, why did they not yield the entire market to their competitors? The Englishmen are said to be wonderfully shrewd, and here are credited with the most stupid and incredible folly. The protective system puts us certainly in the hands of a home monopoly for fear of the impossible chance that we may fall into the hands of a foreign monopoly. Before the war, we made no first-quality thread. We got it at four cents a spool, retail, of an English monopoly. Under the tariff, we were saved from this by being put into the hands of a home monopoly which charged five cents a spool. In the meantime, the foreign monopoly lowered thread to three cents a spool, retail, for the Canadians, who were at its mercy. Lest we should have to buy nickel of a foreign monopolist, Congress forced us to buy it of the owner of the only mine in the United States, and added 30 cents a pound to any price the foreigner might ask. M. That free trade is good in theory, but impossible in practice. That it would be a good thing if all nations would have it. That a thing can be true in theory and false in practice is the most utter absurdity that human language can express. For if a thing is true in practice, protectionism, for instance, the theory of its truth can be found, and that theory will be true. But it was admitted that free trade is true in theory. Hence, two things which are contradictory would both be true at the same time about the same thing. The fact is that protectionism is totally impracticable. It does not work as it is expected to work. It does not produce any of the results which were promised from it. It is never properly and finally established to the satisfaction of its own votaries. They cannot let it alone. They always want to correct inequalities, or revise it one way or another. It was they who got up the Tariff Commission of 1882. Their system is not capable of construction so as to furnish a normal and regular status for industry. One of them said that the tariff would be all right if it could only be made stable. Another said that it ought to be revised every two years. One said that it ought to include everything. Another said that it would be good if it was only laid on the right things. If all nations had free trade, no one of them would have any special gain from it, just as if all men were honest, honesty would have no commercial value. Some say that a man cannot afford to be honest unless everybody is honest. The truth is that if there was one honest man among a lot of cheats, his character and reputation would reach their maximum value. So the nation which has free trade when the others do not have it gains the most by comparison with them. It gains while they impoverish themselves. If all had free trade, all would be better off, but then no one would profit from it more than others. If this were not true, if the man who first sees the truth and first acts wisely did not get a special premium for it, the whole moral order of the universe would have to be altered, for no reform or improvement could be tried until unanimous consent was obtained. If a man or nation does right, the rewards of doing right are obtained. They are not as great as could be obtained if all did right, but they are greater than those enjoy who still do wrong. N. That trade is war, so that free trade methods are unfit for it and that protective taxes are suited for it. It is evidently meant by this that trade involves a struggle or contest of competition. 
It might, however, as well be said that practicing law is war because it is contentious, or that practicing medicine is war because doctors are jealous rivals of each other. The protectionists do, however, always seem to think of trade as commercial war. One of them was reported to have said in a speech in the late campaign that nations would not fight any more with guns but with taxes. The nations are to boycott each other. One would think that the experience our Southerners made of that notion in the Civil War, upon which they entered in the faith that cotton is king, would have sufficed to banish forever that antique piece of imbecility, a commercial war. If trade is war, all the tariff can do about it is to make A fight B's battles, although A has his own battles to fight besides. O. Oh, that protection brings into employment labor and capital which would otherwise be idle. If there is any labor or capital which is idle, that fact is a symptom of industrial disease, especially as is true in the United States. If a laborer is idle, he is in danger of starving to death. If capital is idle, it is producing nothing to its owner, who depends on it and is suffering loss. Therefore, if labor or capital is idle, some antecedent error or folly must have produced a stoppage in the industrial organization. The cure is not to lay some more taxes, but to find the error and correct it. If then things are in their normal and healthy condition, the labor and capital of the country are employed as far as possible under the existing organization. We are constantly trying to improve our exchange and credit systems so as to keep all our capital all the time employed. Such improvements are important and valuable, but to make them cost more thought and skillful labor than to invent machines. Hence Congress cannot do that work by discharging a volley of taxes at selected articles and leaving those taxes to find out the proper points to affect and to exert the proper influence. It takes intelligent and hardworking men to do it. The faith that anything else can do it is superstition. P. That a young nation needs protection and will suffer some disadvantage in free exchange with an old one. The younger a nation is, the more important trade is to it. The younger a nation is, the more it wins by trade, for it offers food and raw materials which are objects of greatest necessity to old nations. The things England buys of us are far more essential to her than what she buys of France or Germany. The strong party in an exchange is not the rich party or the old party, but the one who is favored by supply and demand the one who brings to the exchange the thing which is more rare and more eagerly wanted. If a poor woman went into Stuart's store to buy a yard of calico, she did not have to pay more because Stuart was rich. She paid less because he used his capital to serve her better and at less price than anybody else could. England takes 60% of all our exports. We sell first wheat and provisions, prime articles of food, second cotton, the most important raw material now used by mankind, third tobacco, the most universal luxury and the one for which there is the intensest demand. Fourth, petroleum, the lighting material in most universal use. These are things which are rare and of high demand. We are, therefore, strong in the market. Protection only robs us of part of our advantage. Q. That we need protection to get ready for war. We have no army or navy or fortifications worth mentioning. We are wasting more by protective taxes in a year than would be necessary to build a first-class navy and fortify our whole sea coast. It is said that in some way the taxes get us ready for war, and yet in fact we are not ready for war. It is plain that this argument is only a pretense put forward to try to cover the real motives of protection. If we prefer to go without army, navy, and fortifications, as we now do, then the best way to get ready for war, consistently with that policy, is to get as rich as we can. Then we can count on buying anything in the world which anybody else has got and which we need. Protection, then, which lessens our wealth, is only diminishing our power for war. R. That protectionism produces some great moral advantages. It is a very suspicious thing when a man who sets out to discuss an economic question shifts over on the moral ground, not because economics and morals have nothing to do with each other. On the contrary, they meet at a common boundary line, and, when both are sound, straight and consistent lines run from one into the other. Capital is the first requisite of all human effort for goods of any kind, and the increase of capital is therefore the expansion of chances that intellectual, moral, and spiritual good may be won. The moral question is, how will the chances be used? If, then, the economic analysis shows that protective taxes lessen capital, it follows that those taxes lessen the regular chances for all higher good. It is argued that hardship disciplines a man and is good for him, hence that the free traders, who want people to do what is easiest, would corrupt them, and that protectionists, by making work, bring in salutary discipline for the people. This is the effect upon those who pay the taxes. The counter-operation on the beneficiaries of the system I have never seen developed. Bastiat said that the model at which the protectionist was aiming was Sisyphus, who was condemned in Hades to roll a stone to the top of a hill, from which, as soon as he got it there, it rolled down again to the bottom. Then he rolled it up again, and so on to all eternity. Here, then, was infinity of effort, zero of result, the ultimate type to which the protectionist system would come. Somebody pitied Sisyphus, to whom he replied, Thou fool, I enjoy everlasting hope. 
If Sisyphus could extract moral consolation from his case, I am not prepared to deny but that a New England farmer, ground between the upper millstone of free competition in his production, with the Mississippi Valley, and the nether millstone of protective taxes on all his consumption, may derive some moral consolation from his case. There are a great many people who are apparently ready to inflict salutary chastisement on the American citizen for his welfare, and their own advantage. The protectionist doctrine is that if my earnings are taken from me and given to my neighbor, and he spends them on himself, there will be important moral gains to the community, which will be lost if I keep my own earnings and spend them on myself. The facts of experience are all to the contrary. When a man keeps his own earnings, he is frugal, temperate, prudent, and honest. When he gets and lives on another man's earnings, he is extravagant, wasteful, luxurious, idle, and covetous. The effects on the community in either case correspond. The truth is that protectionism demoralizes and miseducates a people. It deprives them of individual self-reliance and energy, and teaches them to seek crafty and unjust advantages. It breaks down the skill of great merchants and captains of industry, and develops the skill of lobbyists. It gives faith in monopoly, combinations, jobbery, and restriction, instead of giving faith in energy, free enterprise, public purity, and freedom. Illustrations of this occur all the time. Objection has been made to the introduction of machines to stop the smoke nuisance because they would interfere in the competition of anthracite and bituminous coal. People have resisted the execution of ordinances against gambling houses because said houses make trade for their neighbors. The theater men recently made an attempt to get regulations adopted against skating rinks, purely on moral grounds. The industries of the country all run to the form of combinations. Our wisdom is developed, not in the great art of production, but in the tactics of managing a combination. And while we sustain all the causes and all the great principles of this system of business, we denounce monopoly in corporations. S. That a worker may gain more by having his industry protected than he will lose by having to pay dearly for what he consumes. A system which raises prices all round, like that in the United States at present, is oppressive to consumers, but is most disadvantageous to those who consume without producing anything, and does little, if any, injury to those who produce more than they consume. This is an English contribution to the subject dropped in passing by a writer on economic history. It is a noteworthy fact that the historical economists and others who deride political economy as a science do not desist from it, but at once set to work to make very bad political economy of the abstract or deductive sort. The passage quoted involves three or four fallacies already noticed, and an assumption of the truth of protectionism as a philosophy. As we have abundantly established, workers gain nothing by protection in their production. Also, a system which raises prices all around must either lessen the demand and requirement for money, i.e. restrict business and the supply of goods, or it must increase the amount of money. In the former case, it could not but injure workers. In the latter case, we should find ourselves dealing with a greenback fallacy. But passing by that, who are they who consume more than they produce? I can think of only, one, princes, pensioners, sinecurists, protected persons, and paupers who draw support from taxes, and two, swindlers, confidence men, and others who live by their wits on the produce of others. Those under one, if they receive fixed money grants or subsidies, find an advance in price most disadvantageous. So the protected, of course, as consumers of others' products, when they spend what they have received by protection, suffer. Who are they who produce more than they consume? I can think of only, one, taxpayers, and two, victims of fraud and of those economic errors which give one man's earnings to another's use. Rise in price is just as advantageous to this class as it is disadvantageous to the other, on the same hypothesis, viz. if they pay fixed money taxes to the parasites and can sell their products for more money. Evidently, the writer did not understand correctly what his two classes consisted of, and he put the protected workers in the wrong one. If in industry a person should produce more than he consumes, he could give it away, or it would decay on his hands. If he should consume more than he produced, he would run into debt and become bankrupt. Protection has nothing to do with that. T. That a duty may at once protect the native manufacturer adequately, and recoup the country for the expense of protecting him. This is Professor Sidgwick's doctrine. It has given great comfort to our protectionists because it is put forward by an Englishman and a Cambridge professor. It is offered under the art of political economy. It is a new thing, an a priori art. The may in it deprives it of the character of a doctrine or dogma, such as our less cultivated protectionists give us. Protective taxes come out of the foreigner, but it is not a maxim of art. It has the air of a very astute contrivance, and is therefore very captivating to many people, and it is very difficult to dissect and to expose in a simple and popular way. It has therefore given great trouble and done great mischief. It is, however, a complete error. It is not possible in any way or in any degree to use duties so as to make the foreigner pay for protection. Professor Sidgwick states the hypothetical instance, which he sets up to prove by illustration that there may be such a case, as follows. 
Suppose that a 5% duty is imposed on foreign silks, and that in consequence, after a certain interval, half the silks consumed are the product of native industry, and that the price of the whole has risen 2.5%. It is obvious that under these circumstances, the other half, which comes from abroad, yields the state 5%, while the tax levied from the consumers on the whole is only 2.5%, so that the nation, in the aggregate, is at this time losing nothing by protection except the cost of collecting the tax, while a loss equivalent to the whole tax falls on the foreign producer. It is necessary in the first place to complete the hypothesis which is included in this case. Let us assume that the consumption of silk, when all was imported, was 100 yards and that the price was $1 per yard. Then the following points are taken for granted, although not stated in the case as it is put. 1. That the state needs $5 revenue. 2. That it has determined to get this out of the consumers of silk. 3. That the advance in price does not diminish the consumption. 4. That the tax forces a reduction of price for the silk in the whole outside market. 5. That the silk in question is the same thing after the tax is laid as before. Of these assumptions, 3, 4, and 5 are totally inadmissible, but if they be admitted in the first instance, and if the doctrine of the case which is put to be deduced is this, if the part imported multiplied by the tax is equal to the total consumption multiplied by the advance in price, the consumers can pay the latter in protection, for it is equal to the former, and the former, which is paid to the government by the foreigner, is what the consumers of silk must otherwise have paid. Obviously, this deduction is arithmetically incorrect, even on this hypothesis. In the first place, the government has not obtained $5 revenue which it needed, but $2.50, 5 cents on 50 yards. In the second place, the foreigner sells, at $1.25, net 97.5 cents, the silk which he used to sell for $1. He therefore gets back from the consumers 2.5 cents per yard on 50 yards, or $1.25 out of the $2.50 which he has paid to the government. Also, the domestic silk to compete must be equal to the dollar imported silk, which now sells for a dollar and two and a half cents. Hence, the consumers really pay in protection only two and a half cents on 50 yards, i.e. one dollar and 25 cents. This case, then, is that the foreigner pays a dollar and 25 cents revenue, and the consumers pay a dollar and 25 cents revenue and a dollar and 25 cents protection. Hence, the result is not at all what is asserted, and there is no such operation of the contrivance as was expected. But the government needs two dollars and 50 cents more revenue, the operation of its tax having been interfered with by protection. As there is no equivalence or compensation in the case as it already stands, it is evident that the effect of any further tax, instead of bringing about equivalence or compensation, will be to depart from such a result still further. It is, however, impossible to admit assumptions 3, 4, and 5 above, or to deal with any economic problem by any arithmetical process. The result above reached is totally incorrect, and only serves to clear the ground for a correct analysis. The producer may have to bear part of a tax if he is under the tax jurisdiction, or if he has a monopoly. If he has no monopoly, and is not under the tax jurisdiction, and works for the world's market, he cannot lower his price in order to assume part of the tax. What he does is that he differentiates his commodity. This is the fact in the art of production which is established by abundant experience. It is the explanation of the constant complaint, under the protective system, of fraud, and of the constant demand for subclassification in the tariff schedules. The protected product never is, at least at first, as good in quality as the imported article which it claims to supersede. Hence the foreigner, if he desires to retain the protective market, can prepare a special quality for that market. The silk after the tax is laid is not the same silk as before. It nets to the foreign producer 97.5 cents, and pays him business profits at that price. Therefore, when he sells it at a dollar and two and a half cents, he gets back the whole tax from the consumers. The domestic silk sold at one dollar and two and a half cents is no better than might have been obtained for 97 and a half cents. Hence the consumers are paying a tax for protection which is full and equal to the revenue rate. The fact that the price has fallen to a dollar and two and a half cents, and is not a dollar and five cents, evidently proves that, instead of disproving it, as many believe. Thus this case falls to pieces. It gains a momentary plausibility from the erroneous assumptions which are implicit in it. The foreign producer may suffer a narrowing of his market and a reduction of his aggregate profits, but there is no way to make him tributary, unless he has a monopoly, either to the treasury or the protected interests of the taxing country. If it was true in general, or in any limited number of cases, that a country which lays protective taxes can make foreigners pay those taxes, then England, which has had no protective taxes since, say, 1850, has been surrounded by countries which have had more or less protective taxes, must have been paying tribute to them all this time, and must have been steadily impoverished accordingly. End of section 8. Section 9 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. Protectionism, the ism which teaches that waste makes wealth. 1885. Chapter 5. Summary and Conclusion. I have now examined protectionism impartially on its own grounds, assuming them to be true, and adversely from ground taken against it, and have reviewed a series of the commonest arguments put forward in its favor. If now we return, from all the light we have obtained, to test the assumptions which we found in protectionism, that the people would not organize their industry wisely under liberty, and that protective taxes are the correct device for bringing about a better organization, we find that those two assumptions are totally false, and have no semblance of claim upon our confidence. At every step, the dogmas of protectionism, its claims, its apparatus, have proved fallacious, absurd, and impracticable. We can now group together some general criticisms of protectionism which our investigation suggests. We have taken the protectionists' own definition of a protective duty, and have found that such a duty, instead of increasing national wealth, must at every step and by every incident of its operation, waste labor and capital, lower the efficiency of the national industry, weaken the country in trade, and consequently lower the standard of comfort of the whole population. We have found that protected industries, according to the statement of the protectionists, do not produce, but consume. If, then, these industries are the ones which make us rich, consumption is production and destruction produces. The object of a protective duty is to effect the diversion of a part of the capital and labor of the people out of the channels in which it would run otherwise, into the channels favored or created by law. We have seen that the channels into which the labor and capital of the people are to be diverted are offered by the industries which do not pay. Hence, protectionism is found to mean that national prosperity is to be produced by forcing labor and capital into employments where the capital cannot be reproduced with the same increase which could be won by it elsewhere. If that is so, then capital in those employments will be wasted, and the final outcome of our investigation, which must be made the primary maxim of the art of national prosperity under protectionism, is that waste makes wealth. Such is its outcome when regarded as an economic philosophy. In regards to the social and jural relations which are established between citizen and citizen, protectionism is proved by a half dozen independent analyses of it to be simply a device for forcing us to levy tribute on each other. If the law brings a cent to A, it must have taken it from B, or else it must have produced it out of nothing. That is, it must be magic. Every soul pays protective taxes. If, then, anybody gets anything from them, he needs to remember what they cost him, and he should insist on casting up both the sides of the account. If anybody gets nothing from them, then he pays the taxes and gets no equivalent. During the anti-corn law campaign in England, a writer in the Westminster Review illustrated protectionism by the story of the monkeys in a cage, each of whom received for his dinner a piece of bread. Each monkey dropped his own piece of bread and grabbed his neighbor's. The consequence was that soon the floor of the cage was strewn with fragments, and each monkey had to make the best dinner he could from these. It is a good and fair illustration. I saw a story recently in a protectionist newspaper about the peasants in the Sudan. Each owns pigeons, and at evening, when the pigeons come home, each tries to entice as many of his neighbor's pigeons as he can into his own pigeon house. All of them do the same thing, and therefore each gets caught in his turn. They know this perfectly well, but no Egyptian fellah could resist the temptation of cheating his neighbor. They ought to tax each other's pigeons all around. Then they would put themselves at once on the level of free and enlightened Americans. The protectionist assures me that it is for the good of the community and for my good that he should tax me. I reply that, in his language, these are fine theories, but that whether it is good for the community or not, and whether it is good for me or not, that he should tax me, I can see that it is for his good that he should tax me. Then, he says, now you are abusive. If protectionism is anything else than mutual tribute, then it is magic. The whole philosophy of it comes down to questions like this. How much can I afford to pay a man for hiring me? How much can I afford to pay a man for trading with me? How much can I afford to pay a man to cease to compete with me in my production? How much can I afford to pay a man to go and compete with those who supply me my consumption? It is only an expensive way to get out of what we could get for nothing if it was worth having. It is admitted that one man cannot lift himself by his bootstraps. Suppose that a thousand men stand in a ring and each takes hold of the other's bootstraps reciprocally, and they all lift. Can the whole group lift itself as a group? This is what protectionism comes to just as soon as we have drawn out into light the other side, the cost side of it. Whatever we win on one side, we must pay for by at least equal cost on another. The losses will all be distributed as net pure injury to the community. 
the harm of protection lies there. It is not measured by the tax. It is measured by the total crippling of the national industry. We might as well say that it would be a good thing to put snags in the rivers, to fell trees across the roads, to dull all our tools, as to say that unnecessary taxation could work a blessing. Men have argued that to destroy machines was to do a beneficial thing, and I have recently read an article in a Boston paper quoting a Massachusetts man who thinks that what we need is another war in the United States. Such men may believe that protective taxes work a blessing, but to those who will see the truth, it is plain that when the whole effect of the protective system is distributed, it benefits nobody. It is a dead weight and loss upon everybody, and those who think that they win by it would be far better off in a community where no such system existed, but where each man earned what he could and kept what he earned. There is a school of political science in this country in whose deed of foundation it is provided that the professors shall teach how, by suitable tariff legislation, a nation may keep its productive industry alive, cheapen the cost of commodities, and oblige foreigners to sell to it at low prices, while contributing largely toward defraying the expenses of the government. Is that not a fine thing? Those professors ought to likewise provide us a panacea, the philosopher's stone, a formula for squaring the circle, and all the other desiderata of universal happiness. It would be only a trifle for them. The only fear is that they may write the secret which they are to teach in books, and that other nations to whom we are foreigners may learn it. Then, while Englishmen, Frenchmen, and Germans work for us at low prices and pay our taxes, we shall be forced to work for them at low prices and pay their taxes, and the old somber misery will settle down upon the world again the same as ever. Some years ago, we were told that protection was necessary because we had a big debt to pay. Well, we have paid the debt until we have reduced it from 78.25 per head to 28.41 per head. We, the people, have also raised our credit until the annual debt charge has been reduced from 4.29 per head to 95 cents per head. Now it is necessary to keep the debt in order to keep up the taxes, and protectionism is now most efficient in forcing wasteful and corrupting expenditures to get rid of revenue, lest a surplus should furnish an argument for reducing taxation. This is right on the doctrine that waste makes wealth. They tell us that protection has produced prosperity, and when we ask them to account for hard times in spite of the tariff, they say that hard times are caused by the free traders who will not keep still. Therefore, the prosperity produced by protection is so precarious that it can be overthrown by only talking about free trade. They denounce laissez-faire, or let alone, but the only question is when to let alone, when to keep still. They do not let the tariff alone if they want to revise it to suit them, or want to make it equitable. When they get it equitable, they will let it alone, but that ensures agitation and makes sure that they will cause it for an indefinite time to come. On the other hand, the victims of the tariff will not keep still. Their time to let alone is when it is repealed. If the tariff did not hurt somebody somewhere, it would not do any good to anybody anywhere, and the victims will resist. Mr. Lincoln used to tell a story about hearing a noise in the next room. He looked in and found Bob and Tad scuffling. What is the matter, boys? said he. It is Tad, replied Bob, who is trying to get my knife. Oh, let him have it, Bob, said Mr. Lincoln, just to keep him quiet. No, said Bob, it is my knife and I need it to keep me quiet. Mr. Lincoln used the story to prove that there is no foundation for peace save truth and justice. Now in this case, the man whose earnings are being taken from him needs them to keep him quiet. Our fathers fought for free soil, and if we are worthy to be their sons, we shall fight for free trade, which is the necessary complement of free soil. If a man goes to Kansas today and raises corn on free soil, how does he get the good of it unless he can exchange that corn for any product of the earth that he chooses on the best terms that the arts and commerce of today can give him? The history of civil liberty is made up of campaigns against abuses of taxation. Protectionism is the great modern abuse of taxation, the abuse of taxation which is adapted to a republican form of government. Protectionism is now corrupting our political institutions just as slavery used to do, viz. it allies itself with every other abuse which comes up. Most recently, it has allied itself with the silver coinage, and it is now responsible in a great measure for that calamity. The silver coinage law would have been repealed three years ago if the silver mining interest had not served notice on the protectionists that that was their share of protection and the price of their cooperation. The silver coinage is the chief cause of the hard times of the last two or three years. In a well-ordered state, it is the function of government to repress every selfish interest which arises and endeavors to encroach upon the rights of others. The state thus maintains justice. Under protectionism, the government gives a license to certain interests to go out and encroach on others. It is an iniquity as to the victims of it, a delusion as to its supposed beneficiaries, and a waste of the public wealth. There is only one reasonable question now to be raised about it, and that is, how can we most easily get rid of it? End of section 9.
Section 10 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. Tariff Reform. A year and a half ago, a gentleman who had just been re-elected by Republicans to the Senate of the United States made a five-minute speech acknowledging the honor. In respect to public affairs, he uttered but one opinion, that the people of the United States were confronted with a most serious problem, that is, how to reduce taxation. On the face of it, this was a most extraordinary statement and the chronicler or historian might well take note of it as a new event in the life of the human race statesmen and historians are familiar enough with the difficulty of raising more revenue and laying more taxes but the solemn and calamitous position of a nation which is forced to reduce its taxes and finds itself confronted by industrial disaster if it does it is something new students of political economy are familiar with the question what harm to industry may be done by levying taxes on it but the problem of how to avert the economic disaster which may follow taking them off is new of course a state of mind revealed by the formulation of the above problem is the result of a long habit of regarding taxation as an industrial force or at least as an effective condition of industrial success there is however a problem in regard to that fact all concur it is also a rare problem one for which the only precedent is to be found in our own history and when the case occurred before it proved to be fraught with calamity we are confronted by the dangers of a surplus revenue and no proposal to do away with the surplus and extravagant expenditures can stand before the common sense of the people. If the taxes are collecting more than the public necessities require, then the simple and obvious, and in fact the only solution, is not to collect the taxes. Let people keep their own products and do what they please with them. If we do not make a problem there will not be any. If we simply do in the most straightforward manner what the common sense of the situation demands, there will be no difficulty. The consequences will all take care of themselves, and all the imaginary calamities will fail to appear. If, however, we must have a grand scheme of national prosperity established in advance, then the case is different. During the war, a notion grew up here that, through some new dispensation of fate, it was possible for the American people to make war and prosper by it. After the war, the notion grew up that the paper money was a condition of success, and that we should be ruined if we resumed specie payments. Now we are met by the doctrine that we cannot repeal the taxes which were laid during the war partly in order to carry it on, because our national prosperity is bound up in them. These notions, in fact, are all consistent and all hang together. They all belong to a philosophy that men prosper by discord and war, not by peace and harmony. According to that philosophy, we touched unawares the springs of prosperity when we engaged in a civil war, incurred an immense debt, and laid crushing taxes. Now, therefore, when we ask that the taxes which are no longer necessary may be taken off, the men who have fallen under the dominion of these fallacies tell us that it cannot be done, that our prosperity would be undermined by it. They have been assuring us for years past that the protective system was sure to produce a solid and stable prosperity. 
Now, by their own statement, it has produced a state of things so weak and unstable that it must be maintained by heavy taxes. The industrial prosperity of the United States proves to be as burdensome to it as the armaments of the European nations are to them. The notion seems to be that protective taxes laid on imports are the particular kind of taxes which make national prosperity. It is proposed that internal taxes shall be reduced. If local taxes on real estate, etc., are reduced, everyone rejoices. That is supposed to be a clear and simple gain. I have known the same man to exert himself very actively to scrutinize local expenditures and reduce local taxes, and to boil with rage against free traders who want to reduce protective taxes. However, there is probably no tax of any kind whatsoever which does not interfere with the conditions of supply and demand or industrial competition in such a way as to give protection to somebody at the expense of somebody else. There are persons who are now enjoying great advantages in their business from the whiskey and tobacco taxes which they would lose if those taxes were repealed. This is one of the incidental mischiefs of all taxation, and one of the reasons for insisting that taxation shall be as slight as possible, and, to that end, that government functions shall be limited as much as possible. We are therefore face to face with the question whether we are able to reduce our own taxes and whether we are free to do so. We may fairly ask, if not, why not? It is plain that this is a question of domestic policy and of our own interest altogether. All the attempts to prejudice it by talking about England are impertinent and all allegations that those of us who want to reduce our own taxes are trying to give away our market, etc., belong to the worst abuses of political discussion. What is true is that we have built up a vast combination of vested interests, which in a few cases have, and in nearly all cases think they have, an interest in maintaining the taxes. These are among ourselves. What they gain they gain from us. It is with them that we have to contend. They have thus far carried on the fight by all methods dear to vested interests. They have put forth plausible fallacies, sought alliances, procured delays, appealed to prejudices. Behind these selfish and sordid interests, however, there is the strong and sincere prejudice which still prevails among the civilized nations of today, and which is dividing them into hostile parties, carrying on tariff wars with each other. I call it protectionism. Because it is not a policy, but a philosophy of national welfare. In the United States, it takes the form of various fallacies about the home markets, diversification of industry, wages, etc., as these are all questions of political economy, and as all who talk on the subject at all are talking political economy in some sort or other, it seems that a great work of education is to be done here on the field of economic doctrine. Hitherto the attempt of the politicians has been not to perform this work of education, but to thrust it aside. As soon as the issue is formed, however, and the protectionists are forced to formulate their doctrine as a doctrine, its absurdity becomes apparent. It is not capable of statement. If we are to have temporary protection in order to start infant industries, then it will become imperatively necessary, so soon as public attention is occupied by the subject, to say how, and how far, and how long, the system is to be kept up, and the public will demand to know how it is getting on and at what rate it is approaching its goal. For this reason, those who have any logical directness of thinking have already advanced to a more intense position, 
they advocate protectionism as a permanent and universal economic philosophy. In that form, it flies in the face of common sense and civilization. In some of the latest forms which it has taken on in the hands of some professors of political economy, it is a kind of economic mysticism. If, however, the United States could be cut off from all the rest of the world as regards trade and industry, then at least it should be plain that whatever material prosperity they could gain would be just what they, with their energy, enterprise, and capital, are able to extract from such soil and climate as nature has given to us here. What would be the difference if, then, there were no tax barriers? Certainly none whatever. The wealth which the American people get, they must produce by applying their labor and capital to the natural advantages which they possess. With foreign trade open to them, they will not make use of it unless they find an advantage in it. That is, unless American labor and capital can attain more wealth through exchange than without it. The task of American producers will still be to attain the greatest possible wealth by expanding their labor and capital on American soil, either directly or with an intermediate step of exchange. Wages are only a part of the product of the country. If, then, trade increased the amount of commodities at the disposition of the people, it would increase the amount of each share in the distribution. This is the simplest common sense of the matter, stripped of all technicalities, and to this the whole discussion must again and again return. If now we begin to reduce and abolish the taxes which were laid during the war, we shall simply begin to free the American people from a clog on their energies and a waste of their industrial strength. Every step in this direction is an emancipation under which we may be sure that the national energy which is set free will spring up with the quickest response. The guarantee of this is in the character of the people and in the natural advantages which they possess. Whatever chances we have, we have in the nature of the case. The tariff could not give us any. It could only divert in one way or another those which nature has given us. This diversion or perversion has now entered into the experience and education of our generation. We have no idea of the welfare we should enjoy if we were only free to use the chances which are within our reach, and a great many of us have spun out a kind of political economy to prove that the cords which bind us are the tools by which we work. End of section 10 Section 11 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner What is Free Trade? There never would have been any such thing to fight for as free speech, free press, free worship, or free soil if nobody had ever put restraints on men in those matters. We never should have heard of free trade if no restrictions had ever been put on trade. If there had been any restrictions on the intercourse between the states of this union, we should have heard of ceaseless agitation to get those restrictions removed. Since there are no restrictions allowed under the Constitution, we do not realize the fact that we are enjoying the blessings of complete liberty, where, if wise counsels had not prevailed at a critical moment, we should now have had a great mass of traditional and deep-rooted interferences to encounter. 
our intercourse with foreign nations, however, has been interfered with, because it is a fact that by such interference some of us can win advantages over others. The power of Congress to levy taxes is employed to lay duties on imports, not in order to secure a revenue from imports, but to prevent imports, in which case, of course, no revenue will be obtained. The effect which is aimed at and which is attained by this device is that the American consumer, when he wants to satisfy his needs, has to go to an American producer of the thing he wants and has to give him a price for the product which is greater than that which some foreigner would have charged. The object of this device, as stated on the best protectionist authority, is to effect the diversion of a part of the labor and capital of the people out of the channels in which it would run otherwise into channels favored or created by law. This description is strictly correct, and from it the reader will see that protection has nothing to do with any foreigner whatever. It is purely a question of domestic policy. It is only a question whether we shall, by taxing each other, drive the industry of this country into an arbitrary and artificial development or whether we shall allow one another to employ each his capital and labor in his own way. Note that there is for us all the same labor, capital, soil, national character, climate, etc. That is, that all the conditions of production remain unaltered. The only change which is operated is a wrenching of labor and capital out of the lines on which they would act under the impulse of individual enterprise, energy, and interest, and their impulsion in another direction selected by the legislator. Plainly, all the import duty can do is to close the door, shutting the foreigner out and the Americans in. Then, when an American needs iron, coal, copper, woolens, cottons, or anything else in the shape of manufactured commodities, the operation begins. He has to buy in a market which is either wholly or partially monopolized. The whole object of shutting him in is to take advantage of this situation to make him give more of his products for a given amount of the protected articles than he need have given for the same things in the world's market. Under this system, a part of our product is diverted from the satisfaction of our needs and is spent to hire some of our fellow citizens to go out of an employment which would pay under the world's competition into one which will not pay under the world's competition. We, therefore, do with less clothes, furniture, tools, crockery, glassware, bed and table linen, books, etc., and the satisfaction we have for this sacrifice is knowing that some of our neighbors are carrying on business which, according to their statement, does not pay and that we are paying their losses and hiring them to keep on. Free trade is a revolt against this device. It is not a revolt against import duties or indirect taxes as a means of raising revenue. It has nothing to say about that one way or the other. It begins to protest and agitate just as soon as any tax begins to act protectively, and it denounces any tax which one citizen levies on another. The protectionists have a long string of notions and doctrines which they put forward to try to prove that their device is not a contrivance by which they can make their fellow citizens contribute to their support 
but is a device for increasing the national wealth and power. These allegations must be examined by economists or other persons who are properly trained to test their correctness in fact and logic. It is enough here to say, over a responsible signature, that no such allegation has ever been made which would bear examination. On the contrary, all such assertions have the character of apologies or special pleas to divert attention from the one plain fact that the advocates of a protective tariff have a direct pecuniary interest in it, and that they have secured it and now maintain it for that reason and no other. The rest is all an afterthought and excuse. If any gain could possibly come to the country through the gains of the beneficiaries of the tariff, obviously the country must incur at least an equal loss through the losses of that part of the people who pay what the protected win. If a country could win anything that way, it would be like a man lifting himself by his bootstraps. The protectionists in advocating their system always spend a great deal of effort and eloquence on appeals to patriotism and to international jealousies. These are all entirely aside from the point. The protective system is a domestic system for domestic purposes, and it is sought by domestic means. The one who pays and the one who gets are both Americans. The victim and the beneficiary are amongst ourselves. It is just as unpatriotic to oppress one American as it is patriotic to favor another. If we make one American pay taxes to another American, it will neither vex nor please any foreign nation. The protectionists speak of trade with the contempt of feudal nobles, but on examination it appears that they have something to sell and that they mean to denounce trade with their rivals. They denounce cheapness and it appears that they do so because they want to sell dear. When they buy, they buy as cheaply as they can. They say that they want to raise wages, but they never pay anything but the lowest market rate. They denounce selfishness while pursuing a scheme for their own selfish aggrandizement, and they bewail the dominion of self-interest over men who want to enjoy their own earnings and object to surrendering the same to them. They attribute to government or to the state the power and right to decide what industrial enterprises each of us shall subscribe to support. Free trade means antagonism to this whole policy and theory at every Point. The free trader re regards it as all false, meretricious, and delusive. He considers it an invasion of private rights. In the best case, if all that the protectionist claims were true, he would be taking it upon himself to decide how his neighbors should spend his earnings. And more than that, that his neighbor shall spend his earnings for the advantage of the men who make the decision. This is plainly immoral and corrupting. Nothing could be more so. The free trader also denies that the government either can or ought to regulate the way in which a man shall employ his earnings. He sees that the government is nothing but a clique of the party's interest. It is a few men who have control of the civic organization. If they were called upon to regulate business, they would need a wisdom which they have not. They do not do this. They only turn the channels to the advantage of themselves and their friends. This corrupts 
the institutions of government and continues under our system all the old abuses by which the men who could get control of the governmental machinery have used it to aggrandize themselves at the expense of others the free trader holds that the people will employ their labor and capital to the best advantage when each man employs his own in his own way according to the maxim that a fool is wiser in his own house than a sage in another man's house how much more then shall he be wiser than a politician and he holds further that by the nature of the case if any governmental coercion is necessary to drive industry in a direction in which it would not otherwise go such coercion must be mischievous the free trader further holds that protection is all a mistake and delusion to those who think that they win by it in that it lessens their self-reliance and energy and exposes their business to vicissitudes which not being incident to a natural order of things cannot be foreseen and guarded against by business skill also that it throws the business into a condition in which it is exposed to a series of heats and chills and finally unless a new stimulus is applied reduced to a state of dull decay they therefore hold that even the protected would be far better off without it end of section eleven Section 12 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. Protectionism 20 Years After, 1906. Protectionism, 20 Years After I think it must now be nearly 20 years since I have made a free trade speech or been able to take share in a free trade dinner. When I was invited here this evening, I thought I would try to come for the pleasure of hearing the gentlemen, especially the members of Congress, who were announced to speak here. I have been so out of health that it has been impossible for me to sit up evenings or to attempt public speaking in the evenings, but things are going a little better, and I will make an attempt to say a little, not very much, as the hour is now late. Thirty-five or forty years ago, I became a free trader for two great reasons, as far as I can now remember. One was because, as a student of political economy, my whole mind revolted against the notion of magic that is involved in the notion of a protective tariff. That is, there are facts that are accounted for by protectionism through assertions that are either plainly untrue or are entirely irrational. The other reason was because it seemed to me that the protective tariff system nourished erroneous ideas of success in business and produced the moral results in the minds and hopes of the people. I cannot say that I got any more light on the matter within the last 20 years. It looks to me as if the great objections to protectionism were these two. No man who enjoys the benefit of a protective tariff as he believes, can ever tell whether he gets back anything for the taxes which he pays or not. He never has any analysis of the operation and never knows whether or not he really recovers from the action of the tariff what he pays in. I say now the taxes which he pays because, let us not make any mistake about this, the matter we are talking about is one entirely of Americans and between Americans. 
if the protective tariff operates so as to perform what is attributed to it, it prevents things from being imported into this country. That may be a disadvantage to the foreigner. It may disappoint him in his hopes, but we may leave him out of account. Then, the increase of the cost of these commodities for the American consumer at home is the source from which the American protected manufacturer must obtain his benefit, if he ever obtains any. Therefore, he has to pay also taxes to the other protected industries on account of the operation of the system. Therefore, he is both paying and receiving. But whether or not he gets back the part that he hoped to receive is a question which he can never shift and never can know. I myself suppose that possibly the Pennsylvania on his coal and iron might stand a good chance of winning something. The operation is direct and simple in that case, and coal and iron are today the very first conditions of industry. They must be obtained as raw material because they enter into everything, and it is possible that under those conditions the game might be sufficiently direct so that its effect could be felt and perceived. But the Connecticut manufacturer has to pay taxes on coal and iron and copper and the other metals, and he has to pay also the taxes on wool and the other raw materials, and then comes the question of whether he ever gets it back again or not. He never knows. He cannot know. He cannot feel it, and he cannot possibly know whether the operation of the system is to bring him back a return for his outlay or not. We hear a great deal about a rightly adjusted tariff. It is a constant ideal that is presented whenever the tariff subject comes up again for discussion in Congress that it ought to be rightly adjusted, and when it is, it is going to perform its beneficial operation. How can a tariff ever be rightly adjusted unless the industry will stand still? The taxes stand still for years without change. The industries never stand still. There are new inventions in machinery. There are new raw materials brought into use. There are new processes developed. And all that changes the character of the industry. These inventions and improvements and processes are all ignored by the protective system. It contains no allowance for them at all. But our people are full of enterprise. They are fond of improvements. They like novelties, and they adopt changes. The consequence is that the industry changes, and then again the decisions that are made by somebody or other as to the doubtful questions in the interpretation of the law are also constantly changing. And then by and by we find a lot of people who want the tariff changed. They say it needs to be adapted to the time. It is out of date. It has fallen behind. It does not fit the requirements of the moment. And they would like to have a tariff revision. But they are told then that they ought to keep still and not make a disturbance which will bring up a discussion of the entire tariff system and that they ought to allow it to go on for the sake of the system. What is the system then? The system means that the import duties that we have in this country have raised the prices of all commodities in our market. I may say 30 or 40 percent on a very low calculation. Is not that a very extraordinary thing when you stand off and try to realize it for a minute? That we have raised the prices in the United States 30 or 40 percent, perhaps more nearly 50 percent above the level of the prices for the same commodities in the other civilized countries of our grade, and that we believe that we have done a grand and noble thing by raising these prices, putting the whole level of life in this country on an artificial plane that much above the level of the world's market? In fact... If you should listen to a protectionist, he would make you believe that this continent would not be habitable if it was not for the protective tariff that is here working this operation all the time on the American market. I am of the opinion, I am not very confident about it, but it looks to me as if 
it were true that a protective tariff wears out in a little while. I mean, so far as its expected beneficial effect is concerned, its effects are distributed, they are taken up, and they are allowed for all around the market until the expected benefit to the protected people is lost, and there remains nothing but the dead weight of the system itself in an interference with the industries. There is then a call for a new tariff in order to get another impulse or another Philip, as I have heard it called, to give things a new impulse, to start them on again. That has been the history of our tariff now for 100 years, that it has been restarted, reinvigorated from time to time in order to give a new impulse. Then, in the very nature of the case, Therefore, it seems to me that a new impulse is constantly required. As I said at the outset, the tariff system seems to me to teach us to believe that a man needs a pull of some kind or other to make any industry a success. It is an idea that there must always be a provision of easy profit in connection with the industry that shall demand no labor or no expenditure of capital to get it. That is the pure doctrine of graft. The tariff teaches us to look for a fee or a gratuity or a rake-off, which will be a pure and net profit. People are told that tariff taxes are a rightful gift to the beneficiary. Those who do not get that gain seek another one of the same kind somewhere, and when they do that, they have recourse to graft. It is a shameful fact that this notion of graft and this word should have come to us as it has been within the last four or five years and should have extended so far and become so familiar to us in connection with a great many of the operations of business. It is customary, as we have known for a long time, in some nations, for instance in Russia, China, and Turkey, and with us it has seemed to spread and win acceptance and currency in a most astonishing manner. I cannot believe but what the tariff system has educated us in this direction and prepared us to tolerate and accept the development of this idea. It also seems to me that now, after 100 years of this system, the tariff is no longer properly an economic question. It is a practical political question. The politics and the business are interwoven in it extricably. There is no economic discussion possible of the propositions that are made, economic in form, in connection with the tariff system. There is only a war of partial views and of superficial inferences. Our American protectionism has grown out of the peculiar circumstances of this country. It is an old idea that has come down to us from Europe and indeed from the Middle Ages in Europe, and here it found a chance for a new and very remarkable development. There were new conditions here, and the chances were so big and grand that, as a matter of fact, the protective system has never done more than extract a certain tribute from us on these chances. It has never really touched us in an acute and sensible way, and in spite of it, we have enjoyed marvelous prosperity, which is due, really, to the circumstances of advantage and favor which we have enjoyed here. In the year 1892, we got an issue on this matter and went to the electorate with it, with the result that we all know. But the mandate of the people was neglected and disobeyed by the government, and the purpose that the people showed at that time was defiled. We have also had the opportunity to notice the great power of the protected interests in Congress. The fact is that we are being governed at the present time by a combination of these protected interests which have got control of the machinery of government and have control of the personnel of the government to such an extent that it is almost impossible, practically, to make any breach in this system at all. That is because the political combinations have been so thoroughly wrought out and so ingeniously developed that they look at present as if they were impregnable. I look around to see if I can find some encouragement. 
I thought that it was something of an encouragement when Mr. Dalzell made this speech in Congress that Mr. Williams has referred to, in which he poured such scorn on the idea of incidental protection. I have never said anything so severe about any protectionist idea as that which he said about incidental protection. But suppose the people of 1850, the middle of the 19th century, could come to life again, the old protectionists of that time. What would they think to hear a man speak with scorn of incidental protection? It was what they believed in. It was the whole business to them. When an old protectionist like Mr. Dalzell can turn around and pour scorn upon incidental protection, I feel as if we never could tell what they might throw overboard next time in some paroxysm of some kind or other, of fear or hope or something else, and we might get a chance that we have not been able to get in the past. Then, as has been well said by the other gentlemen tonight, there has been within the last year or two a very great revolt in the public mind against gaft and political and business corruption. How far will this go? We do not know. But it is, at any rate, an opening in the public mind that is full of chances. It may go very far. It may have very great effects. It is certainly something to be noticed and taken advantage of. Then, again, there are new conflicts of interest arising. We have become very great people in the world's commerce, with a billion dollars worth of exports and imports in a year. And we are so interwoven with the whole world that it would not be possible for us to go on with our old policy of discouraging commerce and rejecting it and trying to stop it and paying no attention at all to the remonstrances of our neighbors. In future, we shall be obliged to pay some attention to these remonstrances. They are just, they are reasonable, and they will command our attention and then we shall have to make concessions to them. In other words, we cannot any longer afford to reject and neglect these remonstrances. It may be, therefore, that in the time that is now before us, we shall have better chances for a practical war upon this system than we have had hitherto. As long, however, as I can remember, and as long as I have had any share in it, we have got along without any encouragement in it at all. We have done what we could without that. We got so we did not expect it. We knew that we should be neglected and treated as persons whose opinions in these matters were not of any importance or worthy of any attention. And so we went on and kept up our arguments as we considered them to the best of our ability and without very much result. Now it may be that we are on the eve of a very different time, when the circumstances will be more favorable, more hopeful, more full of opportunities, and I certainly, for my part, most profoundly hope that that is so. I have noticed with some discouragement the efforts that Mr. Williams has made on the floor of Congress to get some modifications of the tariff made, or some argument even open up there that might give the matter activity and life in the legislative domain. They did not seem any more encouraging than what we used to see in the old times. But it is certainly in the nature of things that the difficulties and absurdities of this system must come out in practice more and more distinctly as we go on, and the need for reform will therefore force itself in the shape of a play of interest that will bring new and counteracting forces into operation to which we may look for help in the overthrow of the system. End of Section 12 Alan R. Tate, Bedford, Mass., October 28, 2021《Section 13 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner Prosperity Strangled by Gold Some of the silver fallacies were stated by Mr. St. John in his address before the Silver Convention with such precision that his speech offers a favorable opportunity for dealing with them. He says that it is amongst the first principles in finance that the value of each dollar expressed in prices depends upon the total number of dollars in circulation. There is no such principle of finance as the one here formulated. The quantity doctrine of currency is gravely abused by all bimetallists, from the least to the greatest, and it is at best open to great doubt. When the dollars in question are dollars of some money of account which can circulate beyond the territory of the state in which it is issued, the quantity doctrine cannot be true within that territory. It may be noted, in passing, that this is the reason why no scheme of the silver people for manipulating prices in the United States can possibly succeed. Silver and gold will be exported and imported until their values conform throughout the world, and prices fixed in one or the other of them will conform to the world's prices after all the trouble and waste and loss of translating them two or three times over have been endured. The quantity doctrine, however, means that the value of the currency is a question of supply and demand, and everybody knows that to double or have the supply does not have or double the value or have any other effect which is simple and direct. If it did have such effect, speculation would not be what it is. Mr. St. John goes on to argue that our population increases two millions every year, on account of which we need more dollars, that the production of gold does not furnish enough to meet this need, and that, therefore, prices fall. This argumentation is very simple and very glib. Prosperity and adversity are put into a syllogism of three lines. But if we can avert the fall in prices and adversity by coining silver, it must be by adding the silver to the gold which we now have. High and low prices are only relative terms. They mean higher and lower than at any other time or place, higher and lower than we have been used to. If misery depends on ten-cent corn, we are advised to cut the cents in two, and we shall get twenty-cent corn and prosperity. Corn will not be altered in value in gold or outside of the United States, and, as all other things will be marked up at the same time and in the same way, its value in other things will not be altered by this operation. When we get used to 20-cent corn, it will seem just as slow and just as hard for the debtor as 10-cent corn is now. Then we can divide by 10 and get $2 corn by adding free coinage of copper. When we get used to that, we shall be no better satisfied with it. We can then make paper dollars and coin them without limit. Million-dollar corn will then become as bitter a subject for complaint as ten-cent corn is now. The fact that people are discontented is no argument for anything. The fact that prices are low is made the subject of social complaint and of political agitation in the United States. Prices have undergone a wave since 1850. They arose until about 1872. They have fallen again. They are lower than they were at the top of the wave all the world over. This fact, the explanation of which would furnish a very complicated task for trained statisticians and economists, is made a topic of easy interpretation and solution in political conventions and popular harangues, 
and that it is proposed to adopt violent and pretentious measures upon the basis of the flippant notions which are current about it. But what difference does it make whether the plane of prices is high or low? If corn is 40 cents a bushel and calico at 20 cents a yard, a bushel buys two yards. If corn is at 10 cents a bushel and calico at 5 cents a yard, a bushel will buy two yards. So of everything else. If, then, there had been granted a general fall, and that is the alleged grievance, neither farmers nor any other one class has suffered by it. It is undoubtedly true that a period of advancing prices stimulates energy and enterprise. It does so even when, if all the facts were well known, it might be found that capital was really being consumed in successive periods of production. Falling prices discourage enterprise, although, if all facts were known to the bottom, it might be found that capital was being accumulated in successive periods of production. It is also true that a depreciation of the money of account while it is going on stimulates exports and restrains imports. But who can tell how we are going to make prices always go up unless by constant and unlimited inflation? Who can tell how we are to avoid fluctuations in prices or eliminate the element of contingency, risk, foresight, and speculation? It is also true that, although high prices and low prices are immaterial at any one time, the change from one to the other, from one period of time to another, affects the burden of outstanding time contracts. Men make contracts for dollars, not for dollars' worths. Selling long or short is one thing. Lending is another. Borrowers and lenders never guarantee each other the purchasing power of dollars at a future time. If the contracts were thus complicated, they would become impossible. Between 1850 and 1872, the debtors made no complaint and the creditors never thought of getting up an agitation to have debts scaled up. The debtors now are demanding that they be allowed to play heads, I win, tails, you lose. And Mr. St. John and others tell us that they have the votes to carry it, as if that made any difference in the forum of discussion. Increase in population does not prove an increased need of money. It may prove the contrary. If the population becomes more dense over a given area, a higher organization may make less money necessary. If railroads and other means of communication are extended, money is economized. If banks and other credit institutions are multiplied, and if credit operations are facilitated by public security, good administration of law, etc., less money is needed. If these changes are going on at the same time that population is increasing, and such is undoubtedly the case in the United States, who can tell whether the net result is to make more or less currency necessary? Nobody. And all assertions about the matter are wild and irresponsible. If it was true that an increase of two millions in the population called for more dollars, how does anybody know whether the current gold production is adequate to meet the new requirement or not? The assertion is arithmetical. It says that two quantities are not equal to each other. The first quantity is the increase in the currency called for by two million more people. How much more is needed? Nobody knows, and there is no way to find out. The silver men have put figures for it from time to time, but the figures rested on nothing and were mere bald assertions. The second quantity is the amount of new gold annually available for coinage in the United States. How much is this? Nobody knows, 
because if an attempt is made to define what is meant, it is found that there is no idea in the words. The people of the United States buy and coin just as much gold as they want at any time. Hence, two things are said to be unequal to each other, when nobody knows how big either one of them is. It may be added that it makes no difference how big either one of them is. How much additional tin is needed annually for the increase of our population? Do the mines produce it? Nobody knows or asks. The mines produce and the people buy what they want. The case is the same as to gold. When we find, then, that Mr. St. John begins with a doctrine which is untenable, then he asserts a relation between population and the need of money which does not exist. Then he assumes that this need is greater than the amount of new gold produced, although neither he nor anybody else knows how big either one of these quantities is. This is the argumentation by which he aims to show that prices are reduced and misery produced by the single gold standard. It is the argumentation which is current among the silver people. Not a step of it will bear examination. The inference that we must restore the free coinage of silver to escape this strangulation of prosperity falls to the ground. End of section 13. Alan R. Tate, Bedford, Mass., November 13th, 2021. Section 14 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. Cause and Cure of Hard Times. It is an essential part of the case of the silver men that the country is having hard times. The bolters from the Republican Convention say in their manifesto discontent and distress prevail to an extent never before known in the history of the country this is an historical assertion it is distinctly untrue there is no such discontent and distress as there was in eighteen nineteen or in eighteen forty or in eighteen seventy five to say nothing of other periods the writers did not know the facts of the history and they made use of what is nowadays a mere figure of speech people who want to say that a social phenomenon is big and who do not know what has been before say that it is unparalleled in history there has been an advancing paralysis of enterprise and a rest of credit ever since the sherman act of eighteen ninety was passed the bolters say that no reason can be found for such an unhappy condition of things save in a vicious monetary system the reason for it has been that the cumulative effect of the silver legislation was steadily advancing to a crisis the efforts by which the effects of that legislation had been put off were no longer effective and it was evident that the country was on the verge of a cataclysm in which the standard of value would be changed what man can fail to see the effect of such a fear on credit and enterprise and with such a fear in the market how idle it is to try to represent the trouble as caused by the fact that the existing standard was of gold or of silver or of anything else men will make contracts and go on with business by the use of any medium the terms of which can be defined understood and maintained until the contract is solved 
but uncertainty as to the terms or danger of changing them makes credit and enterprise impossible in the whole history of finance no crisis can be found which was so utterly unnecessary and so distinctly caused by the measures of policy which had gone before it as that of eighteen ninety three so much being admitted as to hard times it remains true however that by far the greatest part of the current declamation about hard times is false prosperity and adversity of society are not capable of exact verification at all times some people classes industries are less prosperous than others the fashion has grown up among politicians and stump orators of using assertions about prosperity and distress as arguments for their purpose and parties come before the public with prosperity policies they have programs for making the country prosperous if this country with its population its resources and its chances is not prosperous by the intelligence industry and thrift of its population does any sane man suppose that politicians and stump orators have any devices at their control for making it so the orators of the present day see prosperity where they need to see it for the purposes of their argument they say that all gold standard countries in europe are in distress mr st john says that mexico is prosperous as to canada we have seen no statement according to some discussions which are current the bicycle rivals the gold standard as a calamity producer as the bicycle has certainly gravely affected the distribution of expenditure and the accumulation of capital its efficiency as a crisis maker in its degree whatever that may be can be rationally discerned but nobody has ever been able to show that any rational grounds of belief that the gold standard is a crisis maker a crisis will also be produced whenever capital has been invested on a large scale in any unproductive investment whereby it is not reproduced but is lost the enterprises are always made the basis of engagements and contracts when the enterprises fail the engagements cannot be met other engagements based on these also fail and so on through the whole industrial organization such crises are inevitable in a new country enterprises run in fashions at any one time great groups of producers tend to one line of industry that industry is sure to be overdone and to come to a crisis in a free country where every man is at liberty to direct his enterprise as he sees fit what is the sense when it turns out that he has made a mistake of trying to throw the losses on other people no one would propose it as to an individual or a number but when there is a great interest it makes itself a political power and produces a platform for the same purpose generally with inflated principles of humanity justice democracy and americanism as wind attachments to make it float mr st john says that the farmers are spending ten dollars an acre to get eight or nine dollars an acre what farmer in the united states can tell how many dollars he spends on an acre what is the sense of these pretendedly accurate figures but if they had sense what would be the gain of cutting the dollars in two if the farmer spent twenty silver dollars on an acre and got back sixteen or eighteen how would he be benefited the dollars of 
outlay are of the same kind as the dollars of return in any case if it is true that the return does not equal the outlay it must be on account of some facts of production and it requires but a moment's reflection to see that changing the currency in which outlay and income are reckoned cannot change the relation between the two a dispassionate view of facts will go to prove that the world is reasonably and ordinarily prosperous at the present time except where particular classes and industries are affected by special circumstances as some classes and industries are being affected at all times the landowners of western europe are in distress on account of the competition of new land with cheapened means of transportation but now we are told that the holders of the other side of the competition the landowners of the new soil are victims of distress it must be then that too much labor and capital are being expended on the soil the world over and that too in spite of all the protective tariffs drawing people to the textile and metal industries our silver men say that this is not the correct inference they say that the people on the new land suffer because the prices are set in coins of gold and the debits and credits are kept in terms of those coins the prices are fixed in the world's market in gold they will be so fixed whatever we may do with our coinage laws if the proceeds in being brought home are converted into silver value a new opportunity for brokerage and exchange gambling will be given to the hated bankers and brokers of wall street that is the only difference which will be produced it would be far more sensible to say that distress is produced by doing the business on the english system of weights and measures in bushels and pecks and that prosperity would be produced by doing it on the metric system in liters and hectoliters for that charge would at least be harmless our distress could all be dispelled in a week by an act of congress making all contracts beyond political peradventure that which they are in law and fact gold contracts there is however another cause of hard times for some people which is far more important in our present case than any other that is the case of the boom which has collapsed we hear a great deal about wall street gambling the gambling in wall street is insignificant compared with the gambling in land buildings town sites and crops which goes on all over the country and which is participated in chiefly by the men who declaim about wall street for three hundred years our history has been marked by the alternations of prosperity and distress which are produced by the boons and their collapses when the collapse comes the people who are left long of goods and land always make a great outcry and start a political agitation their favorite device always is to try to inflate the currency and raise prices again until they can unload it is a very popular thing to tell men that they have a grievance that most of them find it hard to earn as much money as they need to spend goes without saying now comes the wily orator and tells them that this is somebody's fault in old times if a man was sick it was always assumed that somebody had bewitched him the witch was to be sought the medicine man had to name somebody and then woe to the one who was named our medicine men say that it is the gold bugs wall street england who are to blame for hard times 
Whether there is any rational proof of connection is as immaterial as it always was in witchcraft. It is a case of pain and passion. The gold standard has done it. There is something to hate and denounce. All would be well if silver could be coined at 412 and a half grains to the dollar. But the assumption is that while the farmers would sell their products for twice as many dollars as now, in silver, all the prices of things which they want to buy would remain at the same amount of dollars and cents as now. In gold, that is, it is believed that wheat would be at, say, one dollar and fifty cents per bushel in silver instead of seventy-five cents in gold but that cloth would remain at fifty cents a yard in silver if it is now fifty cents a yard in gold when this assumption is brought out into clear words everyone knows that such can never be the result the proposed cure is like a witch cure it lacks rational basis and cannot command the confidence of men of sense. If the times were ever so bad, such a cure could only make them worse. End of section 14. Section 15 of The Forgotten Man and other essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. The free coinage scheme is impracticable at every Point. The program. In two former articles, I have discussed some points which are presented by the advocates of the free coinage of silver on the assumption that their project was feasible and their conception of its operation correct. They have laid out a program free coinage, silver standard great demand for silver, rise of prices, rise in the value of silver, cancellation of debts, prosperity. They now admit that this program would involve a panic, but it would come out, they say, at the desired result in two or three years. They denounce the gold standard as having caused hard times but they plan a program with a panic as an incident on the way to a silver standard as if it was a trifle. There is not a step in this program which could or would be carried out as planned. Free silver means fiat paper money. The amount of circulating cash of all kinds in the hands of the people at the present time is about 900 millions. If the dollar was reduced to half its present value, and if allowance was made for reserves, 2,000 million silver dollars would be the specie requirement of the country. We already have nearly five hundred millions of such dollars. Hence, the country could not use at the utmost if the new silver dollar was worth not more than half the present gold dollar, and if the total circulation consisted of silver without any paper, but three times as many more silver dollars as we have now. But everyone knows that such a state of the currency never would exist. We should have paper based on silver. That is to say, the silver inflation never will be carried out. It will turn to paper inflation at the first step. Who can believe that, if the silver standard was adopted, silver would be bought and piled up dollar for dollar against the paper 
and that the paper would be issued only as fast as the silver could be coined. In fact, silver would no doubt be dropped and forgotten, and we should have plain and straightforward fiat money of paper. Such ought to be faced as the only real sense and probable outcome of the present agitation for the free coinage of silver. Limit of the amount of silver which could be absorbed. Let us however proceed upon the assumption that the plan proposed is sincere and that the attempt would be made to carry it out in good faith the circulation in the hands of the people would be paper for they would become sick of silver and revolt against it there would then be two thousand million dollars in paper afloat each dollar being of silver and worth half a present gold one we now have five hundred million silver dollars at the utmost not more than another five hundred millions of silver could be absorbed into the system that would give reserves of fifty per cent of the total currency and that is the maximum of the demand for silver which could be created if the united states went over to the silver standard the supply would come from all over the earth mr st john is sure that none would come from europe because legal tender silver there is at a higher ratio than sixteen to one not a nation in europe which is now under the yoke of silver would hesitate a moment to demonetize it and send it here if we open our mints to it at sixteen to one he also assures us that none would come here from the east because the course of silver has always been from west to east the course of silver has turned from east to west more than once when there was a profit on bringing it back and that is the only condition necessary to bring it back again japan would adopt a gold currency the moment that the united states adopted a silver one it is impossible indefinitely to increase the circulation the power of our currency to absorb silver is not unlimited people seem to believe that they can go on and increase the monetary circulation indefinitely this is possible with paper which has no commodity value and cannot be exported always understanding that the paper will depreciate as issued but it is not possible with any money which has commodity value when silver has been put into circulation here to such an amount that all the fictitious value given to it by the coinage law has been eliminated that is to say when so many silver dollars or paper bearing the obligation of silver dollars have been issued as will equal in value the present circulation then there will be no profit in sending silver here from elsewhere and no more profit in minting silver here than in sending it elsewhere as we have seen there is no reason to estimate the amount of silver which would be absorbed in this operation at more than five hundred millions the miners are making all this agitation for the sake of that share which they could get in furnishing this sum that share would really not exceed the silver they had on hand when the law was put in force antagonistic interests of miners and populists what share then would the silver miners get in the results of the enterprise they could get none unless the new silver was bought only of them and only bought gradually as they produced it and bought at a rising price as the demand of debtors acted upon it not one of these conditions would be fulfilled the debtors 
and the silver miners really have antagonistic interests at every point it has been proposed that only american silver should be accepted at the mint that plan is impracticable in any case but when the populists had their victory in hand does anybody suppose that they would wait eight or ten years for the realization of their hopes while the mines were producing new silver being certain that the delay would cause all they hoped for to slip through their fingers i repeat the interests of the two factions are all antagonistic to each other and one of them is destined inevitably to be the dupe of the other that destiny is reserved for the miners who besides are paying all the expenses already so far as the campaign has proceeded this antagonism has begun to manifest itself mr bryan says that his plan will make silver worth one dollar and twenty nine cents per ounce fine he thus takes his position with the miners faction thereupon the organs of the repudiators faction have begun to remonstrate that is not at all what they are fighting for they do not want their scheme to raise silver at all but if it does not the miners gain nothing if it does then again the repudiators take to paper money and the miners win nothing the mechanical difficulty of recoining the silver with the necessary rapidity could probably be overcome there are machine shops enough to do it if there was a party in power which had that reckless determination to execute its will which these people show we may therefore go on to consider the rise of prices the rise of prices the rise in prices would regularly occur only as the new silver or paper was put out but as the consequences would all be discounted it would be sudden and rapid it would not however affect all things at the same time or to an equal degree it is here that one of the first disappointments would occur it is not possible to put up prices when and as one would like to do it even when the rise is due to inflation the effect cannot all be distributed at once an advance in price reacts on business relations that is on the industrial organization many people and many interests find that they cannot push against others until long after they have been pushed against themselves the wages class and the farmers are the ones who are most clearly in this position at least as far as the latter do not produce articles for export it must be plain that in such a convulsion of the market everybody will try to save himself at the expense of others who will succeed those certainly who spend their lives in the market and already possess the control of its machinery not those whose time is occupied in the details of production where the expected gains would go it is said that the farmer would sell his grain and cotton as now for gold that he would exchange the gold for silver would get the silver coined and would pay his debts with it would any individual farmer do this would any one man go through the steps of this operation see the buyer of his products handle the gold and silver go to the mint certainly not all these operations would go on through the commercial and financial machinery 
they would be executed by different individuals in the way of business through the organization and every one of them would be lost to view every operation would have to be paid for every operation would give a new chance for more middlemen and more charges would then the gains of this grand scheme go to the farmer not at all they would go to the brokers and speculators of wall street they would be lost in commissions and charges the type of operator whom the populist seems to think of when he talks about wall street sharks exists although his importance in wall street is not as great as that of the political farmer in agriculture but this type of man does not care what the currency legislation is except that he would like to have a great deal of it and to have it very mixed whatever it is when it is made and he sees what it is he will proceed to operate upon it playing into the hands of the money sharks we hear fierce denunciations of what is called the money power it is spoken of as mighty demoniacal dangerous and schemes are proposed for mastering it which are futile and ridiculous if it is what it is said to be every one of these schemes only opens chances for money jobbers and financial wreckers to operate upon brokerages and differences while making legitimate finance hazardous and expensive thereby adding to the cost of commercial operations the parasites on the industrial system flourish whenever the system is complicated confusion disorder irregularity uncertainty are the conditions of their growth the surest means to kill them is to make the currency absolutely simple and absolutely sound is it not childish for simple honest people to set up a currency system which is full of subtleties and mysteries and then to suppose that they and not the men of craft and guile will get the profits of it End of section fifteen section sixteen of the forgotten man and other essays this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the forgotten man and other essays by william graham sumner the delusion of the debtors fifty years ago a political agitation was started for the annexation of texas as the enterprise appeared like a barefaced piece of land grabbing it was necessary to invent some historical political and moral theories which would give it another color one such theory was that texas had properly belonged to us but that it was given away by monroe and adams in eighteen nineteen therefore the project was presented as one for the re-annexation of texas the remonetization of silver an attempt is now made to impugn the coinage act of eighteen seventy three under various points of view in order to lay a foundation for the claim that it is only sought now to remonetize silver not a single imputation on the act of eighteen seventy three has ever been presented which will stand examination but if that were not so that act was like any other act of congress which has become the law of the land 
and under which we have all been obliged to live for twenty-five years. We cannot go back and undo the law and live the twenty-five years over again. All the mistakes and follies of the past are gone into the past for all classes and all persons amongst us. The men of the past must be assumed to have acted according to their light, and we who inherit the consequences of what they did must make the best of both the good and ill of it, as the case may be, or as we think it is if now we make a new coinage law it must stand on its own merits and on the responsibility of the men who make it now and for the future all references back to eighteen seventy three are idle and irrelevant the plain fact therefore to be faced without any disguise is that we are invited to debase the coinage and lower the standard of value now and for the future as a free act of political choice to be deliberately adopted in a time of profound peace and that this is to be done with the intention and hope that it will perpetrate a bankruptcy at fifty cents on the dollar for all existing debtors can this project be executed? It cannot. A scheme and plan of it for a nation of 70 million people is silly and wicked at the same time, and is both beyond the power of words to express. The projectors of it deal with the economic phenomena of a great nation as if they were talking about a game at cards and they plan to do this with prices and that with debts this with exports and that with banks as if they were planning a program for building a barn if we try to realize the operation proposed we shall see how childish and absurd it is we must distinguish between three classes of debtors great financial institutions small mortgagers and partners in collapsed booms financial institutions as debtors the great financial institutions are intermediaries between debtors and creditors they have received capital from some people and lent it to others they have to recover it and pay it back if they only recover it at fifty cents on the dollar they can only repay it in the same way what this would mean is that the creditors of those institutions would be paid dollars but that when they tried to reinvest them they would find that prices had risen to a greater or less degree in those dollars for the things which they wanted to buy to this the populists answered triumphantly that now the debtors find that the prices of their products have fallen so that when they try to sell them they cannot get enough to pay their debts but the debtors are those who made contracts and undertook enterprises five ten fifteen or twenty years ago expecting to make gains which they certainly would have kept as things have turned out they have not made the gains and their plan is to escape the loss by throwing it on someone else the institutions in question however are bound to protect the interests of either body of their clients borrowers or depositors when either is unjustly threatened and they are by no means destitute of means to do it a law to forbid specific coin contracts is but one step in the desperate policy of prostituting law and corrupting the administration of justice which would be necessary in the attempt to force through the plan under discussion it would fail at last because the advocates of it would find that as the popular saying is it would fly up and hit them in the face 
it is not possible to throw society and all its most important institutions into confusion without ruining all the interests of everybody. And at last, everybody but the tramp or pauper has to ask himself whether it will pay. As for the institutions, many of them would be ruined in the operation. It is not possible for them simply to collect and repay in the debased dollars. The operation would produce snarls and knots at every turn. Lawsuits would multiply on all sides and would so entangle the affairs of the institution as to ruin it. The proof of this is presented by the difficulties of liquidation in any case, even when there is no question of currency revolution, and when general affairs are in normal condition unless there is time and security for all the operations. In this case, the demands on the institution would be precipitated at once so far as the form of contract would allow. Small mortgagers. The small mortgagers are either wages men or farmers. As to the wages men, their wages would undoubtedly go up in time as prices went up, but in the paralysis of industry which would be the first distinct effect of the plan, as soon as it was known that the experiment was to be made, immense numbers of wages men would be thrown out of employment, and all wages would fall on account of this condition of the labor market. Later, when things began to adjust themselves to the new basis, wages would be low, with prices high, both in silver. Advance of wages would come, but it would have to be won through strikes and a prolonged industrial war. In the state of things supposed, it would be every man for himself. The wages class would be the weakest of all under the circumstances, as they are in every case of hard times. How would mortgagers of this class traverse such a time and keep up their interest? As to the principal which is to be halved, it cannot be halved unless it is paid, and the mortgager has nothing to pay it with except the surplus which he can save from his wages over the cost of living. The project promises woe and ruin to the wages class with industrial war and class hatred as moral consequences of the most far-reaching importance. Farmer Mortgagers The farmers expect to double the price of their products, and so get silver to pay off their mortgages. It has been shown elsewhere how illusory this expectation is as regards prices. Prices would rise, indeed, in silver, but irregularly and unequally. They would rise for all the things which a farmer buys, as well as for all that he sells. If, as the silver theorists generally say, all prices were to rise uniformly, the farmer would gain but little for the only means he would win toward paying off his mortgage would be the surplus of his income over his outgo, and this he could only apply year by year as he won it. If, then, the whole scheme could be made to work smoothly, provided the victims of it would submit to it without resistance, does this afford any probability of realizing the great hopes which are built upon the scheme? Social war, the consequence. But victims would not submit without resistance, and once more we come to the result that no effect can be expected from this undertaking but social war and a convulsion of the entire social system whose consequences defy analysis or prediction. 
if a man says that he does not see what great difference going over to the silver standard will make it must be that he is little trained to understand the workings of the industrial system in which he lives and on which he depends it is a monstrous thing that a free self-governing people should join a political battle in this year of grace eighteen ninety six over the question whether to debase their coinage or not the exploded booms the third class of debtors is by far the most important in this matter those who are caught in exploded booms the peaceful and honest mortgagers of farms and homesteads are not the ones who have gotten up this political agitation the jobbers speculators and boom promoters have been one of the curses of this country from the earliest colonial days they are men of the hustling type jobbing in politics with one hand and in land or town lots with the other it is they who at the worst periods of financial trouble in our history have always appeared in the lobby eager for relief declaiming about the people the money power the banks england etc they have always favored schemes for fraudulent banks or paper money or state subsidies or other plans by which they could unload on the state or on their creditors just now it is silver because silver has fallen within twenty-five years so much that it is what is called cheap money this type of men have always used a dialect part of which is quoted above which is so well marked that it suffices to identify them the history of financial distress in this country is full of it no scheme which has ever been devised by them has ever made a collapsed boom go up again with very few exceptions they have on account of such expedients only floundered deeper in the mire the exceptions have been those who have succeeded in making the state provide them with capital although by no means all of these have been hard-headed enough to use it to get out generally they believe in themselves and their schemes and use new capital only to plunge in again still deeper it is men of this class and the silver miners who have brought the present trouble upon us who have invented and preached the notions about the crime of seventy three the hard times the magical influence of silver and all the rest it is they who have filled and engineered conventions they will gain no more now than in any former crisis but they insist on involving us all in turmoil risk and ruin by their schemes to save themselves End of section 16。section 17 of the forgotten man and other essays。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox dot org。read by tatiana chichilla。the forgotten man and other essays。by william graham sumner。the crime of 1873。Legislative History of the Act of 1873 It is alleged that the law of 1873 was enacted surreptitiously. Mr. Bryan is quoted as having said that the free coinage men only ask for a restoration of that system that we had until it was stricken down in the dark without discussion. Within the last ten years, the facts of the legislative history of that law have been published over and over again. They are to be found in the report of the Comptroller of the Currency for 1876, page 170, in Macpherson's Political Manual for 1890, page 157, and in Sound Currency, volume 3, number 13. The bill was before Congress three years, was explained and debated again and again. The fact that the silver dollar was dropped was expressly pointed out. 
it is not now justifiable for any man who claims to be honest and responsible to assert that it was passed in the dark and without discussion. The fact is that nobody cared about it. It is noteworthy that the act is not in McPherson's manual for 1874. It was not thought to be of any importance. It was not until after the Panic of 1873 that attention began to be given to the currency. To that, I who write can testify, since I tried in vain, before that time, to excite any interest in the subject. I was once in the gallery of the House of Representatives when a question of coinage was before the House. I counted those numbers who, as far as I could judge, were paying any attention. There were six. What is it necessary to do in such a case in order to prevent the claim, 25 years later, when countless interests have vested under the law, that the law is open to a reversal because it was passed in the dark? Was it passed surreptitiously? How can a law be passed through Congress surreptitiously? We have indeed heard of bills being smuggled through in the confusion attending the last hours of the session, or as an amendment, or under a misleading title. There are the rules of order, however, by which all legislation is enacted. All laws which get through the mill are equally valid. There never has been, and never can be, any distinction drawn between them according to their legislative history. In the present case, there was not the slightest maneuver or trick, nor is there even room to trump up an allegation of the kind. That the people did not know of it. It is said that the people did not know what was being done. How do they ever know what is being done? There is all the machinery of publicity, and it is all at work. If people do not heed, and of course in nearly all cases they do not, whose fault is it? Who is responsible to go to the 10 million voters individually and make sure that they heed, lest 25 years later somebody may say that the fact that they did not heed lays down the justification for a new project, which certainly is a crime, in the new sense which is given to that word here. Motive of the Law The Act of 1873 did not affect any rights or interests. It took away an option which had existed since 1834, but had never been used, and, for ten years before this Act was passed, had sunk entirely out of sight under paper money inflation. Secretary Boutwell, when he first brought the matter to the attention of Congress in 1870, explained the proposed legislation as a codification of existing coinage laws. Later, it took the shape of a complete simplification of existing law, history, and fact, in order to put the coinage on the simplest and best system as a basis for resumption. As we had then no coin, we had a free hand to put the system on the best basis, there being no vested rights or interests to be disturbed. That this was a wise and sound course to pursue under the circumstances is unquestionable. Three years later, by the rise in greenbacks and the fall in silver, it came about that 412 of one-half grains of silver, nine-tenths fine, was worth a little less than a greenback dollar. The old option would, therefore, if still existent, have been an advantage to debtors. Complaint and clamor for the restoration of the option then began, but to give such an option after the market had changed would be playing with loaded dice. The European countries which still retained the option abolished it as soon as silver began to fall, and we, if we had retained it open until that time, ought to have done the same. Alternate Ruin to Debtors and Creditors The inflation of the Civil War had a direful effect upon all creditors on contracts outstanding in 1862. The resumption of specie payments had a similar effect on debtors under contracts made between 1868 and 1878. Greenbackism and silver debasement were produced by resistance to this operation. The debtors of today are not those of that period. The debts of that period are paid off. The pain and strain have been borne. The credit of the United States has been established, the currency restored, and the whole business of the country for 17 years has been completely established on the gold dollar, as the dollar of account for all transactions whatsoever. The population of the country is now two and a half times what it was in the wartime, and its wealth is probably a greater multiple. The debts now outstanding have, with unimportant exceptions, been contracted since the resumption of specie payments. What is now proposed is to enter upon a new period of these alternations of wrong and injustice, first to creditors, then to debtors, and so on, and to do this in a time of peace, not from any political necessity, but on the ground of some economic interpretations of the facts of the market, which are incapable of verification and proof, when they are not obviously erroneous and partisan. The effects of the various compromises with silver is that the currency is once more intricate and complicated, excessive and confused, so that few can understand it, and it offers all sorts of chances for perverse and mischievous interpretations. Demonetization remove no money from use. 
the law of 1873 never threw a dollar of silver or other currency out of circulation. We hear it asserted that demonetization destroyed half the people's money. People say this who know nothing of the facts, but infer that demonetization must mean that some silver dollars, which were money, had that character taken from them. No one of the other demonetizations, which took place in Europe at about the same time, diminished the money in use. The result of changes in 1873 to 1874 was that the amount of silver coin in use in Europe was greatly increased and has remained so since. The resumption of specie payments after 1873 by a number of nations which had issued paper money in the previous period, and the alternate expenditure and recollection of war hoards of gold, had far greater importance than the demonetizations. There has been no diminution of the world's coined money within 50 years, but a steady and rapid increase of it. There have been fluctuations in the production of gold and silver, such as belong to the production of all metals, and are inevitable. The Alleged Scramble for Gold There has been no scramble for gold. Those who do not put any obstacle in the way of gold get more of it than they want. The Bank of England has had lately the largest stock of gold that it ever had, and complaints have begun to be heard of a glut. The gold production in the last five years is the greatest ever known, and there is no fear of any lack of it whatever may be the sense in which anyone chooses to speak of a lack. There is not, and has not been, any scarcity of gold. There is no such thing conceivable, except where paper has been issued in excess, so that it is hard to keep enough gold to redeem it with. Proof that there has been no scarcity of gold. There is one proof that there has been no scarcity of money for twenty-five years past, which has not indeed passed unnoticed, but which has not received the attention which it deserves. That is the rate of interest. The rate of interest is normally due to the supply and demand of loanable capital, and has nothing to do with money. The value of money is registered by prices, not by the rate of interest. But whenever there is a special demand for money of account, that is, for the solvent of debts, the rate of interest on capital passes over into a rate for the solvent of debts. Banks lend capital at its most universal form, i.e. the currency or money of account, or bank credits. If credit fails, as in a time of crisis and panic, actual cash in the money of account is wanted. This now is loaned, under a rate, by the same persons and institutions who formerly loaned capital, and the one phenomenon passes into the other without any line of demarcation. The transition, however, never takes place except in time of crisis, and therefore at a high rate. From this it follows certainly that never when the market rate is low can it be a rate for the solvent of debts. Now, ever since 1873, with the exception of periods of special stringency in 1884, 1890, and 1893, we have had very low rates of interest. The rate for call loans, which in this connection are the most important, have been about 2%. This is a demonstration that the country has not been suffering from a crisis on account of a lack of currency for the normal needs of business. Proofs could be presented, on the other hand, that the currency for the last six years has been constantly in excess excepting in 1893, when the credit of the currency failed for a time. How to get poor and rich at the same time Mr. St. John tries his hand at the relation between prices and interest in connection with our subject. He says, if the dollar can be cheapened by increasing the number of dollars, so that each dollar will buy less wheat, the increasing price of wheat will increase the demand for dollars to invest in its production. Evidently, he fails to distinguish between the rise in price of wheat from one gold dollar to two gold dollars per bushel, and the rise in wheat from one gold dollar to two fifty-cent silver dollars per bushel. The former would undoubtedly stimulate production. The latter would do so also among farmers who shared Mr. St. John's confusion on this matter. There would be many of them. They would imagine that they were getting rich by raising wheat to sell at two silver dollars, or five, ten, fifteen, or twenty paper dollars as depreciation went on. Hence, as he says, they would pay a banker 8, 10, 12, or 15 percent in the depreciated dollars in order to get money, as he calls it, with which to raise wheat. Mr. St. John thinks that this would mean that farmer and banker were both magnificently prosperous. It would mean that the real value which came in was steadily growing less than that which went out, so that the capital was being consumed. Hence the high rates of inflation times, and the disaster which follows when the truth is realized. They told the story in revolutionary times of a man who invested his capital in a hogshead of rum, which he sold out at an enormous advance, in continental paper, but when he went to buy a new supply, all his money would only buy a barrel. This he retailed out at another enormous advance, in continental, but when he went to buy more, he had only enough money to buy a gallon. 
If he had borrowed his first capital, he might have paid 20% for it, in Continental, but the banker would hardly have made a good affair. Monopoly of the Money We hear it asserted that the gold standard gives the owners of gold power to appropriate the money and make it scarce, and that they have used this power. Why, then, under silver or paper, may not the holders of silver or paper do the same? That the holders of gold have not done it has been shown above, but nobody can do it with any kind of value money. There are no holders of gold. He who holds gold wins no gains on it. The bankers who are supposed to hold it, if peace and security reign, put it all out at loan in order to get gain on it. When peace and security do not reign, it is not safe to put it out, and borrowers, fearing to engage in new enterprises, do not present a demand for it. Furthermore, the greatest gains can then be won by holding money ready to buy property when the crash comes. That is what those who own surpluses are doing now. Hence there are no holders of gold until monetary threats and dangers call them into existence. Silver legislation has made a great many. The law of 1873 never made any. There is not, therefore, a fact or deduction about the law of 1873 or the history of the market since, which the silver men have put forward, which will stand examination. End of section 17. Section 18 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. A Concurrent Circulation of Gold and Silver, 1878, Part 1. It seems as if the United States were destined to be the arena for testing experimentally every fallacy in regard to money which has ever been propounded. A few years ago, only very few people here had ever heard of the double standard or knew what it meant. In 1873, we became simply and distinctly a gold country in law, as we had been for 40 years in fact. Immediately after that date, silver began to fall in value relatively to gold, so that if we had been on the double standard, and had not been deterred by considerations of honor, morality, and public credit, which considerations kept the double standard countries from taking that course, we could have paid our debts in silver at an advantage. Forthwith, all those persons who had before been racking their brains to devise some scheme for resumption without pain or sacrifice turned their attention to silver, and began to devise plans for getting back to the position which, as they thought, we had unwisely abandoned. The consequence has been that for the last year, the country has produced numberless editorials, essays, lectures, and speeches, full of the most crude sophistry, and the most astonishing errors as to all the elementary doctrines of coinage and money. The favorite object of all these schemes is to find some means of increasing the amount of money at the disposal of the world, or of this nation, so as to raise prices and make it easier to pay debts. These schemes have taken their point of departure in the speculations of some European economists. In Europe, the propositions of the economists in question have never passed beyond the realm of speculation and theoretical discussion amongst professional economists. They have been regarded by some as probably sound, and capable of being made the basis of advantageous legislation. By others, superior in number and authority, they have been regarded as unsound, inasmuch as they involve an international coinage union between all civilized countries, and could be put to the experiment only on a scale involving immeasurable risks, the overwhelming judgment has been that they were out of the question. Here, however, our amateurs and empirics are in hot haste to make the experiments, without any coinage convention, or with the cooperation of only a few and the less important nations, that is to say under circumstances which even the most extreme bimetallists condemn as ruinous. It must be observed, then, that there lies back of all this popular discussion a scientific and technical question of great delicacy. I might even say that it is a speculative question, or a question in speculative economics, for we have no experience of an international coinage union, or of a concurrent circulation of the metals. We have to imagine the state of things proposed and reason a priori as to what must be the result. There is a postulate to all these schemes which has never been expressed and never been discussed, but which is assumed to be true. It has two different forms. 1. A concurrent circulation of gold and silver may be established in any country. 2. A concurrent circulation of gold and silver may be established by a coinage union of all civilized nations. These postulates, or we may say this postulate, for the latter includes the former, I have now to bring into question. If the science of money teaches that there cannot be a concurrent circulation of the metals, then the schemes which I have referred to are all condemned. The question, moreover, has won such an immediate and practical significance in the country that it is no longer a subject for academial discussion amongst economists about whom opinions may differ without importance. The Senate of the United States has just passed a bill containing the following provision. Section 2. 
that immediately after the passage of this act, the president shall invite the governments of the countries composing the Latin Union, so-called, and of such other European nations as he may deem advisable, to join the United States in a conference to adopt a common ratio between gold and silver for the purpose of establishing internationally the use of bimetallic money and securing a fixity of the relative value between those metals. Such conference to be held at such a place in Europe or in the United States at such a time within six months as may be mutually agreed upon by the executives of the governments joining in the same. Whenever the governments so invited, or any three of them, shall have signified their willingness to unite the same, the President shall, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, appoint three commissioners who shall attend such conference on behalf of the United States, and shall report the doings thereof to the President, who shall transmit the same to Congress. The conception which governed this legislation is plain enough. It proposes to secure a concurrent circulation of the two metals at a fixed ratio by an international agreement. The proposition is to put the experiment to work when only three nations besides ourselves consent, and in the meantime to remonetize silver here at 16 to 1, when the market ratio is 17 and a half to 1. This adds to the absurdity of the bill, but has no bearing on my present controversy. I challenge the postulate which is assumed, which has never been discussed, much less proved, that a concurrent circulation is possible if an international union can be made. Anybody who concedes this concedes, as I view it, the fundamental and controlling error in the silver craze. If this premise is conceded, there can be no further controversy on the arena of science. It remains only to try to overcome practical difficulties. Such is the issue I raise with those who, under any reservations whatsoever, concede that a concurrent circulation is possible. In a body of scientific gentlemen, I need only refer to the mischief done in science by assuming the truth of postulates without examination, and I need make no apology for bringing forward with all possible force and vigor a controversy on a point so essential. It is my duty to say that I may be in error, and I have the misfortune to differ here with gentlemen from whom I dissent seldom and unwillingly. But it will not be denied that, while there is controversy on a point so essential, and at a moment when practical measures of high importance to every person in this country are proposed, based on certain views of the matter, I am right in promoting discussion. I wish to be understood as paying full respect to everybody, but I address myself, without complaints, to the question in hand. I shall be satisfied if I make it appear that I have some strong grounds for the position I take in a long careful and mature study of this question in all its bearings. It will economize time and space if, before entering on my subject, I try to clear up two points. One, what is an economic force or an economic law, and how ought we to go about the study of economic phenomena? Two, what is a legal tender? One, what should be our conception of an economic force or an economic law, and how ought we to study economic phenomena? Some people seem to think that economic phenomena constitute a domain of arbitrary and artificial action. They think that social phenomena of every kind are subject to chance or control. They see no sequence between incidents of this kind. They have no conception of social forces. They think economic laws are only formulae established by grouping a certain number of facts together, like a rule in grammar, and they are prepared for a list of exceptions to follow. This conception, in its grosser forms, is now banished from the science, but it still has strong hold on popular opinion. It also still colors a great many scientific discussions those, namely, who seek to carry forward the science by following out the complicated cases produced by the combined action of economic forces in our modern industrial life, and describing them in detail. In my opinion, such efforts are mistaken. I regard economic forces as simply parallel to physical forces, arising just as spontaneously and naturally, following a sequence of cause and effect just as inevitably as physical forces, neither more nor less. The perturbations and complications which present themselves in social phenomena are strictly analogous to those which appear in physical phenomena. The social order is, to my mind, the product of social forces tending always towards an equilibrium at some ideal point, which point is continually changing under the ever-changing amount or velocity of the forces, or under their new combinations. Consequently, I do not believe that the advance of economic science depends upon fuller and more minute description of complicated social phenomena as they present themselves in experience, but on a stricter analysis of them, in order to get a closer and clearer knowledge of the laws by which the forces producing them operate. If this can be attained, all the complications which arise from their combined action will be easily solved. Of course, we have peculiar difficulties to contend with, inasmuch as we cannot constitute experiments, and it is necessary to rely largely upon historical cases which present now one and now another force or set of forces in peculiar prominence. The facts which show the difficulty of the task, however, have nothing to do with its nature. According to this view of the matter, there is no more reason to be satisfied with generalities in economics than in physics. Some writers on economic subjects who pride themselves upon scientific reluctance remind me of Mr. Brooks in Middlemarch. They believe in things up to a certain point and are always afraid of going too far. They would be careful about the multiplication table and not bear down too hard on the rule of three. 
they do not discriminate between care and the application of rules and confidence in scientific results, or between harshness in personal relations and firm convictions in science. The more we come to understand economic science, the more clear it is that we are dealing with only another presentation of matter and force, that is to say, with quantity and law, so that we have mathematical relations, and have every encouragement to severity and exactitude in our methods. When, therefore, it is said that the economists do not pay sufficient heed to the power of legislation, that is no stopping place for the argument, any more than it would be in physics, to say that sufficient heed was not paid to friction. The question would then arise, what is the force of legislation? Let us study it, just as we would go on to study friction in mechanics. When it is loosely said, as if that dismissed the subject, that men have passions and emotions and do not act by rule, the objection is not pertinent at all. It is connected with another wide and common, but very erroneous notion, that economic laws involve some stress of obligation on men to do or abstain from doing certain things. I suppose this notion arises from the classification of political economy amongst the moral sciences. Economic laws only declare relations of cause and effect which will follow, if set in motion. Whether a man sets the sequence in motion at all or not, and if he does so, whether he does it from passion or habit, or upon reflection, is immaterial. Such is the case, as I understand it, with all sciences. They simply instruct men, as to the laws of this world in which we live, that they may know what to expect if they take one course or another. Or they instruct men so that they may understand the relations of phenomena of forces beyond our control, so that we may foresee and guard ourselves against harm. It follows from all this that I demand and aim at just as close thinking in political economy as in any other science. I think we must try to get as firm hold of principles and fundamental laws as we can, and that, especially in the face of speculative propositions, we ought to cling to and trust the firmly established laws of the science. 2. As to legal tender, it seems to me that the public mind has been sadly confused under the regime of paper money. Money is any commodity which is set apart by common consent to serve as a medium of exchange. If it is a commodity, it will exchange by the laws of value and will therefore serve to measure value. It must therefore be a commodity, an object of desire requiring onerous exertion to get it. In theory, it may be any commodity. The question as to what commodity is a question of convenience. The question as to what commodity is a question of convenience, that one which will answer the purpose best. Through a long period of experiments, we have come to use gold or silver, simply because we found them the best. Convenience here gave rise to custom. And money of gold or silver owes its existence to custom entirely, and not to law at all. Law has only, in very few instances, even selected that one of the two metals which should be used. Even that has come about through custom. Law, therefore, here as elsewhere where it has been beneficent and not arbitrary, has followed custom, recognized it, ratified it, and given it sanctions. One, a legal tender law, therefore, where customary money is used, simply declares that the parties to a contract shall not vex each other by arbitrarily departing from the custom. The creditor shall not demand, and the debtor shall not offer, out of spite or malice, anything but the customary money of the nation. Such a legal tender law has no significance whatever. No one thinks of it or speaks of it or takes it into account, unless he be one of those whose idle malice it prevents. 2. A legal tender law is used where a subsidiary token currency is employed as part of the system, to prevent debtors from using it in payment, or to prevent the system from bringing about a depreciation of the money. In this case, it is part of the device for using a token currency, and is open to no objection. It would check the debtor when he meant to perpetrate a wrong. It would not enable him to do one. 3. A legal tender law has been used very often, however, to give forced circulation to a depreciated currency of little or no value as a commodity. In that case, the Legal Tender Act enables the debtor to discharge his obligations with less commodities than he and the creditor understood and expected when the contract was made. If the creditor appeals to the courts, they are obliged to rule that the debtor has discharged his obligation when he has not, and they give the creditor no relief. Hence it appears that a legal tender act giving forced circulation to depreciated currency amounts simply to this. It withdraws the protection of the courts from one party to a contract, and leaves him at the mercy of the other party, to the extent of his depreciation of the currency. Obviously no other act of legislation more completely reverses the whole proper object of legislation, or more thoroughly subverts civil order. The English passed two or three acts of this nature, although they were not specifically acts for making banknotes legal tender, during the bank suspension at the beginning of this century. It would have been interesting to see what English courts would have made of an act which reversed the whole spirit of English law by diminishing the rights of one party under a contract, and which made the courts an instrument for his oppression instead of an institution to provide a remedy, but no case came up. The twelve judges on appeal overturned the sentence of a man convicted of buying and selling gold at a premium. Some few persons demanded and obtained gold payments throughout the suspension, but the paper circulation was really sustained by public opinion and consent, it being believed that the bank suspension was necessary. This form of legal tender, therefore, is totally different from that first described. 
I call it, for the sake of discrimination, a forced circulation. When a legal tender act giving forced circulation to a depreciated currency is first passed, if it applies to existing contracts, it transfers a percentage of all capital engaged in credit operations from the creditor to the debtor. In its subsequent action, it subjects either party to the fluctuations which may occur in the forced circulation, robbing first one and then another. Hence the debtor interest is that the depreciation, once begun, shall go on steadily, because any recovery would rob debtors as creditors were robbed in the first place. Having disposed of these two points, I now take up the question I proposed at the outset. Is a concurrent circulation of gold and silver possible under an international coinage union? Here we have to make a radical distinction between two different propositions for an international coinage union. The first is that of Monsieur Wolowski. He pointed to the comparatively small fluctuations of the precious metals and to the effect which France had exerted by the double standard, and inferred that if all civilized nations would join France in her system, they might arrest the fall of either metal before it became important. If the coinage union fixed upon a ratio of 1 to 15 and 1 half, then if silver fell, all would use silver, which would arrest its fall. If gold should fall, we all would use gold. As the metal in use would always be the one which was cheaper than the legal ratio, the other would be above it, if I may so express it. Hence, neither would be permanently demonetized, because neither could fall so low as to go out of use. Only one would be used at a time, but the other would be within reach, and if either should rise relatively to commodities, debtors would not suffer, but might even be benefited by being enabled to turn to the falling metal. This system would require of the law nothing except to prescribe that the mint should coin either metal indifferently, which people might bring, silver coins being made fifteen and one-half times as heavy as gold coins of the same denomination, both being of the same fitness. This is Wolowski's plan, and these are the advantages he expected from it. He thought that it would hold the alternative open between the two metals. He feared that silver, if universally demonetized, would fall so low as to go out of use entirely for money. He thought that France, and later the Latin Union, ought to bear alone the cost of keeping up the value of silver. He thought the debtor ought not to be oppressed by being forced to rely on one metal alone, which might rise relatively to commodities. He did not propose to give the debtor the use of the whole mass of both metals at the same time. Indeed, that arrangement would defeat Wolowski's purpose, for if the whole mass of both metals could be brought into use at once, prices would rise. Those who are indebted now would win, but when prices and credit had adjusted themselves to the bimetallic money, the effect would be exhausted. Debts contracted after that would be relatively just as heavy to pay as they are now, and if the precious metals taken together rose relatively to commodities, debtors would have no recourse to anything else. Now, this chance of recourse, when the standard of value rose, was just what Wolowski wanted. His language is very guarded and scientific. He never went further than to say that his scheme would restrain and limit the fluctuations of the metals, how far he did not know and did not pretend to say. He thought the fluctuations would be so narrow that the transition from one metal to the other would be a relief to debtors, without any appreciable injustice to creditors. All this is very clear and very sensible. On theory, it is open to no radical objection. The discussion of it turns upon considerations of practicability and expediency. It is much to be wished that this plan should be called by its proper name, the alternative standard, or better still, the alternate standard. It counts among its adherents a number of strong men, and many others have signified assent to it on theoretical grounds. The term bimetallism ought to be restricted to another theory of which Cernusi is the advocate, for it has its purpose to unite the two metals at once in the circulation and give debtors the whole mass of both metals as a means of payment. Cernusi believes that the international coinage union could arrest the fluctuations of the metals entirely, or that there is some narrow limit of fluctuation within which both would remain in use, and that the coinage union could hold the value fluctuations of the metals within these limits. The American schemes are numerous and so crude that it is difficult to analyze or classify them. They are also of many different grades. They all, however, seem to have this in common, that they want to secure to the debtor the use of both metals at once, and that they aim at a concurrent circulation. They must, therefore, be classed under bimetallism. These schemes all involve not simply what Wolowski said, that legislation and union could limit the fluctuations, but the proposers know how much it would limit them, and they can control the results. This view has very few adherents in Europe. It has not been discussed there save by one or two writers. It is passed by in silence for reasons which I shall soon show. The opinion has been expressed that these two propositions differ only in degree. From this opinion I must express my earnest dissent. It is the very cardinal point of my present argument. Wolowski's alternate standard seems to me to rest upon the belief that legislation of the kind proposed would restrict the fluctuations in value of the metals. It affirms that legislation would have a certain tendency. Any plan for concurrent circulation giving debtors the use of the whole mass of both metals pretends to say how far the tendency would go and what its results would be. To my mind, the difference between those two propositions is that between a scientific and an unscientific proposition. We have a parallel case before us. Some say remonetization would cause an advance in silver. 
Others say remonetization would make a 412 and one half grain silver dollar equal in value to a gold one. Are those two propositions the same, save in degree? It seems to me that only a very superficial consideration of them could so declare. Obviously, they differ in quality more than in degree. The former of these propositions is not false in principle. The question in regard to it must be decided by circumstances. The second is false and erroneous from beginning to end, and would be false even if temporarily, and by force of circumstances, the silver dollar should become equal to the gold dollar, because it rests, like the old doctrine that nature abhors a vacuum, upon false views of all the forces involved just so with regard to concurrent circulation or bimetallism as compared with the alternate standard. The latter predicts tendencies to arise from the play of certain forces. Those tendencies are the true effect of those forces. The question may be raised whether the means proposed would bring those forces into action, whether they would be as great as is expected, whether they would be counteracted by others, but there is no error as to the nature and operation of economic forces. Bimetallism predicts results, not tendencies. It assumes to measure the consequences and say what will result as a permanent state of things. It therefore involves the doctrine that legislation can control natural forces for definite results. If legislation cannot control natural forces, then we cannot secure a concurrent circulation, giving the debtor the use of the whole mass of both metals with which to pay his debts. At a time like this, when the silver craze seems to be asserting itself as a mania, by sweeping away some who ought to be most staunch in their adherence to economic laws, and most clear in their perception of economic truths, I may be pardoned for insisting most strenuously upon this distinction and upon its importance." Many of the American writers have been betrayed into error by not having examined these two plans and discriminated between them with sufficient care. It is very common to see arguments based upon the alternate standard and inferences drawn as to bimetallism, which are entirely fallacious, because they cross the gulf between the two theories without recognizing it. Bimetallism is so plainly opposed to fundamental doctrines of political economy that few European economists have felt called upon to discuss it. Here, the case is different. And the more ground it wins, the more danger there is that it will affect legislation, the more urgent is the necessity to resist every form of it. Now, my proposition is that a concurrent circulation that is a permanent union of the two metals in the coinage so that the debtor can use both or either is impossible. Permanent stability of the metals in the coinage, whether with or without an international coinage union, is just as impossible in economics as perpetual motion is in physics. Against perpetual motion, the physicist sets a broad and complete negation because action and reaction are equal. He does not care what the principle may be on which anyone may try to construct perpetual motion. If anyone brings to him a perpetual motion, perhaps he will spend time to examine and analyze it, and show how it contravenes the great law of motion. I claim that a concurrent circulation is impossible on any scheme or under any circumstances, because it contravenes the law of value. Value fluctuates under supply and demand, at a limit fixed by what Cairn calls cost of production, or Javon calls the final increment of utility, or Walrus calls scarcity, all of which on analysis will be found to be the same thing. Bimetallism affirms that, under legislation, Although supply and demand may vary, value shall not. In order to test this, let us next examine the influence of legislation on value. End of section 18. Section 19 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner A Concurrent Circulation of Gold and Silver, 1878, Part 2 The cases in which legislation acts on value are all cases of monopoly. Such is the case with token money, such is the case with irredeemable paper. As with every other monopoly, the successful manipulation of these monopolies consists in controlling supply to fit the supply to the demand at the price which the monopolist wants to get. The history of every monopoly shows the great difficulty, I might say, in the long run, the impossibility of doing this. The bimetallists propose not to act on the supply, and so create a monopoly, but to act upon the demand. This is a new exercise of legislation, different from any yet tried, and not guaranteed by any experience. Now to act upon the demand is, in the phrase of the stockbrokers, to make a corner, that is, to buy all that is offered at a price. Stock gamblers do this so as to sell out again at an advance to those who are forced to buy. If there are none who are forced to buy, then those who bought above the market have lost their capital. The propositions of the advocates of the alternate standard and of bimetallism are alike in proposing that all civilized nations shall combine to make a corner on the falling metal. Whether that is a worthy undertaking or not, I will not stop to inquire. It is evident that the nations of the coinage union would have no one on whom to unload after they had bought, and that there would be an inevitable loss and waste of capital in the transaction. This, however, is not all. 
a corner is effective or not according to its scope. It must embrace the whole object to be raised in price, and above all it must act upon a limited amount which is not fed from any new source of supply. A corner on the precious metals is not to be made effective even by a combination of all the civilized nations. In my opinion, there is a grand fallacy in the notion that a coinage union would do what France did, only on a larger scale. Woloski saw France, lying between Germany, a silver nation, and England, a gold nation, carry out the compensatory operation, and he inferred that all nations could agree to do the same, more widely, more easily, and with wider distribution of the loss. It seems to me that there was an action and reaction here between members of the group of nations which one can easily understand, but that if all nations joined in the system, the alternation would not work at all for want of a point of reaction. If all nations agreed to join the corner on the falling metal, they could not all bring their new demand to bear on the new supply at the same time. As the mines are limited and local, a new supply would not touch the market only at one point. Hence, the coinage union implies no aggregation of force at all. Make the union embrace the whole world, and the effect is just the same as if there were none at all, the matter standing simply on the natural laws for the distribution of the precious metals. Control of demand by a corner, or of supply by a monopoly, acts more efficiently the smaller and closer the market is, and conversely, the larger and wider the transaction, the less the efficiency. Furthermore, a corner to succeed must make sure that there is no source of supply, and that it has to deal only with an amount which can be computed. The gold corner on Black Friday, 1869, was ruined when the Secretary of the Treasury ordered sales of gold. A monopoly in like manner must be able to count on steady and uniform demand. The coal combination failed when the hard time suddenly contracted the demand for coal. Hence, the movement towards a wider market, embracing a larger quantity, is always a movement towards less, and not towards greater control by artificial expedients. Applying these observations to the matter before us, I have to say, one, that I consider the inference that a coinage union would do what France did under the double standard, only more surely and efficiently, quite mistaken. Two, as to the alternate standard, I do not believe that the alternation would work on a worldwide scale at all. I regard its operation in France as fully accounted for by the relations of three countries, England, France, and Germany. Three, as to bimetallism, the coinage union, instead of gaining more stringent control to counteract and nullify the effect of changes in supply of either metal, would have less effect in that direction the larger it was. Having thus examined the nature of artificial interferences with value and their limitations, I return to my proposition that to establish a concurrent circulation is just as impossible as to square the circle or to invent perpetual motion. No doubt it is difficult, perhaps impossible, to make a demonstration of a negative proposition like this. The burden of proof lies upon those who bring forward attempts to solve the problem, and I can justly be held only to examine and refute such attempts. No proof has ever been offered by any of the persons in question. No one of them has attempted as much of an analysis of the effect of artificial expedients on value as the one I have just offered. No one of them has attempted to analyze the operation of the proposed coinage union to show how or why they expect it to act as they say. They pass over this assumption as lightly as our popular advocates of silver assume that remonetization would put an end to the hard times. They content themselves with analogies, or with loose and general guesses that such and such things would result from a coinage union. We all know what dangers lurk in the argument from analogy. The further you follow it, the further you are from the point. An analogy has no proper use save to set in clearer light an opinion or a proposition which must rest for its merits on an appropriate demonstration. Thus the attempt has been made to illustrate the power of governments to control the fluctuations of the metals by the analogy of a man driving two horses. It is said that this is controlling natural forces for definite results, and it is asked, if one man in his sphere can do this, why may not the collective might of the nation do this in its sphere? My answer is that it is in the sphere of man to tame horses, but it is not in the sphere of nations to control value, and therefore the analogy is radically false. I cannot be held to argue both sides of the question. I am not bound to put all the cases of the adversaries into proper shape for discussion and then to refute them. I plant myself squarely upon the fundamental principles of the science of which I am a student, and deny that any concurrent circulation is possible except under temporary and accidental circumstances, because it involves the proposition that legislation can control value to bring about desired results. A concurrent circulation must mean one which is concurrent, and if it is to offer debtors the whole mass of both metals to pay their debts with, it must be permanent." If both metals should be used for a time until prices and contracts were adjusted to them, and then one should rise as much as go out of use, the consequences would be disastrous to debtors beyond anything now apprehended. I proceed, then, to criticize the notions of a concurrent circulation as to their common features. The error with them all is that they try to corner commodities the supply of which is beyond their control or knowledge. That is a fatal error in any corner, as I have already shown. 
if it were proposed that each nation should have a certain amount of circulation composed of the two metals in equal parts, and then that the circulation should be closed, then the corner might work, and there might be some sense in it. Suppose that a nation had 200 millions of fixed circulation, half gold and half silver, and that this sum was not in excess of its requirement for money. Then I do not see how either half of the coinage should fall relatively to the other, but if silver did fall, every dollar of silver which was sought would involve the relinquishment of a dollar in gold, and this exchange would act on equal and limited amounts of each metal. It would then depress one metal and raise the other to an exactly equal degree. The balance might, in that case, be retained. The hypothesis of a closed circulation is, however, preposterous. No one thinks of it. The plan of a concurrent circulation with a free mint strikes, upon close examination, at every step, against difficulties of that sort which warn a scientific man that he is dealing with an empirical and impossible delusion. How is it to be brought about? The movement towards a bimetallic circulation would never begin unless the ratio of the coinage was the market ratio. It would not go on unless the mint ratio followed every fluctuation of the market. It would not be accomplished unless the mint ratio at last was that of the market. It would not remain unless the market ratio remained fixed. But the mint ratio cannot be changed from time to time. If it were, the result would be inextricable confusion in the coins, driving us back to the use of scales and weights with which to treat the coins as bullion. If we pass over this difficulty, and suppose, for the sake of argument, that the system had been brought into activity, the reasons why it could not stand present themselves in numbers. They all come back to this, that the supply is beyond our knowledge and control. If the supply of either metal is increased, it would overthrow the legal rating at the point at which it was put into the market, and would destroy the equality there. Its effects would spread according to the amount of the new supply and the length of time it continued. The bimetallists seem to forget that an increased demand counteracts an increased supply only by absorbing it under price fluctuation. The same error is familiar in the plans for perpetual motion. Speculations to that end often overlook the fact that we cannot employ a force in mechanics without providing an escapement, which is always exhausting to force at our disposal. So the bimetallists seem to think of their enhanced demand as acting on value without an actual action and reaction which consists in absorbing supply under a price fluctuation. The new metal could therefore pass into the circulation and would destroy the equilibrium of the metals in the coinage. If this new addition were only a mathematical increment, it would suffice to establish the principle for which I contend, and to overthrow the bimetallic theory. For if I see that any force has a certain effect, I must infer that the same force, increased or continued, would go on to greater effects. And if the final effect is not reached, it is because the force is not sufficient, not because there is an act of the legislature in the way. If, then, silver entered the circulation, gold would leave it and be exported, if the exchange is allowed of any export, or would be hoarded and melted. The silver-producing countries would therefore gravitate towards a silver circulation only, and other countries towards a gold circulation. Here, another assumption of the bimetallists is involved. They assume that the metal to be exported would be the one which falls. Thus, if all nations had a bimetallic circulation, and if the supply of silver in the United States increased, it would be necessary that this silver should be proportionately distributed among all the nations in order to keep up a bimetallic system. No bimetallist has ever faced this question. They assume that Americans would pay their foreign debts with silver in that case, and they rely on the international legal tender law to secure this. This is one of the fallacies of legal tender referred to at the outset. Rates of exchange and prices would at once vary to counteract any such operation, just as they always counteract the injustice of a forced circulation and throw it back on those who try to perpetuate it. It may suffice to put the case this way. If we had both metals circulating together so that a merchant obtained both in substantially equal proportion, and if silver should fall ever so little in our markets, owing to increased production, and if a foreigner were selling his products here, intending to carry home his returns in metal, which metal would he retain to carry away? Obviously that one which, at the time, and prospectively, had the higher value. Rates of exchange and prices would adjust themselves so as to bring about the same result through the mechanism of finance. This is one of the most subtle questions involved in the general issue, but it is vital to the bimetallic theory. Some writers have satisfied themselves with general opinions, guesses, I am obliged to call them, that if the fluctuations were kept within certain limits, the concurrent circulation would stand. They probably rely on an element analogous to friction, which unquestionably acts in economy and finance. This element consists of habit, prejudice, passion, dislike of trouble. It acts with great force in retail trade and in individual cases, and in small transactions. Its force diminishes as we go upwards toward the largest transactions, where the smallest percentages give very appreciable sums. It seems to me that the bimetallic system reduces this friction to a minimum. If a man has to spend a dollar, he does not go to a broker to buy a trade dollar with a greenback dollar and save a cent or two, but if he has both a gold dollar and a silver dollar in his pocket, 
and under the bimetallic system, the chances are that when he has two dollars, he will have one of each. It needs only the lightest shade of difference in value to determine him which to give and which to hold. A bank of issue, holding equal amounts of the two metals with which to redeem its notes, would find an appreciable profit in giving one and holding the other, and it would require nothing but a word of command to the proper officer, involving no risk at all. Hence, I say this friction would be reduced to its minimum under the bimetallic system. It is astonishing what light margins of profit suffice to produce financial movements nowadays, and the tendency is to make the movements turn on smaller and smaller margins. Five in the thousand above par carries gold out of this country. Four in the thousand carries it from England to France. When the French suspended specie payments, a depreciation of two in the thousand on the paper sufficed to throw gold out of circulation. A variation in the ratio of metals from 15.5 to 1 to 15.6 to 1 is a variation of six and one half in the thousand. I do not see how small a variation must be in order to justify anyone in saying that a bimetallic circulation could exist in spite of it. Therefore, it seems to me that the more accurately the bimetallic system was established, the more delicate and more easily overthrown it would be, while if it was not accurately established, it would not come about at all. I submit that such a result is one of the notes of an absurdity in any science. An analogy has been suggested in illustration and support of the bimetallic theory, that two vessels of water connected by a tube tend to preserve a level. I have already indicated my suspicion of all analogies, but I will alter this one to make it fit my idea of bimetallism. Suppose two vessels capable of expansion and contraction to a considerable degree, under the operation of forces which act entirely independently of each other, so that the variations in shape and capacity of each may have all conceivable relations to the corresponding variations of the other. Suppose further that each is fed by a stream of water, each stream being variable in its flow, and the variations of each having all the possible relations to the variations of the other. The fluctuations in capacity may represent fluctuations of demand, and the fluctuations of inflow, fluctuations of supply. Would the water in the two vessels stand at the same level, except temporarily and accidentally, even though the two vessels were connected by a tube? The analogy of the connecting tube could not be admitted even then, because it brings into play the natural law of the equilibrium of fluids, to which the legal tie between the metals is not analogous. If we desire to make the analogy approximately just in this respect, we may suppose that each vessel has an outlet, and that a man is stationed to open the outlet of the vessel in which the water is at the higher point, so as to try to keep them both at a level. It is evident that his utmost vigilance would be unavailing to secure the object proposed. I do not borrow the analogy or adopt it, I only show how inadequate it is in the form proposed. There is another group of propositions which have many advocates amongst us, of which something ought to be said. Propositions of those who want to use silver as a legal tender at its value, under some scheme or other. Some want a public declaration, by appointed persons from time to time, of the market value. Any such plan would throw on the officers in question a responsibility which would be onerous to the extreme, so much so that no one could or would discharge it, and it would introduce a mischievous element of speculation into the payment of all debts. It is, besides, open to the objections which may be adduced against the other plan, which is to have either coins or bars of silver, assayed and stamped, legal tender for debts at the market quotation. Here we need to remember the definition of legal tender given at the outset. If these silver coins and bars are convenient for the purpose, they will come into use by custom and consent at their value. If they really pass at their market value, there will be no advantage to the debtor. One who has silver and wants to pay a debt can do so at its value by selling the silver. In this sense, every man who produces wheat, cotton, iron, or personal services pays his debts with them at their value. One who produced something else than silver would have no object in selling it for silver, to pay his debt with at the value of silver. He would have the trouble of another transaction, he would have to buy silver at its selling price, and the creditor to whom he paid it would have to sell it for money at the broker's buying price, with no advantage to either, but only to the broker. If silver passes at its value, legal tender has no force for it. If it is to have forced circulation in some way, it will help the debtor, as all forced circulation does, by enabling him to keep part of what he borrowed. If, then, these schemes really mean that silver shall pass at its value, they are of no use. It does so now. If they mean that silver shall be enabled to pay debts in some other way than iron, wheat, cotton, etc., then we know what we are dealing with. There is just as much reason why the government should pay for elevators and issue certificates of the amount and quality of grain, which should be legal tender, as there is why it should assay and stamp silver for that purpose, and issue notes for it. These cases only serve to bring out the distinction between money and merchandise and to show that the perfection of money does not lie in the direction of a multiple legal tender, but of a single standard, as sharp and definite as possible. Such a standard has the same advantages in exchange as the most accurate measures of length and weight have in surveying or in chemistry, 
and it is turning backward the progress of monetary science to introduce fluctuations and doubt into the standard of value, just as it would be to cultivate inaccuracy in weights and measures. Here I am forced to notice another hasty and mischievous analogy. Some devices for composite measures of length have been adopted to avoid contraction and expansion, and it is urged that bimetallic money is a step in the same direction. I by no means assert that science can do nothing to reach a better standard of value than gold is. What progress in that direction may lie in the future, no one can tell, and he would be rash who should ever presume to deny that progress can be made. But when any proposition is presented, it will have to show what composite measures of length show, to wit, that its action is founded on natural laws. Heat and cold act oppositely on the components of the composite measures of length, or the arrangement is such that the action of the natural forces neutralizes. No such scientific principle underlies bimetallic money. The forces determining the value of gold and silver act independently of each other, and are not subject to common influences. They are complex, moreover, and their effects are not uniform in their different degrees. Therefore, this analogy also fails. The opinion that a concurrent circulation is not possible has led several of the leading nations of Europe, and at the time of writing such is still the system of the United States, to adopt a plan of a permanently false rating of gold and silver, so as to use silver as a subsidiary coinage. Silver is permanently overrated, so that it obtains currency above its bullion value. If the civilized nations want to use silver for money, so that the total amount of metallic money in the Western world shall be greater than the amount of gold, and if they are not satisfied with the use of it as a subsidiary, then there is only one way left, and that is for some nations to use gold and some to use silver. This was the solution of the bimetallic difficulty which China was forced to adopt a thousand years ago. Some provinces used iron and some copper. The question then arises as to who will take silver. This brings me to the last point of which I have to speak. I have discussed my subject as if gold and silver stood in the same level of desirability for money, and as if there were no choice of convenience between them. Such is not the case, in fact. It will be observed that gold and silver never have been used together. Gold has generally been subsidiary, being employed for large transactions. With the advance of prices and the increase in variety of commodities, as well as the magnitude of transactions, nations have passed from copper money to silver and from silver to gold. This advance is dictated by convenience. Silver is no longer as convenient a money for civilized, industrial, and commercial nations as gold. We therefore see them gradually abandoning silver, and we see the Latin Union set up a bar against silver so soon as the operation of the double legal tender threatened to take away gold and give it silver. Whether this movement from silver to gold can be accomplished without financial convulsions, I am not prepared to say, especially in view of the extent to which the nations have depreciated gold by paper issues, but I regard the movement as one which must inevitably go forward. The nations which step into the movement first will lose least on the silver they have to sell. The nations which use silver until the last will lose most upon it, because they will find no one to take it off their hands. If we now abandon the gold standard and buy the cast-off silver of the nations which have been using it, and are now anxious to get rid of it, we voluntarily subject ourselves to that loss, which we are in no respect called upon to share. The Dutch at New York kept up the use of wampum longer than the English in New England. When the Yankees were trying to get rid of it, they carried it to New York adding some which they manufactured for the purpose, and they carried the goods of the Dutchmen away. The latter then found that they held a currency which they could only get rid of at great loss and delay to the Indians north and west of them. The Yankees thus early earned a reputation for smartness. The measure now proposed is a complete parallel, only that now this nation proposes to take the role of the Dutch. We have to give our capital for silver, and after we have suffered from years of experience with a tool of exchange inferior to that which our neighbors are using, we shall have to get rid of it and buy the best. Then we shall incur the loss." to all those who have anything, of the difference between the capital we gave and that which we can get for the silver. The dreams of getting silver and keeping gold too, so as to have a concurrent circulation, are all vain. At the rating proposed, there is no difference of opinion on this point amongst the persons at all qualified to give an opinion. The real significance of the propositions before the country is to make us one of the nations to take silver in the distribution I have described. The notion of a coinage union is impracticable. It would be easier to get up an international union to do away with war. England is perfectly satisfied with her money. She appreciates the peril of monetary experiments and will make none. Germany, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and Holland have just changed from silver to gold and will not enter on any new changes for a long period, if ever. The coinage union is therefore out of the question. The issue before us is simply whether we, being a gold nation, will, under the circumstances, abandon gold and take up silver. No doubt the nations which want gold would be very glad to have us do it. We should render them a great service. We should, however do ourselves great harm, as much so as if we should buy a lot of cast-off machinery from them. They are waiting to see whether we are ignorant and foolish enough to put ourselves in this position, and when they have seen, we shall hear no more of the coinage union. I have now presented the views to which my study of this question has led me. 
it will be perceived that I direct my attack against the postulate of all the bimetallic theories. I have carefully discriminated between the alternate standard and bimetallism. I have said little about the former. It is very much a matter of opinion whether it would work or not. I do not believe that it would, under a coinage union, but I should not feel forced to take strong ground against anyone who held the contrary opinion. My subject has been a concurrent circulation of gold and silver, and I have tried to controvert the notion that any such thing is possible, with or without a coinage union, because that notion contradicts the first great law of economic science. If that notion is true, then there is no science of political economy at all. There are no laws to be found out. A professional economist has nothing to teach, and he might better try to find some useful occupation. If that notion is true, we have no ground on which to criticize the congressmen who are trying to pass the silver bill. We cannot predict any consequences or draw any inferences from past experience. If legislation can control value for definite results, then the whole matter is purely empirical. In that case, the congressional experiment may turn out well for all the grounds we have to assert the contrary. Its success would only be questionable, not impossible. If it failed, it would not be because its supporters had attempted the impossible, but because they had not used sufficient means. They could go on to try the experiment again and again in other forms and with other means, and they would indeed be doing right to proceed with their experiments, like the old alchemists, in the hope of hitting it at last. No economist would have any ground upon which to step in and define the limits of the possible, or to prescribe the conditions of success, or to set forth the methods which must be pursued, if he could not appeal with confidence to the laws of his science as something to which legislature, as well as individuals, must bend. Therefore, one who holds the views I have expressed in regard to economic forces, laws, and phenomena is compelled, as well by his faith in science as by the public interests now at stake in the question, to maintain that a concurrent circulation of gold and silver, either with or without a coinage union, is impossible. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. The Influence of Commercial Crises on Opinions About Economic Doctrines, 1879, Part 1. Anyone who follows the current literature about economic subjects will perceive that it is so full of contradictions as to create a doubt whether there are any economic laws, or whether, if there are any, we know anything about them. No body of men ever succeeded in molding the opinions of others by wrangling with each other, and that is the present attitude in which the economists present themselves before the public. Like other people who engage in wrangling, the economists have also allowed their method to degenerate from argument to abuse, contempt, and sneering disparagement of each other. The more superficial and self-sufficient the opinions and behavior of the disputants, the more absolutely they abandon sober arguments and devote themselves to the method I have described. As I have little taste for this kind of discussion and believe that it only degrades the science of which I am a student, I have taken no part in it. In answer to your invitation, now, what I propose to do is call your attention to some features of the economic situation of civilized nations at the present time with a view to establish two points. 1. To explain the vacillation and feebleness of opinions about economic doctrine which mark the present time, and two, to show the necessity, just at this time, of calm and sober apprehension of sound doctrine in political economy. At the outset, let me ask you to notice the effects which have been produced during the last century by the developments of science and of the industrial arts. Formerly, industry was pursued on a small scale, with little or no organization. Markets were limited to small districts, and commerce was confined to raw materials and colonial products. Producer and consumer met face to face. The conditions of the market were open to personal inspection. The relations of supply and demand were matters of personal experience. Production was carried on for orders only in many branches of industry, so that supply and demand were fitted to one another, as we may say, physically. Disproportionate production was, therefore, prevented, and the necessity of redistributing productive effort was made plain by the most direct personal experience. Under such a state of things, much time must elapse between the formation of a wish and its realization. Within a century, very many and various forces have been at work to produce an entire change in this system of industry. The invention of the steam engine and of machines used in the textile fabrics produced the factory system, with a high organization of industry concentrated at certain centers. The opening of canals and the improvement of highways made possible the commerce by which the products were distributed. The cheapening of printing and the multiplication of means of advertising widened the market by concentrating the demand which was widely dispersed in place. Until now, the market is the civilized world. The applications of steam power to roads and ships only extended further the same development, and the telegraph has only cheapened and accelerated the means of communicating information to the same end. What have been the effects on industry? 1. The whole industry and commerce of the world have been built up into a great system in which organization has become essential, 
and in which it has been carried forward and is being carried forward every day to new developments. Industry has been growing more and more impersonal as far as the parties to it are concerned. Our wants are satisfied instantaneously and regularly by the cooperation of thousands of people all over the world whom we have never seen or heard of. And we earn our living daily by contributing to satisfy the wants of thousands scattered all over the world, of whom we know nothing personally. In the place of actual contact and acquaintance with the persons who are parties to the transactions, we now depend upon the regularity, under the conditions of earthly life, of human wants and human efforts. The system of industry is built upon the constancy of certain conditions of human existence, upon the certainty of the economic forces which thence arise, and upon the fact that those forces act with perfect regularity under changeless laws. If we but reflect a moment, we shall see that modern industry and commerce could not go on for a day if we were not dealing here with forces and laws which may properly be called natural, because they come into action when the conditions are fulfilled, because the conditions cannot but exist if there is a society of human beings collected anywhere on earth, and because, when the forces come into action, they work themselves out, according to their laws, without possible escape from their effects. We can divert the forces from one course to another, we can change their form, we can make them expend themselves upon one person or interest instead of upon another. We do this all the time, by bad legislation, by prejudice, habit, fashion, erroneous notions of equity, happiness, the highest good, and so on, but we never destroy an economic force any more than we destroy a physical force. 2. Of course it follows that success in the production of wealth under this modern system depends primarily on the correctness with which men learn the character of economic forces and of the laws under which those forces act. This is the field of the science of political economy, and is the reason why it is science. It investigates the laws of forces which are natural, not arbitrary, artificial, or conventional. Some communities have developed a great hatred for persons who held different religious opinions from themselves. Such a feeling would be a great social force, but it would be an arbitrary and artificial. Many communities have held that all labor, not mental, was slavish and degrading. This notion, too, was conventional, but it was a great social force where it existed. Such notions, either past or present, are worth studying for historical interest and instruction, but they do not afford the basis for a science whose object is to find out what is true in regard to the relations of man to the world in which he lives. The study of them narrows a valuable sidelight on the true relations of human life, just as the study of error always throws a sidelight upon the truth, but they have no similarity to the law that men want the maximum of satisfaction for the minimum of effort, or to the law of the diminishing return from land, or to the law of population, or to the law of supply and demand. Nothing can be gained, therefore, by mixing up history and science, valuable as one is to the other. If men try to carry on any operation without an intelligent theory of the forces with which they are dealing, they inevitably become the victims of the operation, not its masters. Hence, they always do try to form some theory of the forces in question and to plan the means to the end accordingly. The forces of nature go on and are true only to themselves. They never swerve out of pity for innocent error or well-intentioned mistakes. This is as true of economic forces as of any others. What is meant by a good or a bad investment except that one is based on a correct judgment of forces and the other on incorrect judgment? How would sagacity, care, good judgment, and prudence meet their reward if the economic forces swerved out of pity for error? We know that there is no such thing in the order of nature. I repeat, then, that the modern industrial and commercial system, dealing as it does with vast movements which no one mind can follow or compass in their ramifications, and which are kept in harmony by natural laws, demands steadily advancing, clear and precise knowledge of economic laws, that this knowledge must banish prejudices and traditions that it must conquer baseless enthusiasms and whimsical hopes. If it does not accomplish this, we can expect but one result, that men will chase all sorts of phantoms and impossible hopes, that they will waste their efforts upon schemes which can only bring loss, and that some will run one way and some another until society loses all coherence, all unanimity of judgment as to what is to be sought and how to attain to it. The destruction of capital is only the least of the evils to be apprehended in such a case. I do not believe that we begin to appreciate one effect of the new civilization of the 19th century, to wit, that the civilized world of today is a unit, that it must move as a whole, that with the means we have devised of a common consent in regard to the ends of human life and the means of attaining them has come also the necessity that we should move onward in civilization by a common consent. The barriers of race, religion, language, and nationality are melting away under the operation of the same forces, which have to such an extent annihilated the obstacles of distance and time. Civilization is constantly becoming more uniform. The conquests of some become at once the possession of all. It follows that our scientific knowledge of the laws which govern the life of men in society must keep pace with this development, or we shall find our social tasks grow faster than our knowledge of social science, and our society will break to pieces under the burden. How, then, is this scientific knowledge to grow? Certainly not without controversy, but certainly also not without coherent, steady, and persistent effort, proceeding on the lines already cut, breaking new ground when possible, 
correcting old errors when necessary. 3. It is another feature of the modern industrial system that, like every high organization, it requires men of suitable ability and skill at its head. The qualities which are required for a great banker, merchant, or manufacturer are as rare as any other great gifts among men, and the qualities demanded, or the degree in which they are demanded, are increasing every day with the expansion of the modern industrial system. The qualities required are those of the practical man, properly so called, sagacity, good judgment, prudence, boldness, and energy. The training, both scientific and practical, which is required for a great master of industry, is wide and various. The great movements of industry, like all other great movements, present subordinate phenomena which are apparently opposed to, or inconsistent with, their great tendencies and their general character. These phenomena, being smaller in scope, more directly subject to observation, and therefore apparently more distinct and positive, are well calculated to mislead the judgment, either of the practical man or of the scientific student. In nothing, therefore, does the well-trained man distinguish himself from the ill-trained man more than in the balance of judgment by which he puts phenomena in their true relative position and refuses to be led astray by what is incidental or subsidiary. If now the question is asked whether we have produced a class of highly trained men, competent to organize labor, transportation, commerce, and banking on the scale required by the modern system as rapidly as the need for them has increased, I believe no one will answer in the affirmative. 4. Another observation to which we are led upon noticing the character of the modern industrial system is that any errors or follies committed in one portion of it will produce effects which will ramify through the whole system. We have here an industrial organism, not a mere mechanical combination, and any disturbance in one part of it will derange or vitiate, more or less, the whole. The phenomena which here appear belong to what has been called fructifying causation. One economic error produces fruits which combine with those of other economic error, and the product of the two is not their sum, nor even their simple product but the evil may be raised to a very higher power by the combination. If a number of errors fall together, the mischief is increased accordingly. Currency and tariff errors constantly react upon each other and multiply and develop each other in this way. Furthermore, the errors of one nation will be felt in other nations through the relations of commerce and credit which are now so close. There is no limit to the interest which civilized nations have in each other's economic and political wisdom, for they all bear the consequences of each other's follies. Hence, when we have to deal with that form of economic disease which we call a commercial crisis, we may trace its origin to special errors in one country and in another, and may trace out the actions and reactions by which the effects have been communicated from one to another until shared by all. But no philosophy of a great commercial crisis is adequate nowadays, unless it embraces in its scope the whole civilized world. A commercial crisis is a disturbance in the harmonious operation of the parts of the industrial organism. During economic health, the system moves slowly and harmoniously, expanding continually, and its health and vigor are denoted by its growth, that is, by the accumulation of capital, which stimulates in its turn the hope, energy, and enterprise of men. Industrial disease is produced by disproportionate production, a wrong distribution of labor, erroneous judgment and enterprise, or miscalculations of force. These all have the same effect, to wit, to waste and destroy capital. Such causes disturb, in a greater or less degree, the harmonious working of the system, which depends upon the regular and exact fulfillment of the expectations which have been based on cooperative effort throughout the whole industrial body. The disturbance may be slight and temporary, or it may be very serious. In the latter case, it will be necessary to arrest the movement of the whole system and to proceed to a general liquidation before starting again. Such was the case from 1837 to 1842, and such has been the case for the last five years. It is needless to add that this arrest and liquidation cannot be accomplished without distress and loss to great numbers of innocent persons, and great positive loss of capital, to say nothing of what might have been won during the same period, but must be forgone. The financial organization is the medium by which the various parts of the industrial and commercial organism are held in harmony. It is the financial organization that capital is collected and distributed, that the friction of exchanges is reduced to a minimum, and that time is economized through credit between production and consumption. The financial system furnishes three indicators, prices, the rate of discount, and the foreign exchanges, through which we may read the operation of economic forces now that their magnitude makes it impossible to inspect them directly. Hence the great mischief of usury laws which tamper with the rate of discount, and of fluctuating currencies which falsify prices and the foreign exchanges. They destroy the value of the indicators, and have the same effect as tampering with the scales of a chemist or the steam gauge of a locomotive. In the matter of prices, we have another difficulty to contend with which is inevitable in the nature of things. We must choose some commodity to be the denominator of value. We can find no commodity which is not itself subject to fluctuation in its ratio of exchange with other things. Great crises have been caused in past times by fluctuations in the value of the commodities chosen as money, and such an element is, no doubt, at hand in the present crisis, 
although it had nothing to do with bringing it about. It follows that any improvement in the world's money is worth any sacrifice which it can possibly cost, if it tends to secure a more simple, exact, and unchanging standard of value. The next point of which I wish to speak is easily introduced by the last remark. That point is the cost of all improvement. The human race has made no step whatever in civilization which has not been won by pain and distress. It wins no steps now without paying for them in sacrifices. To notice only things which are directly pertinent to our present purpose, every service which we win from nature displaces the acquired skill of the men who formerly performed the service. Every such step is a gain to the race, but it imposes on some men the necessity of finding new means of livelihood. And if those men are advanced in life, this necessity may be harsh in the extreme. Every new machine, although it saves labor, and because it saves labor, serves the human race, yet destroys a vested interest of some laborers in the work which it performs. It imposes on them the necessity of turning to a new occupation, and this is hardly ever possible without a period of distress. It very probably throws them down from the rank of skilled to that of unskilled labor. Every new machine also destroys capital. It makes useless the half-worn-out machines which it supersedes. So canals caused capital which was invested in turnpikes and state coaches to depreciate, and so railroads have caused the capital invested in canals and other forms to depreciate. I see no exception to the rule that the progress won by the race is always won at the expense of some group of its members. Anyone who will look back upon the last 25 years cannot fail to notice that the changes, advances, and improvements have been numerous and various. We are accustomed to congratulate each other upon them. There can be no doubt that they must and will contribute to the welfare of the human race beyond what anyone can now possibly foresee or measure. I am firmly convinced, for my opinion, that the conditions of wealth and civilization for the next quarter of a century are provided for in excess of any previous period of history, and that nothing but human folly can prevent a period of prosperity which we, even now, should regard as fabulous. We can throw it away if we are too timid, if we become frightened at the rate of our own speed, or if we mistake the phenomena of a new era for the approach of calamity, or if the nations turn back to medieval darkness and isolation, or if we elevate the follies and ignorances of the past into elements of economic truth. Or if, instead of pursuing liberty with full faith and hope, the civilized world becomes the arena of a great war of classes in which all civilization must be destroyed. But, such follies apart, the conditions of prosperity are all provided. We must notice, however, that these innovations have fallen with great rapidity upon a vast range of industries, that they have accumulated their effects, that they have suddenly altered the currents of trade and the methods of industry, and that we have hardly learned to accommodate ourselves to one new set of circumstances before a newer change or modification has been imposed. Some inventions, of which the Bessemer steel is the most remarkable example, have revolutionized industries. Some new channels of commerce have been opened which have changed the character and methods of very important branches of commerce. We have also seen a movement of several nations to secure a gold currency, which movement fell in with a large, if not extraordinary, production of silver and altered the comparative demand and supply of the two metals at the same time. This movement had nothing arbitrary about it, but proceeded from sound motives and reasons in the interest of the nations which took this step. There is here no ground for condemnation or approval. Such action by sovereign nations is taken under liberty and responsibility to themselves alone, and if it is taken on sufficiently large scale to form an event of importance to the civilized world, it must be regarded as a step in civilization. It can only be criticized by history. For the present, it is to be accepted and interpreted only as an indication that there are reasons and motives of self-interest which can lead a large part of the civilized world to this step at this time. The last 25 years have also included political events which have had great effects on industry. Our civil war caused an immense destruction of capital and left a large territory with millions of inhabitants almost entirely ruined in its industry, and with its labor system exposed to the necessity of an entire reformation. Part of the expenditures and losses of the war were postponed and distributed by means of the paper currency, which, instead of imposing industry and economy to restore the losses and waste, created the foolish belief that we could make war and get rich by it. The patriotic willingness of the nation to be taxed was abused to impose taxes for protection, not for revenue, so that the industry of the country was distorted and forced into unnatural development. The collapse of 1873, followed by a fall in prices and a general liquidation, was due to the fact that everyone knew in his heart that the state of things which had existed for some years before was hollow and fictitious. Confidence failed because everyone knew that there were no real grounds for confidence. The Franco-Prussian War had also, while it lasted, produced a period of false and feverish prosperity in England. It was succeeded by great political changes in Germany, which, together with the war indemnity, led to a sudden and unfounded expansion of speculation amounting to a mania. Germany undoubtedly stands face to face with a new political and industrial future, but she has postponed it by a headlong effort to realize it at once. In France, too, the war was followed by a hasty, and as we are told, unwise extension of permanent capital, planned to meet the extraordinary demand of an empty market. 
In England, the prosperity of 1870 to 1872 has been followed, as usual, by developments of unsound credit, bad banking, and needless investments in worthless securities. Here, then, we have, in a brief and inadequate statement, circumstances in all these great industrial nations peculiar to each, yet certainly sufficient to account for a period of reaction and distress. We have also before us great features of change in the world's industry and commerce, which must ultimately produce immeasurable advantages, but which may well, operating with local causes, produce temporary difficulty, and we have to notice also that the local causes react to the commercial and credit relations of nations to distribute the evil. It is not surprising, under such a state of things, that some people should lose their heads and begin to doubt the economic doctrines which have been most thoroughly established. It belongs to the symptoms of disease to lose confidence in the laws of health and to have recourse to quack remedies. I have already observed that certain phenomena appear in every great social moment which are calculated to deceive by apparent inconsistency or divergence. Hence we have seen the economists, instead of holding together and sustaining, at the time when it was most needed, both the scientific authority and the positive truth of their doctrines, break up and run hither and thither, some of them running away altogether. Many of them seem to be terrified to find that distress and misery still remain on earth, and promise to remain as long as the vices of human nature remain. Many of them are frightened at liberty, especially under the form of competition, which they elevate into a bugbear. They think that it bears harshly on the weak. They do not perceive that here the strong and the weak are terms which admit of no definition unless they are made equivalent to the industrious and the idle, the frugal and the extravagant. They do not perceive, furthermore, that if we do not like the survival of the fittest, we have only one possible alternative, and that is the survival of the unfittest. The former is the law of civilization, the latter is the law of anti-civilization. We have our choice between the two, or we can go on, as in the past, vacillating between the two. But a third plan, the socialist desideratum, a plan for nourishing the unfittest and yet advancing in civilization, no man will ever find. Some of the crude notions, however, which have been put forward, surpass what might reasonably have been expected. These have attached themselves to the branches of the subject, which it is worthwhile to notice. 1. As the change in the relative value of the precious metals is by far the most difficult and most important of the features of this period, it is quite what we might have expected that the ill-trained and dilettante writers should have pounced upon it as their special prey. The dabblers in philology never attempt anything less than the problem of the origin of language. Every teacher knows that he has to guard his most enthusiastic pupils against precipitate attempts to solve the most abstruse difficulties of the science. The change in the value of the precious metals which is going on will no doubt figure in history as one of the most important events in the economic history of this century. It will undoubtedly cost much inconvenience and loss to those who are in the way of it, or who get in the way of it. It will, when the currency changes connected with it are accomplished, prove a great gain to the whole commercial world. The nations which make the change do so because it is important for their interest to do it. Now, suppose that it were possible for those who are frightened at the immediate and temporary inconveniences to arrest the movement. The only consequence would be that they would arrest and delay the inevitable march of improvement in the industrial system. 2. The second field, which is an especial favorite with the class of writers which I have described, is that of prognostications as to what developments of the economic system lie in the future. Probably everyone has notions about this, and everyone who has to conduct business or make investments is forced to form judgments about it. There is hardly a field of economic speculation, however, which is more barren. 3. The third field into which these writers venture by preference is that of remedies for existing troubles. The popular tide of medicine is always therapeutics, and the less one knows of anatomy and physiology, the more sure he is to address himself exclusively to this department, and to rely upon empirical remedies. The same procedure is followed in social science, and it is accompanied by the same contempt for scientific doctrine and knowledge and remedies. To bring out the points which here seem to me important, it will be necessary to go back in for a moment to some facts which I have already described. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Steve Knox. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner. The Influence of Commercial Crises on Opinions about Economic Doctrines. Part 2, 1879. One of the chief characteristics of the great improvements in industry which have been described is that they bring about new distributions of population. If machinery displaces laborers engaged in manufacturers, these laborers are driven to small shopkeeping if they have a little capital, or to agricultural labor if they have no capital. Improvements in commerce will destroy local industry 
and force the laborers to find a new industry or to change their abode. When forces of this character cooperate on a grand scale, they may and do produce very important redistributions of population. In like manner, legislation may, as tariff legislation does, draw population to certain places, and its repeal may force them to unwelcome change. We may state the fact in this way. Let us suppose that in 1850, out of every hundred laborers in the population, the economical distribution was such that 50 should be engaged in agriculture, 30 in manufacturing, and the other 20 in other pursuits. That is to say, with the machinery and appliances then available, 30 manufacturing laborers could use the raw materials and food produced by 50 agricultural laborers so as to occupy all to the highest advantage. Now suppose that by improvements in the arts, 20 men could in 1880 use to the best advantage the raw materials and food produced by 60 in agriculture. It is evident that a redistribution would be necessary by which 10 should be turned from manufacturing to land. That such a change has been produced within the last 30 years and that it has reached a point at which is setting in the counter movement to the former tendency from the land to the cities and towns seems to me certain. There are even indications of great changes going on in the matter of distribution, which will correct the loss and waste involved in the old methods of distribution long before any of the fancy plans for correcting them can be realized, and which are setting free both labor and capital in that department. Now, if we can economize labor and capital in manufacturing, transportation, and distribution, and turn this labor and capital back upon the soil, we must vastly increase wealth, for that movement would enlarge the stream of wealth from its very source. Right here, however, we need to make two observations. One, the modern industrial system, which I have described with its high organization and fine division of labor, has one great drawback. The men, or groups of men, are dissevered from one another, their interests are often antagonistic, and the changes which occur take the form of conflicts of interest. I mean this. If a shoemaker worked alone, using a small capital of his own tools and stock, and working for orders, he would have directly before him the facts of the market. He would find out without effort or reflection when, quote-unquote, trade fell off, when there was risk of not replacing his capital, when the course of fashion or competition called upon him to find other occupation, and so on. When a journeyman shoemaker works for wages, he pays no heed to these things. The employer, feeling them, has no recourse but to lower wages. It is by this measure that, under the higher organization, the need of new energy, or of a change of industry, or of a change of place is brought home to the workman. To him, however, it seems an arbitrary and cruel act of the master. Hence, follow trade wars and strikes as an especial phenomenon of the modern system. It is just because it is a system, or more properly still an organism, that the readjustments which are necessary from time to time in order to keep its parts in harmonious activity and to keep it in harmony with physical surroundings are brought about through this play of the parts on each other. 2. A general movement of labor and capital towards land throughout the civilized world means a great migration towards the new countries. This does not by any means imply the abandonment or decay of older countries, as some have seemed to believe. On the contrary, it means new prosperity for them. When I read that the United States are about to feed the world, not only with wheat and provisions, but with meat also, that they are to furnish coal and iron to mankind, that they are to displace all the older countries as exporters of manufacturers, that they are to furnish the world's supply of the precious metals, and I know not what all besides. I am forced to ask, what is the rest of the world going to do for us? What are they to give us besides tea, coffee, and sugar? Not ships, for we will not take them, and are ambitious to carry away all our products ourselves. Certainly, this is the most remarkable absurdity into which we have been led by forgetting that trade is an exchange. 
Neither can any one well expect that all mankind are to come and live here. The conditions of a large migration do, however, seem to exist. A migration of population is still a very unpopular idea in all the older states. The prejudice against it is apparent amongst liberals and Tories, economists, and sentimentalists. There is, however, a condition which is always suppressed in stating the social problem as it presents itself in hard times. That problem, as stated, is, quote, How are the population to find means of support? Unquote. And the suppressed condition is, quote, If they insist on staying and seeking support where they are and in pursuits to which they are accustomed. Unquote. The hardships of change are not for one moment to be denied, but nothing is gained by sitting down to whine about them. The sentimental reasons for clinging to one's birthplace may be allowed full weight, but they cannot be allowed to counterbalance important advantages. I do not see that any but landowners are interested to hold population in certain places, unless possibly we add governing classes and those who want military power. When I read declamations about nationality and the importance of national divisions to political economy, parentheses, observe that I do not say to political science, close parentheses, I never can find any sense in them, and I am very sure that the writers never put any sense into them. We may now return to consider the remedies proposed for hard times. We shall see that although they are quack remedies, and although they set at defiance all the economic doctrines which have been so laboriously established during the last century, they are fitted to meet the difficulty as it presents itself to landowners, governments, military powers, socialists, and sentimentalists. The tendency is towards an industrial system controlled by a natural cooperation far grander than anybody has ever planned towards a community of interest and welfare far more beneficent than any universal republic or fraternity of labor which the internationalists hope for, and towards a free and peaceful rivalry amongst nations in the arts of civilization. It is necessary to stop this tendency. What are the means proposed? 1. The first is to put a limit to civil liberty. By civil liberty, parentheses, for I feel at once the need of defining this much-abused word, close parenthesis, I mean the status which is created for an individual by those institutions which guarantee him the use of his own powers for his own development. For three or four centuries now, the civilized world has been struggling towards the realization of this civil liberty. Progress towards it has been hindered by the notion that liberty was some vague abstraction, or an emancipation from some of the hard conditions of human life, from which men can never be emancipated while they live on this earth. Civil liberty has also been confused with political activity or share in civil government. Political activity itself, however, is only a means to an end, and is valuable because it is necessary to secure to the individual free exercise of his powers to produce an exchange according to his own choice and his own conception of happiness, and to secure him also that the products of his labor shall be applied to his satisfaction and not to that of any others. When we come to understand civil liberty for what it is, we shall probably go forward to realize it more completely. It will then appear that it begins and ends with freedom of production, freedom of exchange, and security of property. It will then appear also that governments depart from their prime and essential function when they undertake to transfer property instead of securing it, and it may then be understood that legal tender laws and protective tariffs as amongst the last and most ingenious devices for transferring one man's product to another man's use are gross violations of civil liberty. At present, the attempt is being made to decry liberty to magnify the blunders and errors of men in the pursuit of happiness into facts which should be made the basis of generalizations about the functions of government, and to present the phenomena of the commercial crisis as reasons for putting industry once more in leading strings. It is only a new foe with an old face. Those who have held the leading strings of industry in time past have always taken rich pay for their services, and they will do it again. 2. The second form of remedy proposed is quite consistent with the last, 
It consists in rehabilitating the old and decaying superstition of government. It is called the state, and all kinds of poetical and fanciful attributes are ascribed to it. It is presented, of course, as a superior power, able and ready to get us out of trouble. If an individual is in trouble, he has to help himself or secure the help of friends as best he can. But if a group of persons are in trouble together, they constitute a party, a power, and begin to make themselves felt in the state. The state has no means of helping them except by enabling them to throw the risks and losses of their business upon other people who already have the burdens and losses of their own business to bear, but who are less well organized. The state, quote-unquote, assumes to judge what is for the public interest and imposes taxes or interferes with contracts to force individuals to the course which will realize what it has set before itself. When, however, all the fine phrases are stripped away, it appears that the state is only a group of men with human interests, passions, and desires, or, worse yet, the state is, as somebody has said, only an obscure clerk hidden in some corner of a governmental bureau. In either case, the assumption of superhuman wisdom and virtue is proved false. The state is only a part of the organization of society in and for itself. That organization secures certain interests and provides for certain functions, which are important, but which would otherwise be neglected. The task of society, however, has always been and is yet to secure this organization and yet to prevent the man in whose hands public power must at last be lodged from using it to plunder the governed, that is, to destroy liberty. This is what despots, oligarchs, aristocrats, and democrats always have done, and the latest development is only a new form of the old abuse. The abuses have always been perpetrated in the name of the public interest. It was for the public interest to support the throne and the altar, it was for the public interest to sustain privileged classes, to maintain an established church, standing armies, and the passport and police system. Now it is for the public interest to have certain industries carried on, and the holders of state power apportion their favor without rule or reason, without responsibility, and without any return service. In the end, therefore, the high function of the state to regulate the industrial organization in the public interest is simply that the governing group interferes to make some people give the products of their labor to other people to use and enjoy. Everyone sees the evils of the state meddling with his own business and thinks that he ought to be let alone in it. But he sees great public interests, which would be served if the state would interfere to make other people do what he wants to have them do. Now, if these two measures could be carried out, if liberty could be brought into misapprehension and contempt, and if the state superstition could be saved from the decay to which it is doomed, the movements of population and the changes in industry, commerce, and finance could be arrested. The condemnation of all such projects is, once and for all, that they would arrest the march of civilization. The joy and the fears which have been aroused on one side and on the other, by the reactionary propositions which have been made during the last five years, are both greatly exaggerated. Such reactionary propositions are in the nature of things at such a time. It must be expected that the pressure of distress and disappointed hopes will produce passionate reaction and senseless outcries. From such phenomena to actual practical measures is a long step. Every step towards practical realization of any reactionary measures will encounter new and multiplying obstacles. A war of tariffs at this time would so fly in the face of all the tendencies of commerce and industry that it would only hasten the downfall of all tariffs. Purely retaliatory tariffs are a case of what the children call, quote, cutting off your nose to spite your face, unquote. Some follies have become physically impossible for great nations nowadays. Germany has been afflicted, first, by too eager hopes, second, by the great calamity of too many and too pedantic doctors, third, by a declining revenue, and fourth, by socialistic agitation amongst the new electors. It appears that she is about to abandon the free trade policy, although she does not embrace protection with much vigor. 
the project already comes in conflict with numerous and various difficulties which had not been foreseen and, in its execution, it must meet with many more. The result remains to be studied. France finds that the expiration of each treaty of commerce produces consequences upon her industry which are unendurable, and while the task of adjusting rival and contending interests so as to create a new system drags along, she is compelled to ward off by temporary arrangements the revival of the general tariff which the treaties had superseded. In the meantime, her economists, who are most sober and the best trained in the world, are opening a vigorous campaign on the general issue. If England should think of reviving protection, she would not know what to protect. If she wanted to retaliate, she could only tax raw materials and food. The proposition, as soon as it is reduced to practical form, has no footing. As for ourselves, we know that our present protective system never could have been fastened upon us if it had not been concealed under the war legislation, and its effects had not been confused with those of the war. It could not last now if the public mind could be freed from its absorption in sectional politics so that it would be at liberty to turn to this subject. In conclusion, let me refer again to another important subject on which I have touched in this paper, what we call the silver question. It would no doubt be in the power of civilized nations to take some steps which would alleviate the inconveniences connected with the transition of several important nations from a silver to a gold currency. For one nation, which has no share in the trouble at all, to come forward out of quote-unquote magnanimity, or any other motive to save the world from the troubles incident to this step, is quixotic and ridiculous. It might properly leave those who are in the trouble to deal with it amongst themselves. Either they or all might, however, do much to modify the effects of the change. The effort to bring about an international union to establish a bimetallic currency at a fixed ratio is quite another thing. It will stand in the history of our time as the most singular folly which has gained any important adherence. As a scientific proposition, bimetallism is as absurd as perpetual motion. It proposes to establish perpetual rest in the fluctuations of value of two commodities, to do which it must extinguish the economic forces of supply and demand of those commodities upon which value depends. The movement of the great commercial nations toward a single gold currency is the most important event in the monetary history of our time, and one which nothing can possibly arrest. It produces temporary distress, and the means of alleviating that distress are a proper subject of consideration. But the advantages which will be obtained for all time to come immeasurably surpass the present loss and inconvenience. In return, then, to the propositions with which I set out, Feebleness and vacillation in regard to economic doctrine are natural to a period of commercial crisis on account of the distress, uncertainty, and disorder which then prevail in industry and trade. But that is just the time also when a tenacious grasp of scientific principles is of the highest importance. The human race must go forward to meet and conquer its problems and difficulties as they arise to bear the penalties of its follies, and to pay the price of its acquisitions. To shrink from this is simply to go back and to abandon civilization. The path forward, as far as any human foresight can now reach, lies in a better understanding and better realization of liberty, under which individuals and societies can work out their destiny, subject only to the incorruptible laws of nature. End of The Influence of Commercial Crises on Opinions About Economic Doctrines, 1879, Part 2, in The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. Section 22 of The Forgotten Man and Other Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Forgotten Man and Other Essays by William Graham Sumner The Philosophy of Strikes The progress in material comfort which has been made during the last hundred years has not produced content. 
quite the contrary the men of to-day are not nearly so contented with life on earth as their ancestors were this observation is easily explainable by familiar facts in human nature if satisfaction does not reach to the pitch of satiety it does not produce content but discontent it is therefore a stimulus to more effort and is essential to growth if however we confine our study of the observation which we have made to its sociological aspects we perceive that all which we call progress is limited by the counter movements which it creates and we also see the true meaning of the phenomena which have led some to the crude and silly absurdity that progress makes us worse off progress certainly does not make people happier unless their mental and moral growth corresponds to the greater command of material comfort which they win all that all that we call progress is a simple enlargement of chances and the question of personal happiness is a question of how the chances will be used it follows that if men do not grow in their knowledge of life and in their intelligent judgment of the rules of right living as rapidly as they gain control over physical resources they will not win happiness at all they will simply accumulate chances which they do not know how to use the observation which has just been made about individual happiness has also a public or social aspect which is important it is essential that the political institutions the social code and the accepted notions which constitute public opinion should develop in equal measure with the increase of power over nature the penalty of failure to maintain due proportion between the popular philosophy of life and the increase of material comfort will be social convulsions which will arrest civilization and will subject the human race to such a reaction toward barbarism as that which followed the fall of the roman empire it is easy to see that at the present moment our popular philosophy of life is all in confusion the old codes are breaking down new ones are not yet made and even amongst people of standing to whom we must look to establish the body of public opinion we hear the most contradictory and heterogeneous doctrines about life and society the growth of the united states has done a great deal to break up the traditional codes and creeds which had been adopted in europe the civilized world being divided into two parts one old and densely populated and the other new and thinly populated social phenomena have been produced which although completely covered by the same laws of social force have appeared to be contradictory the effect has been to disturb and break up the faith of philosophers and students in the laws and to engender numberless fallacies among those who are not careful students the popular judgment especially has been disordered and misled the new country has offered such chances as no generation of men has ever had before it has not however enabled any man to live without work or to keep capital without thrift and prudence it has not enabled a man to rise in the world from a position of ignorance and poverty and at the same time to marry early spend freely and bring up a large family of children the men of this generation therefore without distinction of class and with only individual exceptions 
suffer from the discontent of an appetite excited by a taste of luxury but held far below satiety the power to appreciate a remote future good in comparison with a present one is a distinguishing mark of highly civilized men but if it is not combined with powers of persevering industry and self-denial it degenerates into mere day-dreaming and the diseases of an overheated imagination if any number of persons are of this character we have morbid discontent and romantic ambition as social traits our literature especially our fiction bears witness to the existence of classes who are corrupted by these diseases of character we find classes of persons who are whining and fault-finding and who use the organs of public discussion and deliberation in order to put forth childish complaints and impossible demands while they philosophize about life like the arabian nights of course this whole tone of thought and mode of behavior is as far as possible from the sturdy manliness which meets the problems of life and wins victories as much by what it endures as by what it conquers our american life by its ease exerts another demoralizing effect on a great many of us hundreds of our young people grow up without any real discipline life is made easy for them and their tastes and wishes are consulted too much they grow to maturity with the notion that they ought to find the world only pleasant and easy every one knows this type of young person who wants to find an occupation which he would like and who discusses the drawbacks of difficulty or disagreeableness in anything which offers the point here referred to is of course entirely different from another and still more lamentable fact that is the terrible inefficiency and incapability of a great many of the people who are complaining and begging if any one wants a copyist he will be more saddened than annoyed by the overwhelming applications for the position the advertisements which are to be found in the newspapers of widest circulation offering a genteel occupation to be carried on at home not requiring any previous training by which two or three dollars a day may be earned are a proof of the existence of a class to which they appeal how many thousand people in the united states want just that kind of employment what a beautiful world this would be if there was any such employment then again our social ambition is often silly and mischievous our young people despise the occupations which involve physical effort or dirt and they struggle up as we have agreed to call it into all the nondescript and irregular employments which are clean and genteel our orators and poets talk about the dignity of labor and neither they nor we believe in it leisure not labor is dignified nearly all of us however have to sacrifice our dignity and labor and it would be to the purpose if instead of declamation about dignity we should learn to respect in ourselves and each other work which is good of its kind no matter what the kind is to spoil a good shoemaker in order to make a bad parson is surely not going up and a man who digs well is by all sound criteria superior to the man who writes ill everybody who talks to american schoolboys thinks that he does them and his country service if he reminds them that each one of them has a chance to be president of the united states 
and our literature is all the time stimulating the same kind of senseless social ambition. Instead of inculcating the code and the standards which should be adopted by orderly, sober, and useful citizens. The consequences of the observations which have now been grouped together are familiar to us all. Population tends from the country to the city. Mechanical and technical occupations are abandoned and those occupations which are easy and genteel are overcrowded. Of course, the persons in question must be allowed to take their own choice and seek their own happiness in their own way, but it is inevitable that thousands of them should be disappointed and suffer. If the young men abandon farms and trades to become clerks and bookkeepers, the consequence will be that the remuneration of the crowded occupations will fall and that of the neglected occupations will rise. If the young women refuse to do housework and go into shops, stores, telegraph offices, and schools, the wages of the crowded occupations will fall while those of domestic servants advance. If women in seeking occupation try to gain admission to some business like telegraphing in competition with men, they will bid under the men. Similar effects would be produced if a leisure class in an old country should be compelled by some social convulsion to support themselves. They would run down the compensation for labor in the few occupations which they could enter. Now the question is raised whether there is any remedy for the low wages of the crowded occupations, and the question answers itself. There is no remedy except not to continue the causes of the evil, to strike that is, to say that the workers will not work in their chosen line, yet that they will not leave it for some other line, is simply suicide. Neither can any amount of declamation, nor even of lawmaking, force a man who owns a business to submit the control of it to a man who does not own it. The telegraphers have an occupation which requires training and skill, but it is one which is very attractive in many respects to those who seek manual occupation. It is also an occupation which is very suitable, at least in many of its branches, for women. The occupation is therefore capable of a limited monopoly. The demand that women should be paid equally with men is, on the face of it, just but its real effect would be to keep women out of the business. It was often said during the telegraphers' strike that the demand of the strikers was just because their wages were less than those of artisans. The argument has no force at all. The only question was whether the current wages for telegraphing were sufficient to bring out an adequate supply of telegraphers. If the growing boys prefer to be artisans, the wages of telegraphers will rise if, even at present rates, boys and girls continue to prefer telegraphing to handicraft or housework. The wages of telegraphers will fall. Could then a strike advance at a blow the wages of all who are now telegraphers? There was only one reason to hope so and that was that the monopoly of the trade might prove stringent enough and the public inconvenience great enough to force a concession which would, however, have been speedily lost again by an increased supply of telegraphers. Now let us ask what the state of the case would be if it was really possible for the telegraphers to make a successful strike. They have a very close monopoly. Six years ago, they nearly arrested the transportation of the country for a fortnight, but they were unable to effect their object. 
more recently, the freight handlers struck against the competition of a new influx of foreign unskilled laborers, and in vain. The printers might make a combination and try to force an advance in wages by arresting the publication of all the newspapers on a given day. But there are so many persons who could set type in case of need that such an attempt would be quite hopeless. In any branch of ordinary handicraft, there would be no possibility of creating a working monopoly or of producing a great public calamity by a strike. If we go on to other occupations, we see that bookkeepers, clerks, and salesmen could not as a body combine and strike, much less could teachers do so, still less could household servants do so. Finally, farmers and other independent workers could not do it at all. In short, a striker is a man who says, I mean to get my living by doing this thing and no other thing as my share of the social effort, and I do not mean to do this thing except on such and such terms. He therefore proposes to make a contract with his fellow men and to dictate the terms of it. Any man who can do this must be in a very exceptional situation. He must have a monopoly of the service in question, and it must be one of which his fellow men have great need. If, then, the telegraphers could have succeeded in advancing their wages 15% simply because they had agreed to ask for the advance, they must have been far better off than any of the rest of their fellow men. Our fathers taught us the old maxim, cut your coat according to your cloth but the popular discussions of social questions seem to be leading up to a new maxim demand your cloth according to your coat the fathers thought that a man in this world must do the best he could with the means he had and that good training and education consisted in developing skill sagacity and thrift to use resources economically the new doctrine seems to be that if a man has been born into this world he should make up his mind what he needs here formulate his demands and present them to society or to the state he wants congenial and easy occupation and good pay for it he does not want to be hampered by any limitations such as come from a world in which wool grows but not coats in which iron ore is found but not weapons and tools in which the ground will produce wheat but only after hard labor and self-denial in which we cannot eat our cake and keep it in which two and two make only four he wants to be guaranteed a market so as not to suffer from overproduction. In private life and in personal relations, we already estimate this way of looking at things at its true value, but as soon as we are called upon to deal with a general question or a phenomenon of industry in which a number of persons are interested, we adopt an entirely conventional and unsound mode of discussion. The sound gospel of industry, prudence, painstaking, and thrift is of course unpopular. We all long to be emancipated from worry, anxiety, disappointment, and the whole train of cares which fall upon us as we work our way through the world can we really gain anything in that struggle by organizing for a battle with each other this is the practical question is there any ground whatever for believing that we shall come to anything by pursuing this line of effort which will be of any benefit to anybody if a man is dissatisfied with his position let him strive to better it in one way or another by such chances as he can find or make. 
and let him inculcate in his children good habits and sound notions so that they may live wisely and not expose themselves to hardship by error or folly but every experiment only makes it more clear that for men to band together in order to carry on an industrial war instead of being a remedy for disappointment in the ratio of satisfaction to effort is only a way of courting new calamity End of section twenty two